Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to wish you welcome to the Building Bridges 2023 here in Munich. In the last conference in Barcelona, we were celebrating uh, to be together again after the COVID pandemic. We could not imagine that the war of Russia against Ukraine would be still ongoing today, and we could not imagine that there are serious recent conflicts that we are witnessing here uh, uh, in, the, in the area of, of Europe, let's say, at the edges of Europe, that affect our members. Now, Russia's war has catalyzed challenges for international research collaboration. And international research collaboration is one of the key missions of Academia Europea. Geopolitics is invading science policy and research, research practices. Under the current tensions, research findings and data have become targets for hostile actors. Universities have been urged by national authorities and at the EU level to put in place processes to mitigate risks of international collaboration, such as lack of reciprocity, funding dependence, misuse of intellectual property, and misuse of research findings for military purposes. A new term, knowledge security, has emerged, and this is, of course, the contrast of open science. When institutions cancel collaboration due to conflicts between countries, the role of academies is highlighted. Academies have an extremely important role to play in maintaining liaisons to individual researchers working in authoritarian countries. Yet another key mission of Academia Europea is at risk, and this is academic freedom, which is the enabler, of course, of original research and groundbreaking innovations, and one of the basic conditions of a healthy democracy. We are witnessing erosion of academic freedom in several European countries, and therefore the European Parliament has established an observatory for breaches of academic freedom and urged the European Commission to propose a legal definition and a framework for researchers' self-governance. Our Hercules group Hercules standing for higher education, research and culture in European societies has chosen a very timely theme for their next conference, Academic Freedom in the 21st Century. The European Union, with its four freedoms, mobility of people, capital, goods and services, is a peace project, as we all know, but also the framework program for research and innovation is a peace project. Why? Because they implement the fifth freedom of the European Union, namely cross-border mobility of researchers and their methods and findings, and cross-border mobility of new technologies and knowledge. The fifth freedom matters because it helps to advance science through collaboration, sharing our knowledge, and trust. One brilliant example of which is the rapid development of corona vaccines. Ladies and gentlemen, we do nevertheless have reasons to celebrate. And this is the accomplishments of researchers, exemplified by the fresh Nobel laureates, and the reassociation of the UK to Horizon Europe. Now I hand over to uh, Professor Donald Dingwell, elected Vice President of Academia Europea and the organizer of this conference. Please, Don. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, members and guests of the Academia Europea, uh, welcome to Munich. Welcome to the Ludwig Maximilians Universität the uh, University of Munich. It is in a institution which is about 500 years old that you are sitting right now. It's had an interesting, turbulent, and mobile history, as many of you will know. 
and much of it took place uh, in this building. Uh, so what you're seeing is something which survived uh, uh, many of the uh, damages which occurred to this city in the last century. And so you're seeing something which dates back originally uh, to the neoclassic uh, revivals in Munich in the early 1800s, but also uh, remodeling in the early part of the uh, 20th century. So I hope you can appreciate it and enjoy where people uh, were in terms of their inspiration when they uh, created these buildings of the university. You've been given an information sheet, which is really worth the uh, read of a few minutes for you to fully appreciate uh, uh, where you are in the Große Aula of the University of Munich. So the LMU welcomes you, uh, Munich welcomes you, Bavaria welcomes you, and of course, the Academia Europea uh, welcomes you. We have uh, a superb turnout for this meeting, well over 300 participants, well over 150 new members. You'll be in this room all day, today and tomorrow, if you so choose. And the event in the evening for the induction of new members will occur right here in the evening. So uh, we welcome you to all of that and hope that you can participate in as much as possible. It only remains for me to say that I'm very grateful for everybody who made it to this meeting, uh, despite the difficult circumstances in various places uh, where members are located at this moment in time. And once again, I welcome you to the annual meeting of the Academia Europea. And I bring to the stage Bjorn Bidrock, who will chair the first session. Bjorn. Well, good morning, dear <laughs> colleagues. And I want to express my gratefulness to our president for the inspiring words and for uh, Professor uh, Don Dingwell for elegantly chairing the planning and organization, organizational committee for this meeting. He has a lot of trust in his other colleagues in, the, in, the, in this committee, so I had the honor and the pleasure to propose the speakers for the two sessions this morning. And I hope in the course of uh, these two sessions, you will see that there is a certain coherence in structure, some thoughts, and there will be some recurring themes that will go through them, but that is not for me to spell out, but, uh, but for you to discover when the speakers articulate that. <clears throat> the first speaker this morning is Helga Novotny, and I don't know, Helga, you, at some point you should ascend up the stage, uh, but I can, I can give it a few words now. So I will be very brief on that as well. As you know, Helga Novotny was a founder and later a president of the European Research Council, and she has played a tremendous role in shaping the research landscape of Europe and the world. That's not an exaggeration. Some of you also know that uh, Helga is Professor Emerita of Science and Technology Studies at the ETH, the famous Swiss Federal Polytechnic in, uh, in Zürich, sort of the European version of an MIT. Um, but I think fewer of you know that she has really not only had it, held several chairs in this field, but she has really contributed to shaping the whole field over a number of decades. I don't think this is an exaggeration. Helga studied at many places, but not least at Columbia University in New York at a time when the leading social scientists had, le had um, come to that place and Helga met these people at the late stage in their career, such as Paul Lassersfeld. That means that she represents very much of the very best in a European tradition of sociology and social science. And what she does is she has used that to shape and to reflect on advanced technology, advanced natural science, and brought out the consequences for human beings. So there is a consistently humane perspective in her works. She mentions sometimes uh, her work on in AI we trust. It's impossible not to mention your work on insatiable curiosity. And I could go on. I mean, her very early book, 
which in German is called über den Umgang mit Unsicherheit, on engaging with uncertainty, is really one of the first and best accounts of why social science emerged in 19th century Europe to deal with the deep-seated transformations and uncertainties in that period. Um, Helga has left the chairmanship of, of the presidency of the European Research Council, but she's certainly active to a high degree in many other such settings. She is one of the driving forces behind the Falling Walls Award in Berlin, this effort to create kind of breakthrough recognitions, but also the nucleus of, a, of an international summit. Kind of, uh, she's also chair of the, uh, the vice president of the Lindau Nobel laureate meetings. And I could go on like that, but I won't. I will just, not surprisingly, she has held any number of visiting positions. I will only mention one. She has been a visiting professor for a number of years at Nanyang Technical University, a technological university in Singapore, mostly under the period when Bertil Andersson was president of that. And Helga and Bertil and several other prominent people, including Balash, who is here, have helped shape that into one of the top institutions in the world. I will say no more. She, held, she has unsurprisingly received many recognitions, including a large number of honorary doctorates, for instance, at the University of Oxford, at the Weizmann Institute in Jerusalem, and in Israel, and I have to say also this year at Lund University in southern Sweden. But you're warmly welcome. To me, you represent very much of that, those things that are the best that we can cherish in the social sciences. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Björn. And now, yeah. and can you? As you know, technology never works the way we want it to work. But I want to thank uh, very much Bjorn for these very kind words and uh, a warm welcome to my friends and colleagues here. Now, the title of my presentation, as you have seen, is The Illusion of Control, Living with the Digital Others. And we are all prone to some kind of illusion, but there is a remedy, and the remedy is caught by this quote by Richard Feynman, physicist, science is what we have learned about how to keep from fooling ourselves. This is already difficult for scientists, and it goes back to, the, to modern science when the natural philosophers of the 17th century had to learn to distrust their senses and to dig deeper into what they wanted to explore, the natural world. And this has remained with us. If it is already difficult for scientists, it is much more difficult for the rest of us. There are those who are gullible, but there are also those, and some of them are the CEOs of some of the most powerful international corporations these days, I don't have to mention names, who are in the illusion that they have illimitable power. Are we still in control? This is a question that many of you may have been asking yourselves in the past <clears throat> weeks or months once the latest technological development in the form of large language models have been released by OpenAI company without asking anyone's consent. We have been engaged in a huge experiment as we all have been using it but nobody asked whether we consent to this experiment. And <clears throat> there are good reasons that this time this is much more than the usual hype. Because now it is possible to create, to generate new texts, new images, new sounds, 
to mix them in various ways, and all this backed up with an unprecedented increase of computational power and of an enormous amount of data, and more is yet to come. Now, <clears throat> these large language models, generative AI, as it is also called, have an enormous potential, and the potential is already being used in science. But there is a remaining uneasiness when it comes to proliferate in society. And just to give you one example, DeepMind, one of uh, Google's uh, research unit, will release something that is called PI. Now, to most of you in the room, PI means principal investigator. But for DeepMind, it means personalized intelligence. And the aim is to be able to give you your personalized, call it chief of staff or other words that will guide you in making your decisions and in how you lead your life. And you can imagine what this means once it is proliferating and it's becoming cheaper and cheaper through society. The uneasiness, we know it all, it's about the labor market, it's about deep fakes, when you can no longer distinguish whether a voice you hear or an image you see is really the person that you are made to believe it is. If <clears throat> there is more of discrimination, more of biases in the data, and it all comes up to eroding the trust we need to hold a society together. And this is the real problem because when you no longer know whom to trust and what to trust, what is happening to the social fabric. And then there is this deep-seated fear of losing control. This has, is an old uh, sentiment, an old feeling. It has been exacerbated by the very fact that in Western societies, the individual has become more and more a value in itself. And so the fear of losing control uh, is even stronger. But we have to realize the more personalized, quote unquote, our reality becomes, the less this reality can be shared. And this adds to the erosion of a, of a common uh, reality, a common ground that we need to keep society going. And last but not least, there are the anthropomorphic tendencies. This is an evolutionary trait that we have inherited, and we all know it when we start to speak to our computer or, any, or our car or whatever technical object we have in front of us. Um, and we know, of course, this is a thing, but nevertheless, the relationship we build up with it follows our anthropomorphic tendencies. This is innocuous. But when it comes to AI, it no longer is innocuous because these are digital devices that have been deliberately designed to make us believe that we are talking to another human being. Daniel Dennett, the philosopher, <clears throat> has written about this a long time ago, The Intentional Stance, a book worth rereading. And <clears throat> again, you know, we tend to underestimate once these things are out in society, what happens to it. And in the US, there are already a number of completely unregulated therapeutic apps in use. People who cannot afford, when they have mental problems, personal problems, to go to a psychiatrist, they buy one of these apps and they speak to it. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> recently, <clears throat> there was the first suicide reported in Belgium. This was an older generation of an AI, and the person committed suicide uh, because uh, this is what the app counseled to be the best solution for this person's problems. So this means the anthropomorphic tendencies. Many people utter the phrase, 
I think AI knows me better than myself. And I always uh, am taken aback when I hear this phrase, because it means there are people out there who actually think that the AI knows, feels, and can understand. While it is very, very clear, the AI does not understand anything what it does, and it cannot know anything and does not know anything, let alone feeling. Now, <clears throat> the illusion of control and the control of illusion. Illusion is a tricky concept for the simple reason that those who are in an illusion don't realize that they are in an illusion. It's only when there is a clash with reality that they have to wake up and that they realize I was in an illusion. But also um, the Clash with reality can happen in many different ways, so it's difficult to, uh, to, to foresee it and to do something against it. However, technology from the very beginning includes the control of technology. It is the famous, it works. If it does not work, it does not function, and therefore you are not in control. And, um, Every, every technology, every engineer, every technical university teaches the students how to control for errors, how to control for maintenance, repairs, etc. So this is part of engineering. But there are challenges in terms of keeping control over the technology. And it started already during the phase of industrialization when people had to realize it's not enough if your weaving loom that has now become industrialized actually works, but at one point you also have to think of the safety of those who work with the machine, the safety of workers. So the concept of control of technology had to expand. This did not go without conflicts, the labor movements uh, came about, etc. But we have seen this extension of control over technology, over the technical function to the consequences it has for health, for safety, and now we are expanding it for the environment. And we, we have an enormous amount of regulations, at least in our part of the world, of um, certification, of safety drills, of all kinds of regulation that want to extend the control we have to what is beyond the actual functioning, um, the, the wider input. But when it comes to AI, there is still another jump to be made in terms of somehow keeping it under control because we attribute agency to the machine. And we program the machine <clears throat> Thank you. To make predictions. And we base our decision making on the predictions. This is how AI is being sold to business. It will help you to save money because the decision making that is now based on human uh, <clears throat> intelligence will simply be taken over by the predictions based on um, the past performance, it knows the market better than humans do, et cetera, et cetera. And predictions have served science well, as we know, especially physics was the discipline that came up with new concepts that had to be rigorously tested, and <clears throat> it is the hallmark of science uh, uh, that you can test your predictions. But when it comes uh, to the social world, we don't test our predictions, but we are prone to fall into what uh, a sociologist in the 1930s, uh, Professor Thomas, called self-fulfilling prophecies. Reality becomes, comes about if people act in a way that the prediction has said it would, they would act. And these self-fulfilling prophecies are part of the challenges we now face, how can we extend the control over technology, including um, to the, not just the environment, health and safety, but to our cognitive and emotional 
ways of living. And finally, and very importantly, there is this enormous concentration of economic power in the hands of a few international corporations. We know them all. <clears throat> and this concentration uh, continues. And it makes regulation very, very difficult. We see a struggle for regulation over AI. The US with a lax approach because it might stifle innovation. We have an authoritarian way of regulating it in China. And the EU is trying with its AI Act somehow you know, to contain it and to be at the forefront of regulation. But there's another worrying, um, <clears throat> worrying piece of <clears throat> um, numbers behind this, namely, if you look at um, public versus private investment in research and, and development. In the OECD countries overall, in general, two thirds of the financing for R and D come from the private sector and one third from the public. But if you look at the figures for AI, 90% come from the private sector and only 10% are public investment. This means that many universities don't have access to the computer power they need. They don't have access to the data, let alone the algorithm, because this is private property of the large corporations. And uh, they have difficulties in keeping the students they train because the salaries in the private sector are much better. And I think this is something that needs to be um, taken up in, in terms of policy making. Now, <clears throat> I come. I, I will skip this, but I come to my last uh, uh, slide. <clears throat> this is a, the English version of a famous Latin uh, work that goes back to Giambattista uh, Vico, 1711. He used this phrase that has been taken up, we understand only what we make. And those of you in the room who are practicing scientists in a lab, you know precisely what is meant by this. We understand only what we make. Now, <clears throat> this has become shortened verum factum in, 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 in the li literature, but uh, I think this voice from the early European Enlightenment is still a warning call and a question mark for us today. Do we still understand what we make today? Because we live increasingly in a human-made world. There's the Anthropocene, we are changing the world. We have you know, the climate extreme events that we are living through, October in Munich, October, uh, uh, wherever we look. Um, so we are remaking our world in the Anthropocene. We have the possibilities today to create what I call a mirror world in terms of digital twins. Whatever exists in terms of objects, partly also phenomenon, can be digitalized and can have a digital twin. This is a mirror world that we make, but do we still understand it? We have not only understanding in terms of unintended consequences, this main question for the social sciences, but also in terms of understanding the very processes through which an outcome is being produced. And those of you that work in AI know very well causality is somewhere on the horizon. We want to understand not just correlations, not just how neural networks are making this efficiency possible, but what is actually going on, and we are far from understanding it. Then there is this enormous acceleration of technological developments, and in these days, we also feel there is an acceleration in terms of crisis that we are living uh, through. And <clears throat> uh, complex, systems, um, complex systems theory tells us in complex systems, there's always the phenomenon of emergence because of the interconnections between the constituent parts, all of a sudden you have new phenomena that can emerge that you cannot predict. And this is the world we live in and we understand 
very little of it. But then there are also some fascinating research questions that uh, have come up. Let me just um, name three, three examples. I was speaking to a friend, a mathematician, um, who used uh, GPT-4 for an algebraic problem that uh, he found a good testing case. And uh, GPT-4 performed very well, made some mistakes, but he said also a good mathematician could make similar mistakes. But what surprised him really was the way how the machine reached the conclusion was completely different from how a human mathematician would have reach the solution. And this raises the question, is there something in our brain that works differently from the machine? Obviously, yes. But also, mathematics is a human construct. It's a culture that has developed. The Babylonians had mathematics. The uh, old Chinese had mathematics. There is a cultural trajectory how mathematics has developed. So how does this come into uh, when we compare the human brain with the way how the machine works. Another example, language. Will this constant use now of language that is spun out by the machines, will this affect the way how we speak, how we write, how we think? We don't know. Will there be a kind of meta AI Esperanto that evolves? We have no clue but it's worthwhile to ask the questions. And as scientists, we are uh, fascinating by new research questions. So let's go for it. And last but not least, many young people have enormous problems with their identity. And this is not, it's not very helpful to have identity politics around them in addition to the problems they already have. So what do we know? about the way how constant interaction with an AI shapes young people's identity and where will it lead to. I come to the end to keep in time um, living with the digital others. It's obvious um, we have to prepare ourselves to live with these digital artifacts and their increasing interaction with us, the impact they have on our cognitive facilities, abilities, but also our emotional reactions, and also the relationship between the individual and the collectivity is, is one of them. And there is one uh, book that came out last year by anthropologist Marshall Salins, who, who died, but it's, it's a posthumous work that puts together uh, the lifelong work of this uh, wonderful anthropologist. And he calls it um, the, the re-enchanted universe, the enchanted universe. Um, and he says, for most, most of humanity, and this is true, most of humanity over thousands of years have lived in a kind of cosmos where they were surrounded by spiritual others. These were gods, ghosts, spiritual beings, you name it, and he has amassed an enormous amount of data on this. But uh, so when you were building a canoe, you were uh, not building it just because you knew how to build a canoe. You had to invoke the spirit and the spirit helped you to build your canoe. And this leaves me with some uncanny reflections. When we move now to a world where we will deal with AI and will be surrounded with AI throughout what we do, what will our relationship be like with these digital others. It will not go away. We will learn how to live with them. We will learn how to control the illusion of control, but also not to fall into the illusion that we can not control. And with this, I thank you very much. And if there is time for questions, I'm very happy to uh, get into dialogue with you. Thank you. Should I come here?
So we are fine time-wise, and um, we always have we have the tradition of always having questions. Scholarly work is all about interaction, a process, talking to each other, thinking together. So I know many, but not all. Romy, please. Thank you very much, Helga. My question is. Uh, a very wide. Can you listen? No. Yeah. So uh, the, the question is very wide in the sense that what you have done is to show us the many problems we may face. So is this an academic program? Is this a political program? So uh, are you just seeing what sociologists and psychologists should do? or what politicals would do in making laws in relation to AI? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> what may be is already happening. We don't know where it will lead. And in this sense, I would uh, you know, insist, let's keep the future open. The future is not predetermined. It has taken us uh, a long time to realize this. Uh, the famous subtle site by uh, Reinhard uh, Koselek that discovered <clears throat> that uh, around 1750 onwards, people no longer started to believe that their future is already predetermined because they discovered there is a gap between their experience and their aspirations. And this is very important because in a sense, I would say, you know, predictions have the power to make future disappear. If we are only surrounded by predictions, predictions, at one point, our ability to imagine the future is gone. Now, to come to your question, whose task is it? I think we are all in the same boat. Academics are at the forefront because, after all, what we have now came out of the creativity of science and technology. Of course, it was helped by markets, um, etc. But we also have to realize whatever we do has implications far beyond academia. And I think this is very, very clear. And how to engage politicians, policymakers who are very often clueless because this is also something that is unprecedented for them. And the way how, you know, if, if, if you go back and look at regulation over the centuries, you know, it came slowly, slowly. I alluded to industrialization, the labor movement, how long it actually took, and we have some historians of the 19th century uh, here, you know, who can tell you how long it took actually to uh, have safety at the workplace as one of something that we take for granted uh, today. But we don't have so much time now. And this is the acceleration. So also the way how regulation has to happen is under this pressure of acceleration. And so I think the only way out is really to engage in as much dialogue as we can. And academics are challenged to, you know, to, to come out of what they are best doing and nevertheless, you know, engage in conversation with others. Let me just mention here something that um, you may have been surprised that I did not lose one word about it, namely the warnings about existential risk. I think this is purely speculation. It's not helpful and it's even irresponsible because it distracts public opinion from the real problems we have. So we should say very clearly to public, to the public, to politicians, don't get caught in these speculations. It leads nowhere if you think what may happen in 100 years' time, if you have an enormous amount of problems now. So let's focus on the problems we have now. So we should have a chance to have 
least one more question. Uh, sorry, I spoke to No, 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 to, on the contrary. So, so yes, please. In, and identify yourself also. Yeah. I may have not followed. Uh, uh, it's not clear in my mind whether you are in favor of very firm regulation of uh, artificial intelligence. Of, of course, you cannot uh, stop people think, but artificial. Do you think that people who are, who are saying constantly that artificial intelligence poses an enormous challenge and it's also an existential threat unless it's properly regulated? I mean, do they have a point? We're not talking about stupid people. We're talking about very smart people, and. Uh, and so it's not clear to me. Are you in favor of strong regulation, which doesn't mean stopping people from thinking about artificial intelligence? This is critical. It's like uh, nuclear energy. It can be for good. It can be for very bad uses. So that I, I may have been, I may have not been following properly your reasoning. But we we should trust clearly. But what kind of artificial intelligence, for what purpose? I think that these are the critical questions, in my view. Well, I'm in favor, it's, the, the word is too weak. I think regulation is absolutely necessary. The question is how can you regulate something that is still you know, in this rapid state of uh, development? We know from from the past, um, every technology, the law always lags behind. Technology is always faster. It's like a kill and the turtle. That's, that's very clear. Nevertheless, we need to regulate. Now, how to regulate? We know if you regulate too much, you stifle innovation. If you regulate too little, you have all kinds of harm that is being unleashed. And if you regulate too late, it is too late. So it's a very, uh, you know, very tricky way of, of doing it. And I think the EU with its AI Act that will be passed uh, still before the end of this year uh, is one way of going forward. It's not perfect. Much depends on the implementation, as with every regulation. You can have the best legal text. But if the implementation does not live up to it, it will not have the effect you, you want it to have. Now, <clears throat> you know, it's are we regulating the use of a technology? Are we regulating the technology? All these are questions that are being debated, but there is no way around it. We need to regulate. Now, regulation, what does it do? You know, it sets some, you know, goalposts and says, um, here is a red zone, beware, this is really dangerous. And it has to be flexible. Probably we also have to come up with <clears throat> inventing new ways of regulating that, you know, are more dynamic once you pass the law and then, you know, you amended the law after five years or ten years. Maybe this is no longer working and we have to come up with a sort of accompanying kind of, uh, you know, regulation. But it means someone has to monitor what is actually happening. And this is why I come back to, we have to insist that more public investment into everything surrounding AI has to come from the public sector. Because in, in the end, we risk that AI will not be a public good, but will be in the hands only of private companies. And I think we all have an interest, and this can also be communicated. AI, just like science, must be a public good. Thank you, Helga. We are fine, but we shouldn't. We don't have time, I'm afraid, to any more questions. But the conversation will carry on informally. We should thank Helga thank once again. Thank you.
next speaker is Professor Timothy Snyder, or, uh, Timothy Crane. Tim Crane is certainly one of the most distinguished contemporary, not only European, but one of the most distinguished contemporary philosophers. He has uh, written, he's now at the Central European University, Professor of Philosophy, where he's also a pro-rector. Um, but before that, he was holding the Knightsbury Professorship at the University of Cambridge, and before that, he was at UCL. He has been president of the Aristotelian Society, the oldest philosophical society in the UK, and he has had many distinctions over the years. I would just like to say that his, philo his philosophical work covers, of course, basically philosophy of mind, but also philosophy of language, philosophy of cognition, as well as uh, philosophy of belief systems, including religions. So it's a, it's a wide field of uh, a wide area of, of fields within philosophy, but with enormous repercussions and consequences for our way of living as human beings. I think it's fair to say that there is no philosopher who so early and so consistently and so rigorously has engaged with questions of artificial intelligence. You wrote a book already in the mid-90s, which has become a classic and gets reprinted all the time, and there's a series of books which covers some of the fields that we are discussing this morning. So I won't take any more of your time, but to say it's a sheer delight to see you here, and I'm very happy and proud that you've joined us. Thank you very much, Björn. Um, it's a great honor to be here. That was a very generous introduction. Thank you. It's also a privilege to follow my uh, friend and um, fellow Viennese, uh, Helga Novotny, in her talk on um, AI. Uh, what I'm going to say today has some similar themes. It's in a slightly, um, a slightly more um, abstract and speculative um, mode, I suppose. So, is artificial general intelligence possible? I want to start with a, um, a, a quote from Herbert Simon, one of the original pioneers of AI, who said uh, in 1965 that machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work that a man can do. I think by man he meant human being. Uh, I don't think he was comparing this to work that women could do. And this, is his, this was his prediction in 1965, um, which of course um, didn't come true. Um, there was a lot of skepticism um, going back to the 1960s um, about early AI, um, that skeptics argued that computers will never play chess like a grandmaster, uh, they will never recognize faces. It was argued that computers could never recognize text because the physical manifestations of text were so different um, that they would never be able to spot those patterns. Um, they could never really learn. People said computers could have the, um, the simulacrum of learning but never really learning and many other things too. Computers could never feel or be conscious and many, many things like this. This is a very common kind of skepticism. Hubert Dreyfus, uh, a fine philosopher, now dead, um, and said many good things about AI, but he also made a few blunders, like he said that no chess program can, well, actually he said no chess program can ever play um, amateur chess, even amateur chess. Now, he, probably he was right at the time, that was 1965, the same year that um, Herbert Simon made his remark. Um, however, he's been shown to be spectacularly wrong about the potentials of computers and chess. Of course, one turning point was Deep Blue, which beat um, Kasparov in 1997. Um, another turning point was IBM's Watson, which won the Jeopardy quiz show in the United States. I'm not sure what, what that exactly shows, but it was a, a remarkable use of um, stored information. And then there was another big turning point, of course, with the um, uh, AlphaGo machine built by um, 
Deep Mind, and they are, um, sh that beat the world champion of Go um, in in 2016. And now we're seeing even more advances. So now we see um, the image creation machines and as well the, the chat GPT and GPT-3, GPT-4, which have been um, capturing the headlines so much and giving academics a lot to think about, about how they are now going to assess their students' work, as well as many other things. Um, so these are the AI some of the AI successes, um, and there are many more. And we can expect many more. In your phone today, there's more impressive computing power and, and the achievements of computer science are way more impressive than Herbert Simon could have even dreamed of in 1965, just in a small device that you have in your pocket. So there's absolutely no question of the achievements of of AI, considered broadly technological field, which includes uh, all the things I've mentioned and more. This leads some people to another kind of optimism, um, that AI might be on the brink of creating genuine thinking machines. So not just a machine that looks as if it's thinking, but uh, a machine that really is thinking. Um, and there's a broad consensus in, in, in the community that in order to do this, AI must first, uh, the science of AI, I mean, must create artificial general intelligence. The term AI is used both for the, the scientific field and also for the products of that field, as, as you know. In order to create um, genuine thinking machines, we must create artificial general intelligence. A general thinking machine will not just be a collection of special purpose devices, um, but things for face recognition or playing chess or, or for completing sentences or um, text recognition or things like that. It won't just be that. It'll be something like general intelligence as we have it. That's the, that's the ambition of artificial general intelligence. Philosophers really like this idea, and many of them have jumped on this particular uh, bandwagon um, and said very enthusiastic, optimistic things. Um, here's David Chalmers, one, one of the world's leading philosophers, professor at NYU, and um, a leading philosopher of, of consciousness. And Chalmers said, uh, this was actually in an interview in the New York Times, but I think we can still hold him to it. He said that, Artificial general intelligence is possible. There are lots of mountains we need to climb before we get to human level AGI. That said, I think it's going to be possible eventually in the 40 to 100 year time frame. Um, sadly, I'm not, I'm not going to be old enough to, pr to prove him wrong on this. I hope perhaps my son will. Um, Basil and Schwitzgabel, two um, imp or equally impressive philosophers, um, have said that um, it's, it's, it is likely that we will soon have AI pro approximately as cognitively sophisticated as mice or dogs. Uh, and that's quite a lot of cognitive sophistication. There's no question that dogs have general intelligence in some sense, although not in the sense perhaps as that we have it. So there's some philosophical enthusiasm. Are these philosophers right? Well, you might say, well, this is a scientific question. This is an empirical question. This is for the scientists to figure out. They should go uh, to their computers and figure out whether they, can, um, uh, whether they can actually do this. And of course, you'd be right if you said that. You'd be right. It is an empirical question. But empirical questions are constrained by possibilities. And the possibilities are constrained by the concepts that we're using and the ideas that we're using and how we understand those ideas. If our ideas are confused, then it's unlikely that anything empirical could come out of it. If our ideas are contradictory, um, then it's unlikely that we'll ever be able to produce empirical research on the basis of them. So making claims about what is possible also involves making claims about our concepts or our ideas 
and therefore the essence of the phenomena involved. Um, and these claims, this is why I claim some authority to speak on this, these claims are um, about possibility and essence are the kinds of things that philosophers put their minds to. Claims about what's possible are partly empirical, partly philosophical or conceptual questions. What I want to do in, in the rest of my talk is to look very briefly at two very popular styles of argument for the possibility of AGI. Um, I'm, not, I'm not going to prove to you that AGI is impossible. Um, what I'm going to do is argue against two very popular arguments uh, that, that argue that it is possible. Um, and these are the arguments. The first is a generalization from recent progress in AI. And the recent success in particular of uh, deep learning machines. Um, the second argument is a more general philosophical argument that AI is simply a consequence of materialism, of materialism and technological progress. Once you have those two things, then AI is possible, AGI is possible. I should say, of course, artificial intelligence is possible because it exists and everything that exists is possible. What we're talking about here is artificial general intelligence. My conclusions are going to be that the first argument is wholly unconvincing and for one very general reason, which I'm going to explain to you briefly. Uh, my second argument is that the, the, the point about materialism is actually uh, irrelevant, even if it's, even if it's correct. Okay. So here's my first argument from deep learning. And here I, I will just, um, I'll assume that everyone's familiar with the contrast between so-called classical artificial intelligence or rules and representations artificial intelligence um, and new artificial intelligence, deep learning methods based on neural, neural networks or generalizing or learning from vast amounts of data. These are different styles, very, very different styles of thinking and the second has revolutionized the field. Various, various names are used here including you know, machine learning, second wave AI, neural networks, parallel distributed processing, connectionism, various different different concepts are around in the same general ballpark. Um, so, in speech recognition, face recognition, predictive text, text including um, GPT, um, and image generation, these are all products of the new technology. So, the, the general line of thought says, you know, we've done Go, or we've done chat GPT, and now all we need to do is AGI. Once we've done AGI, uh, then, then we will have solved the whole problem of artificial intelligence, which is intelligence like us. Now, one thing to, if we start with Go, I'm going to illustrate my point in relation to Go because it's simpler to see it that way, but it generalizes. Um, Go uses a very te different technique from, from, from Deep Blue. Um, and uh, I, I, without, without saying anything critical of the work that came, this amazing work that came out, of um, the creation of AlphaGo, um, we have to remember that Go is still a game. Sorry. A game has to have a goal. This is, a, this is what a game, a game is. There has to be a goal in a game. Right? Um, some people say you can't define game. The, the Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein made a big thing about not being able to define game. In fact, you can. It was done by, by a... Um, Canadian philosopher called Bernard Suits in the 1960s. And then he wrote a book later on on this uh, called The Grasshopper, which is an absolutely wonderful book about games. He defined game as follows. A game is the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. Um, and this is a very interesting definition. You can see the, this is by a man called Bernard Suits. He, um, it's a very interesting definition because you can see why, why the obstacles have to be unnecessary. The goal in a game of football is to get the ball into the net. You have to have obstacles to doing that, otherwise it wouldn't be a game. If, if, you, could get any, if you could do anything you like to get the ball into a net, then it wouldn't be the game of football. You have to constrain people's activity. So that's why you have the unnecessary obstacles. However, I'm not interested in that so much here. And what I'm interested in is the idea of the goal, what Suits calls the pre-losery goal. Because a game needs a goal. 
Um, this is also true of what the AI machines do. They have to have a goal. Face recognition, text recognition, voice recognition. And by face recognition, I mean attaching a, a string of symbols to, a, to an image, that's all. I don't, I don't mean anything more cognitive than that. Um, face recognition, text recognition, voice recognition, responding to a prompt, all of these have a goal. And what ChatGPT does also has a goal. It's not operating within this completely unconstrained landscape. There is a goal there. Uh, the goal is to com construct grammatical sentences in response to the prompt. And the reason why the goal is essential is that if there is no goal, then there would be no such thing as succeeding or failing to achieve it. And this is the point. And if there's no such thing as succeeding or failing to achieve the goal, then you can't train people to say whether the machine has succeeded. So you can't train the machine to say whether it's succeeded or failed. People can't say whether it's got it right or got it wrong if there is no such thing as getting it right or getting it wrong. And that's true of all these machines. So the point about AGI is that if AGI is going to be is going to pursue um, uh, is going to be pursued in, in by using the current methods of artificial intelligence, then AGI too has to have a goal. General intelligence would have to have a goal. What is the goal of general intelligence? Um, and the, the answer is basically generalizing, generalizing hugely, but I only have 20 minutes. Uh, no one has any idea. So no one has any idea what the goal of general intelligence is. What is general intelligence for? There are vacuous answers like solving problems, but even that's not very good, uh, as I'll come back to an example in a minute. Right? Um, no one has any idea. And the reason that no one has any idea is not because it's a very difficult question. Um, it requires empirical investigation to find out what the goal of general intelligence is. It's not that at all. It's rather, it's a bad question. It's not a good question at all to think that general intelligence has a goal. Um, and I acknowledge um, Hubert Dreyfus's um, originality in stressing this point in the 60s against a lot of hostility. Let me give you an example just to illustrate this. Of course, much more needs to be said about why general intelligence doesn't have a goal. But if general intelligence had a goal, then a manifestation of general intelligence, like conversation, would have to have a goal. So what's the goal of conversation? Compare the conversations that you have with the conversations you have with voice assistants, like Siri and Alexa. Um, some philosophers have said that the point of conversation is to exchange information. Uh, if that were right, um, then if that were the goal of, gen of conversation, then the answer, you know, here are some web pages related to your inquiry, would be a good way to conduct a conversation. But as you all know, it isn't. That's how the conversation stops. Siri and Alexa don't understand anything. They just say, here are some web pages related to your inquiry. Um, the lesson I draw from this is not that Siri and Alexa are bad at what they do, it's just what they do is not conversation. And the reason it's not conversation is you cannot specify what the goal of conversation is. Conversation has many, many, many goals. So, in gen my point is that in general, conversation has no goal. That's an illustration of why, why ge general intelligence has no goal. The upshot here then, I think, actually follows on from a nice comment by Francois Cholet, an artificial intelligence researcher who said that if intelligence is a problem-solving algorithm, then it can be understood only with respect to a specific problem. Exactly. What is the problem that general intelligence is trying to solve? Maybe there's no such thing as general intelligence. Maybe, there's, maybe this isn't an actual genuine psychological kind. Maybe the category of intelligence is a bad category. Um, but if there is, then it's not something that has solved some specific problem. It has no goal. And that's the reason why, because it has no goal, you can't tell a machine whether it's succeeding in achieving that goal or not. And that's why we, sh that's why we can't have artificial general intelligence. Now, my last two minutes, I will um, just explain why the other general argument is wrong. This is philosophically more interesting, I think, this second argument, is, and it's got a long history. Um, but I want to say this argument is is essentially irrelevant to today's debates about AI. Uh, here's a general argument from, from the truth of materialism, the idea that human beings are just material beings, 
So in principle, it would be possible to um, build a replica of a human being which does exactly what a human being does. Now, given that one of the things a human being does is to think, then it would be possible in principle to build an artificial thinker. Right? That follows from, from what I've just said. And therefore, artificial intelligence is possible. Okay, what I want to say about this argument, there's a lot of AI optimists think like this. Here's, here's, a, here's one example. Uh, I won't read it out because of shortage of time, but um, and Benigo says that um, the human brain is a machine, so we need to figure out the principles on which it works, and once we've done that, we've embedded them in a machine, then we've got artificial intelligence. And the neuroscientist Christoph Koch says the same about consciousness. Uh, so people do think like this. It's very common. Um, my point about this is that there's nothing wrong with the argument as such. It's an interesting argument, it has interesting premises. You may want to dispute the first premise that human beings are purely material beings. You could dispute that, but let's ignore that here. My point is that it's irrelevant to AI as it actually is, what we might call real existing AI. Real existing AI uh, can uh, benefit from nothing from this argument. Um, the real existing AI is not interested in how human beings actually think. That's not what it is. It's a branch of applied mathematics, which, or engineering, which is trying to solve very specific engineering problems. It's not a theory of human thinking. It's not a theory of human, the human mind. It's not a, even a theory of the human brain. Um, it's not the science of human thought or consciousness or reason. So the materialist argument gives us no reason to think that real existing AI, AI as it actually is, will actually create anything like genuine thought or intelligence. And that's my argument about the, that's my argument against the second argument. My argument is the first argument was about the idea of general intelligence. The second argument is that um, materialism is not really the, relevant here. This isn't really the point because AI is not the theory of human thinking or animal thinking or any kind of thinking. So to sum up then, um, in the philosophy of AI, there are two broad extremes. Um, one is that genuine artificial thinking machines are just on the horizon, 40 to 100 years away, according to, to David Chalmers. Um, the second is that they're absolutely impossible in principle for some reason, because maybe we have immortal souls or maybe some, some other complicated argument. I want to say neither approach is, is quite right. The optimistic approach isn't right for the reasons I've said. The second approach is the, the Luddite approach, I think, is, right, is not right for other reasons. Um, in, in other words, what I want to say is, it, can there be, if the quest, answer to the question, can there be artificial general intelligence? Maybe in some very remote sense, if we rely on the second argument, um, but that this idea has very little to do with AI as it actually is, or as it will be in the future. Thanks very much. Philosophers in our academy and many of them, uh, but I, I'm sure everyone here has uh, enjoyed this thought provoking lecture. Oh, please. Yes, and identify yourself. Please tell you who you are also. I'm Mona Simeon, the next speaker, mm -hmm. so that's I easy. Know. Hi, Tim. Uh, lovely talk. So I was wondering, um, so here's an argument against your argument against the first argument. Um, there are such things as norms of reasoning. You can't get norms without goals. Therefore, if there are norms of reasoning, reasoning has a goal. If reasoning has a goal, given that it's an instantiation of intelligence, intelligence has a goal. Uh, therefore, we need to hear more about why we might think that general intelligence is goal-free. Um, sorry, Mona, did, did I hear you correctly? The, there are norms of reasoning. There's norms of reasoning. Um, if you want norms, you need goals, because these two come together, norms of reasoning unless you're a Kantian, uh, but you know, we know that that didn't work. Uh, <laughs> so if you, need norm, if you have norms, it follows that there are some goals. If there are goals of reasoning, can't be that there aren't goals of general intelligence. So if there are goals of general intelligence, all we need to do is figure uh, out which they are I, and implement I, I them in AI. Thank, thank you very much. Um, yeah, there's a lot to say about that. I, the, my short answer is that what, what must be meant by artificial general intelligence goes way, way beyond what philosophers call norms of reasoning. 
So if a norm of reasoning, for example, is to pursue truth or to, or to preserve truth in your reasoning or to reason pursuing, supporting, I don't know, whatever it is, empirical plausibility or something, this is, th these are norms of reasoning you could have. How you, how you actually made a would make a computer that pursued truth, that's a purely, where that's a purely computational goal, is rather hard to understand. Putting that to one side, our general intelligence goes beyond much th things like that. And here, are, here I'm alluding to things like the idea of common sense. Right? The idea of the background knowledge that you have to have in order to understand uh, how human interaction is possible. So th and those things are nothing to do with what philosophers call norms of reasoning. Um, that's my short answer. Thanks. I'm often struck in, in discussions about artificial intelligence that there's somehow a given within it that sort of natural human intelligence, general intelligence in your terms, is somehow unproblematical. And somehow we don't what? fully, it's unproblematical and we don't really under, and we understand it. Um, and therefore we can begin to have discussions about artificial intelligence. Um, when in reality, we all know that in fact, what we call intelligence is an immensely complicated thing. Um, uh, some of it is, of course, that we are able to process information in a very rational way, reach decisions and so on, the kind of standard rationality that I suppose has been foregrounded since the Enlightenment. But it obviously would be a mistake to think that there aren't elements within what we think of as human intelligence of kind of magical thinking. I mean, intuition is a kind of form of magical thinking, the comment that Helga made about the canoe. I mean, this is not something in the past, this is still in the present, and embodied in our idea. And also, intelligence is embodied in institutions collectively, like universities and iPhones, of course, as well, yes. Um, so, perhaps before we discuss artificial intelligence, we need to think more carefully about the complexity and and contradictions within our definitions of natural human intelligence. I, I completely agree with you. Um, I, if I could just make two points. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure intelligence is a very good category here. And I think that what, you know, if we're asking about what's distinctive of the human mind, whether intelligence captures what we're, what we're after as opposed to all, all, all the other things and some of the things you mentioned, uh, and including the cultural phenomena too. Um, so this is why I think, you know, going back to the history of AI, if, if they hadn't called their project in 1956, I think it was in the, that famous conference, if they hadn't called it artificial intelligence, then we probably wouldn't be talking in the way that we do today. If they'd called it something else like machine learning, then that would have been something different. But um, the second point is that, um, yes, it's not, it's, I, I think what you say supports what I want to say because, um, in, in, in relation to the second, my second point, because my second point is, um, don't assume that what artificial intelligence, the, 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 the engineering project is, has got anything to do with understanding how human thinking works. Just because you call your machine a neural network doesn't mean that you're actually making something that works in the way that the brain works. So uh, I completely agree. My reason for talking about artificial intelligence is that they started it. They used the concept, and then and they have this reason that we need artificial general intelligence, is what, which is what we've got. And when you start probing that idea, you see it all falls apart. So, thank you. I'm from Peter Scott, uh, and there are many others. We could carry on, but I'm afraid we really shouldn't do that now because we are we, we have yet another speaker which is Mona Simeon uh, so thank you so much so our third speaker this morning is Mona Simeon she is professor of philosophy 
at the old Scottish University of Glasgow, where she's also director of a research center on dealing with epistemological issues. Her research very much addresses questions of epistemology and its relationships to claim to knowledge and how those claims are being articulated in terms of speech acts, but also the reverse in a sense, the, the frequency of resistance to evidence. So these are very central questions, not only in philosophy, but in everything we do as scholars and what is done every time a public measure is being proposed, actually. So it's very wide ranging and extremely interesting. She has published a range of books, most of them with Oxford and Cambridge University Press. She has been recognized in terms of grants. She has had support from the ERC, from the Levium Trust, and many other, uh, other sources. She is also a member, I did, we just talked about the Aristotelian Society, a member of the editor of the executive board of that. And as important for us, to us, you are a member of the executive board of the Young Academy of Europe, and you are a member actually of uh, the Young Academy of Scotland under the tutelage of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. So we are delighted that you are here, and now I will retreat and give the floor to you. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me. Yes, yeah, so, uh, I mean, it would, be, it would be good if I didn't have to present Tim's talk. <laughs> So I think that he did it better than I would be able to do. So. This one, right. Thanks so much. Yeah, the talk is going to be about this information. Um, and it's going, to be, it's going to come with very bad news and then with some good news. So the bad news is going to be that, as we know, we are all very bad at tracking this information in our, both our personal lives and our professional lives. We just don't have a good solution against this kind of polluted epistemic environment that we're inhabiting and that is getting worse and worse with the emergence of chat GPT type tools, right? Um, so that's, that's the bad news, and the, I guess the even worse news that I'm going to come with is that the reason why we are bad at tracking this information is because we don't really know what it is. We are working with a bad account of what this information is, and that's why we have trouble tracking it. And the good news is going to be that we finally uh, started making some progress into identifying what this information actually is. Uh, you know, it, these are small steps, but they've been made. Uh, and now that we started making some progress, you know, we can maybe see the light in the efforts of uh, protecting ourselves from it. So, recently we've been trying to fight this information in several fields, um, uh, with research in several fields, via fact-checking AIs. So the thought is we, we should fight the AI with the AI, right? So it, we have this, this information spreading AIs, uh, and humans, but those are less dangerous. The AIs tend to be more prolific. Why don't we just build some other AIs that are going to fight these bad guys, right? Uh, so we have all of these nice uh, and very well-funded projects that have tried to do this. The problem with all of these projects is that they are only trained to track false assertions, just falsehoods, right? That's what they know how to do. And you might think, well, that's, that should be enough, right? I mean, there's plenty of material for them. If at least we get rid of falsehoods, that would be fantastic. Um, but the, there are two problems with that. First of all, they have this very strong inbuilt assumption that what this information is, is roughly false content spread with the intention to mislead. That's, that's roughly the dictionary definition, and all of these AIs are built assuming this dictionary definition, which, to be honest with you, is rather old and outdated. Um, secondly, the problem is that if you are clever in your disinformation campaign, you're not going to come with outright falsehoods at your target because people are not that stupid. If you just come with outright falsehoods at them, they might just reject you as a testifier from the outset. So what you want to do is be a little bit more subtle. I'm from Eastern Europe. Nobody came with outright falsehoods at us, right? They did it a bit more, uh, you know, in a, in a kind of nicer fashion, in a way in which it was more attractive in the beginning and only then hammered the, the outright falsehoods on us, right? So if, the problem is that if we use this account of this information, not only are we tracking only false content, but false content is a very small subset of this information, uh, that this information that's out there. And not even the most dangerous subset, because for us, 
we are very good at tracking falsehood. So we are, it's easier for us to track an outright falsehood than the kind of disinformation that I'm gonna be talking about today. So here is, so this large assumption um, can be broken down in smaller assumptions that I'm gonna talk about right now and I'm gonna tell you why all of them are false. So one very well spread assumption, and, and I'm talking transdisciplinary here, in computer science, information studies, media studies, uh, philosophy of information, one very, very well spread assumption is that this information is a species of information. Uh, the bad variety, as it were. So you have information as a, as a genus, and then you have true information and disinformation. And these are the species of this, this genus. So this assumption, I'm gonna argue, is false. Uh, now, first of all, why, we, why would we think that this, this is true, right? So the thought is, well, information is non-factive, so information doesn't need to be true. That's one assumption. Information can be true or false. And this information is the false and intentionally misleading variety thereof. So that's how it goes, right? So very roughly the thought is, the cat is on the mat, the proposition, the cat is on the mat, carries the information that the cat is on the mat in virtue of the fact that it means that the cat is on the mat, independently of whether the cat actually is on the mat or not, right? So truth doesn't matter, that's the assumption. Um, and then the thought is this information consists in spreading the cat is on the mat in spite of knowing it to be false and with the intention or with the function to mislead. So why did people think this in so many fields for so many times? So as far as I can tell, there are two rationales that I could identify. One is the practical rationale, and you can find that a lot in computer science and information studies. The thought back in the day with when you know, the first uh, information uh, models showed up in, in, in the 70s and the 60s, the thought was that factivity doesn't matter. So whether a piece of content is true or not doesn't matter to the computer scientists, right? And why is that? Well, because what matters is how much data we can pack in, into a signal. That's what matters to the computer scientists. It doesn't matter whether the data is true data or not, right? Now, the problem with this rationale is that it might have you know, held some ground back in the day, but that is highly outdated, right? So the problem now in computer science is not how much data we can pack into a signal, right? We, we're very clever now, we, we know how to do that. The problem that we have now is the infodemic. That's how the, world, the head of the World Health Organization has called what's going on today with the spread of this information. I.e. the increased interest in researching and developing automatic algorithmic detection of misinformation and disinformation makes it such that this practical rationale doesn't hold anymore. There's also a theoretical rationale which I find puzzling, and it has to do with natural language semantics. That's why I find it puzzling. So the thought is in the literature that natural language gives us clear hints to non-factivity, so to the thought that information doesn't need to be true. Um, and here are the kind of contents that people have taken to, to be evidence of this. So it seems natural to say things like, the media is spreading a lot of fake information, or the library contains a lot of information. So the thought is that if you can prefix it with fake, then probably it can be false. And that if it's okay to say the library contains a lot of information, although of course any library is gonna contain some falsehoods, it follows that information doesn't need to be true. Now, here's the problem uh, with this theoretical rationale. The, the, the stuff about this library, that's just bad logic. This is just us not understanding logic. The, there being some false content in the library is perfectly compatible with it containing a good amount of information, i.e. true content, alongside it, right? Notice, however, that it wouldn't sound right if we were to find out that a particular library contains only falsehoods to say the library contains a lot of information. So I wouldn't say that about the Library of the Communist Party in Bucharest, easily. And here's a more important uh, part. This, this type of arguing just ignores a lot of work in linguistics. Natural language, if anything, suggests to the contrary that information has to be true, it's factive. So here is why, very roughly, when a complex expression consists of an intentional modifier and a modified expression, we cannot infer a type-species relation from it. So what, I, what am I talking about? Here is a paradigmatic case, right? Privative modifiers, such as fake, former, and spurious, license the inference to not X rather than the inference to X, right? So my former husband doesn't license the inference to it's, it's one of my husbands. It just places the interest to, is not my husband anymore, right? So former husband is not a species of husband. It's just someone who's not my husband 
anymore. And uh, similarly, fake gold is not a species of gold. It's something that is not gold by definition, right? So basically, in a nutshell, the fact that information takes fake as a modifier suggests, if anything, that information is factive and that fake acts as a privative. And furthermore, natural language semantics, if we are to really do our investigation properly, also gives us further direct reason to be skeptical about this information being a species of information. So here are several instances of these prefixed properties that fail to signal tie species relations, right? So this barring is not a way of becoming a member of the bar, right? This pleasing is not a way of pleasing, and this placing is not a form of placing. So it is peculiar to, that we ever thought that this information is a species of information. How about the second uh, assumption? Maybe this sounds a bit more natural. People think this information is a species of misinformation, i.e. the species that is intentionally spread. So here's a problem with this as well. As opposed to misinformation, this information doesn't need to be false. I just, I started off by saying this, right? I can, for instance, much more proficiently spread this information in a target audience by asserting true content, but generating a false implicature. So let me give you an example of how I can do that. I can come on TV and I, I can say, there's disagreement in science about climate change. Now, that's strictly speaking true. I'm sure there are a couple of quacks somewhere in, you know, in the world that believe that climate change isn't happening and that have a science degree. So, strictly speaking, there probably is some disagreement in science about climate change. But when you assert this, what you imp implicate is that there's a relevant amount of disagreement such that it's worth talking about it. And especially when you assert it on TV, you give it newsworthiness implicature. You, when you, say, you, when you say there's disagreement in science about climate change, what you imply for your audience is that the disagreement is relevantly large, right? So in that way, you are basically disinforming your audience by asserting something that is strictly speaking true and just misleading them with the implicatures that you're triggering. And here's another problem. Information and misinformation exists out there, whether we exist or not, right? So some things are true and some things are false, and that's just how it is, whether we all die. But this information is clearly us dependent, right? In that it is essentially second personal and audience involved, right? If there's no audience, there is no disinformation campaign. And here's another assumption that is false. The assumption is that this information is essentially intentional and functional, right? So here are, here are a bunch of problems with this. When Tim was talking about black box AIs, so imagine a black box AI that in the absence of any intention on the part of the designer, learns how to, how to and proceeds to widely spreading false claims about the COVID vaccines in the population in a systematic manner. Now, we don't want to attribute intention to AIs, presumably, that would be too anthropocentric, and the function is also missing since the designer never intended it to do this. But clearly, this is a paradigmatic example of a disinformation campaign. And we don't even need to go as far as think about AI. We can think about a paradigmatic example of disinformation spreading, which is spreading conspiracy theories. So this is a paradigmatic instance, but these people usually believe it, right? That's the thing with conspiracy theories. Maybe with the exception of some, you know, um, badly intentioned guru, conspiracy theorists believe the conspiracy theory and they're trying to save you by trying to convince you that they're true. So there's no intention to mislead, but nevertheless, this is a paradigmatic example of this information. So what we've developed in our research center, we started, because you know, if all of this, all I've said is at least, you know, close to true, we literally do not know what this information is, right? I just told you that all the assumptions behind the account that we work with are false. So if I'm right, it's pretty, pretty depressing. So what we started doing in my research center is develop a fresh, uh, ground up, a new account of this information that we can work with in order to protect ourselves uh, online. So we, we rely on, I'm not going to discuss this a lot, we can talk about it in the Q&A if you want. We, dis, we take information to be possible knowledge. The only reason why I'm telling you this is in order to understand the counterpart of it, this information. Uh, so we take information to consist in a signal that um, carries, uh, carries um, uh, that, is, that has the capacity to generate knowledge that P, where P is a proposition, in a suitably uh, situated possible agent. So if a signal is able to generate knowledge in any possible uh, agent, then it 
carries information. That's roughly the account. And why should we believe that, that this account works? Well, because kind of information kind of carries this functional uh, nature up its sleeve, right? So it's no mystery what the function of the digestive system is. It kind of sounds like it's digestion, right? And there's no mystery what the function of washing machine is, is to wash. So similarly, the function of information uh, seems obvious is to inform, so to generate knowledge. So then we think that this information is the counterpart of information, i.e. it's stuff that has the capacity to generate or increase ignorance, right? And this can be done in a variety of ways, not just via false content, right? Uh, so what we think is that uh, X is a piece of this information in a particular context, if and only if it's a content unit communicated at that context that has a disposition to generate or increase ignorance in normal uh, conditions. And notice that the view is contextualist in that the same communicated content might be disinformation in one particular context with one particular audience and not disinformation with a different audience, depending on the background information that the audience has. So here are a few ways, and by no means this is not a full, intended to be a full taxonomy, but here are a few ways in which you can spread this information if you want to take this job up. So you can do it uh, via just, you know, spreading falsehoods, that's the easy way, it's not going to work well, uh, I recommend the other ways, they're more efficient. Um, you can do it via what we call in epistemology misleading defeat, this sounds very technical, but all it means is misleading evidence against stuff that you believe, right? So if, I be if you believe that it's raining outside right now and I come and tell you no it isn't, uh, you're not justified to believe it anymore, even though for all you know I might have said something false, so maybe your initial belief was true. So that's something that happened, that's a very nice way of uh, spreading this information, a very efficient way, where you come and you just, as it were, make people's beliefs to be less justified than they used to be by introducing some sort of evidence against their belief, evidence that it's otherwise misleading. Uh, you can do it by in inducing epistemic anxiety, right? So, you know, what we do in epistemology courses to our students in the first year, we tell them, are you really sure that the external world exists and you're sitting at your desk? I mean, at the end of the day, you might be a brain in a vat, then your brain is stimulated to have all of these experiences that you have now. So this is just a funny thing that we do to our students. Many start doubting it. But you, you can see how you can do this with serious real world uh, matters, right? You can come and say, are you really sure this vaccine is safe? After all, scientists have gotten it wrong in the past. Are you really, really sure? And what you do then is you introduce epistemic anxiety in this audience because you falsely imply that they need complete certainty in order to go and get the vaccine, which of course, that's false, right? And you can also defeat people's confidence uh, in, by doing that, right? So you can kind of make them less sure of what they believe, even though they continue believing it, right? And again, going back to what I was saying at the beginning, the easiest way to do it, and indeed the traditional way in, in Eastern Europe, is by, via exploding, um, exploring pragmatic phenomena, such as uh, false implicatures or introducing false uh, presuppositions. So very roughly, here is an account of this information that's going to help us track it with AIs. A signal R carries this information for an audience, A, with regard to a particular proposition, P, if and only if A's evidential probability that P conditional on R is less than A's unconditional evidential probability that P, and P is true. This is a lot of words about probabilities, only to say that if I have justification to believe that P and P is true at uh, this level, and what you tell me comes and lowers my justification, then you have spread this information. Right? So I believe that it's raining outside because I checked the weather report, so I believe it with justification. You come and tell me that it's not, you, you're lowering my justification, you're lowering uh, my conditional probability that, uh, for P, thereby you have acted as a dis disinformer on me. And you can see why this is a good account for us to work with, because AIs know probabilities and programmers know how to work with probabilities. So all we need to do is identify a crumb on ground in the target population and calculate whether a message that I'm spreading right now is going to lower their probability for this true content. Um, so in a nutshell, what I've said is that this information is not a type of information, disinforming is not a way of informing, and while information is content with knowledge generating potential, this information is content with a disposition to generate ignorance in normal condition at this context 
at stake. And we can calculate this in very nice mathematical ways with probabilities that we know a lot about. Uh, and that's going to help us uh, build a proper fact-checking uh, AI that's going to actually you know, protect us from the most problematic disinformation uh, strategies. The, the depressing upshot, of course, is that this information is much more ubiquitous and harder to track than it is currently taken to be uh, by the fact checkers, checkers that we have. The good news is that we can now embark on building better fact checkers that can protect us well. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, um, we have time for questions. So who would like to start? Thank you. How do you deal with ideological slash political claims? What's your way of dealing with them? So, the way to deal with them is, first of all, to figure out whether the claims are true or not. Because just because they're ideological, it doesn't follow that they're false, right? It, there can be true claims that are part of ideologies. What, the, the, what's characteristic of ideologies is they, that overall they paint, they paint an incorrect picture uh, of reality. But that is compatible with a lot of claims within them being true. And indeed, that's usually how, the, how ideological campaigns are run, right? You appeal to some things that people believe to be true, and you build a bunch of falsehoods uh, on top of that, right? So the way to do it, of course, is to first identify what claims are true and what claims are false in the ideology. Uh, so that's the easy way that even fact checkers that we have now uh, can do. Uh, what I have argued, basically, is that that's not enough. Because part of the badness of ideology is that it defeats our knowledge, not just that it gives us false beliefs. Sometimes it, gives, it, it makes true assertions that still defeats the knowledge that we have in virtue of these false pragmatic uh, things like implicatures or presuppositions. Right? So what to basically this account, it, you know, I'm, I'm not making very optimistic claim here, gets us on the way to try to deal with I ideological pressures in that it explains what is wrong with a system that has a bunch of truths inside of it, but overall gives you a very problematic um, and incorrect view of reality, right? So let me just give you one example. Several accounts of the literature on understanding, so the philosophy of understanding, uh, think of understanding as very documented knowledge. You have pieces of knowledge that bear nice explanatory connections between them. So, you, uh, you know, if you want to introduce an ideological claim, and thereby spread it in this form, what you can do is destroy my understanding, not necessarily with a lot of falsehood, but just giving, destroying this well-connectedness that I have about the reality, right? By giving me some pragmatic uh, implicatures that make me feel unsure about this connectedness of the knowledge that I have. And that is exactly, I mean, conspiracy theories are just a, you know, a sexy and well-studied this days way of doing that in the audience, right? <coughs> Yes, please. So thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Um, I'm wondering about one thing. Um, in the empirical study of disinformation, um, people use a narrow definition, which you have broadened now into, for example, uh, lowering the certainty in beliefs and so on. And I wonder, what is the difference between expanding disinformation as a definition and looking at effects of dis disinformation? Because normally we would look at effects of disinformation, it creates false beliefs, it um, lowers certainty in beliefs, it lowers certainty in attitudes, um, spreads ideology, but usually we do not define disinformation as the effects of disinformation. I'd be interested to hear that. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that's a very helpful question. So I guess there are a couple of things. So in philosophy we distinguish between conceptually engineering a concept and just analyzing it. So I didn't take myself to have conceptually engineered this information. I didn't take myself to say, look, we think that 
the correct account of this information is misleading falsehood, uh, but we should expand it. We should have a broader understanding. That's not what I did. What I did was to say, this is an incorrect account. We are working with a bad account of this information because it's not even capturing phenomena that we paradigmatically take to be disinformation, such as spreading conspiracy theories, for instance, right? So our account is not a good one, but it needs to be enlarged. No, our account is just a bad one, and we were wrong about it. We need to be more careful when we analyze our phenomena, because if we have bad analysis thereof, then we're not going to be able to track this phenomena when we want to track it. Right. So that's one, one thing to say. Secondly, uh, you, you correctly ask, well, but e explaining the nature of this information in terms of its function, isn't that uh, a bit peculiar? Because you want to say that the nature is one thing and then the investigation of the function of it is a different type of investigation. Not necessarily. We already know uh, from you know, a lot of uh, centuries as it were, of uh, metaphysics and analysis that some items only afford functional definitions. So let me give you an example. So there's a distinction in philosophy between a functional definition and a dismantling analysis. A dismantling analysis is where you break it down in parts. What are bachelors? They're unmarried men. That's a dismantling analysis. You dismantle the word, the concept of bachelors in smaller concepts. But some concepts don't afford dismantling analysis. So the paradigmatic case is the concept key. The concept key comes in multiple instantiations, and the only thing that these things have in common is that they can open a lot. So the only way to define what the key is is in terms of its function. It's the kind of thing that opens a lot. Because otherwise they come in various shapes. It's very hard to give a dismantling analysis. And many people think, for instance, that belief works like this, that it only affords a function, a functional analysis. And if, you know, if, if that's true about belief, it kind of makes sense that it's true about disinformation as well. Right? So I guess what I argued is that this information can take very many shapes, and the only thing that all these shapes have in common is that they have a disposition to generate ignorance uh, in the other. Two unrelated questions. We may have to put them in sequence. So please, you can start. Thank you for the fascinating lecture. Um, I'm not in your field, I'm an astrophysicist. So I'm wondering, um, you're, you're assuming that the audience is rational and is able to self-correct its trajectory, but... <laughs> Thank you for your fascinating lecture. So uh, this is fascinating, but you're assuming that the audience is rational and is able to self-correct its trajectory. But communication is not just about imparting facts. And in an ensemble sense, human beings don't always respond to fact, and they don't always self-correct. So how do your strategies fit within this broader landscape? Thanks a lot. So the view does not assume that we're rational, which is why it's audience dependent. So. You can, indeed you can, if you know that a particular audience has a particular bias, say some motivated uh, reason, say that you know that they are right-wingers, so they engage in a lot of politically motivated re uh, reasoning of the right-wing variety, you can engage in a disinformation campaign that takes advantage of that bias that you know is there. Or if you know your audience is gender biased, you can engage in a disinformation campaign that takes advantage of that bias. So basically, you know, if anything, all the counts of this information were assuming the rationality of the audience because they were assuming that people want to believe truths and they don't want to believe falsehoods and then they were just tracking false uh, content. This account is actually flexible enough to, uh, you know, to explain what's going on in cases in which irrational audiences have some biases and if I want to spread this information in this audience, I'm going to take advantage of this bias and then generate the truth. I hope this helps. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I, within my activities every day, I, I, I live with disinformation. Uh, actually, uh, a few minutes ago, I was just receiving some messages from Mexico about <clears throat> something that is being spread in the uh, social networks. They say, uh, Everyone has to be careful within the next 24 hours because the plate tectonics in Mexico is becoming very active and there's going to be a very big earthquake uh, within the next 24 hours. Well, they are using uh, facts, actually, but they, they are lying about the other things. So, <clears throat> according to your uh, definition about this information, of course, this part of uh, this treasure is also a disinformation example. But I'm not clear, uh, I, I, I don't quite understand what's the difference with misinformation. Could you explain a little bit yes. more? So misinformation is false content. 
That's one thing. Secondly, so misinformation does need to be false. You can't, so, so true content doesn't count as misinformation, even though it counts as misinformation. Another important difference is that, I said this before, misinformation doesn't depend on us. Disinformation is a concept that's audience related. We can't have a disinformation campaign. There's no target on it. But we, we can have misinformation because false content is independent of human beings. Whether we're around or not, it is true or false that, uh, you know, oceans have water inside of them and water is H2O or whatever, right? So, so I guess there, there's content that's true or false and that maps onto information and misinformation to this distinction. But disinformation is something that's audience dependent. If we all die tomorrow, the good news is there's no disinformation left because there's no audience to be targeted. Hope this helps. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So we are off to an excellent start, and it's a good sign that we have a difficulty. We will certainly continue these conversations over tea and coffee, and we reassemble in ex exactly half, a little less actually, half an hour. So this is the first break, so this is the training. If you go out from the room and drift, migrate towards the left, uh, the area where you registered, then you should find the refreshments uh, for the break. One half hour. Thank you. Dear colleagues, I think it is high time for us to begin this session. And you will see, I think, throughout also these um, three sessions after the break, there is an inner coherence. They will come back to themes, but they will also, some of them, return to issues we were discussing earlier this morning. Um, the first speaker is Hans Joas. And um, I've, almost, I've known how he was almost for too long to, to be able to do and make a good introduction of him. So Hans is the Ernst Trölz Professor for the Sociology of Religion at the Humboldt University of Berlin. He is, has also for a very long time uh, been at, uh, at a position at the University of Chicago where he is a member of the famous Committee on Social Thought and is Professor of Sociology there. Actually, the, the establishment of the professorship you hold was related to the fact that in uh, 2017, he received the Max Planck Research Award. At that time, that was jointly awarded by the Max Planck Gesellschaft, Max Planck Society, and the Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung, which is one of the highest awards you can get in, in, in the German-speaking world. His first major works were dealing with American pragmatism. He wrote an important book about George Herbert Mead that was published by MIT Press. Uh, he has later uh, written other books on so pragmatism and social theory, but I want to mention the very important book that was partially, that was called The Creativity of Action. The Creativity at the Sundays, which is really outlining a comprehensive, it is an outline of a comprehensive theory of action, not only deliberative, narrowly instrumental rational action, but other types of action, which is, has received enormous attention, being translated in many languages. That volume also tangentially dealt with this issues, issues of what values are, what, what are values really, how do they emerge. He later published a book that pursued this topic explicitly, The Genesis of Values. And he applied that in different contexts, including studies of war and religion and experiences of self-transcendence. That, in turn, led on to a very important work, which in the English version is called The Sacredness of the Person, A New Genealogy of Human Rights. We will talk about human rights later on this morning, but that is one of the most ambitious genealogical studies of that that exists. Currently, he is involved in writing a trilogy of books that I think will 
summarize, not more than summarize, but that will really connect virtually all he has written before. The first of these volumes is translated into English and published in, um, by Oxford University Press, and it's called The Sacredness of the Person, A New Genealogy of Hum uh, uh, The Power of the Sacred, an Alternative to the Narrative of Disenchantment, that's published in 2021. And it's a very, very powerful account that is a deep engagement with Max Weber's theory arising in a very sharp critique of Weber, actually. There is a, a second volume, which also will be published by Oxford, which is not yet out in the English translation. And then Hans is working on the third volume, so it really is a major oeuvre. I should, unsurprisingly, his research has been recognized and awarded in different settings. He received already in 2010 the Niklas Luhmann Prize. He has received the Prix Paul Ricoeur. He has received the Hans Kilian Award and he's honorary doctor at several universities, including Tübingen and Uppsala, and more recently, the Peter Pasmani University in Budapest. I will say nothing more. I will take no more time, but warmly welcome us. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, let me first of all say thanks to Björn and to the Academia Europea for the invitation and to you, Björn, for this very generous introduction. Let me also mention that I grew up in Munich and for me this, I, I have known this room for decades. Uh, from, I remember it from my student days, even actually from my high school days because there were poetry readings taking place here in this room more than 50 years ago. Uh, so uh, you've seen the title of my talk, What Comes After the Secularization Thesis. Whoever asks a question like the one I'm posing in the title of this lecture, namely, what comes after a certain thesis, is obviously basing his considerations on a strong assumption. In this case, the assumption that a certain thesis on the historical dynamics of the development of religion, a thesis that has been approved by many for a long time and widely accepted almost without question, has largely lost its plausibility today. This thesis, for which the designation secularization thesis has become common, is not simply, as is frequently assumed, the assertion that religion has suffered a progressive loss of significance in a considerable number of above all European societies, Eastern and Western, ex-communist and others, and in a very few countries outside Europe. This assertion would be a simple statement of fact to be decided by careful empirical research. As difficult as it may often be to record not only membership figures of churches and other religious communities, but also personal beliefs of individuals. Do you believe in God, in life after death, or religious practices? Do you pray? Do you pray only alone or also together with others? Only in the form of fixed prayer formulas, or in free communication with the divine? Do you pray only in silence or also in public rituals? However, the secularization thesis means more than such statements about quantitative developments in such dimensions. 
Rather, it refers to a particular explanation for such developments. Namely, that there is a strong causal connection between the modernization of societies and the weakening of religion in such a way that economic growth, rising prosperity, and scientific and technological progress somehow together increasingly displace religion within a necessity irreversibly and ultimately make it superfluous. It is this thesis that has largely lost its possibility for many sociologists and historians of religion in the last 20 to 30 years. It is to this that the question I'm posing here of what can take its place is directed. With these remarks, I've obviously opened a wide field of objects of investigation. Let me just briefly introduce the following four. First, why exactly did this loss of plausibility occur in the last 20 to 30 years? Second, what superior alternative explanation is there? The weakening of religion where it exists must certainly be explained in one way or the other. Third, how does this change, this loss of plausibility of the secularization thesis, how does this change our views about the prehistory of, let's say, modern European secularization, modern meaning since the 18th century or so? If modernization and secularization do not form an indissoluble combination, then the assumptions about the prehistory of modern European secularization are also shaken, especially the most influential of them, namely the narrative, going back to the famous sociologist Max Weber, of a world historical process of disenchantment that had allegedly already begun with the Old Testament prophets and made the Christian or the Judeo-Christian tradition appear as a step toward secularization. And fourth, if neither the secularization nor the disenchantment thesis are convincing, do we not have to question much more than previous ideas about the development of religion? Don't fundamental assumptions about the history of modernity and modernization start to slip? And don't we then have to switch from the idea of historically guaranteed features of modernity and modernization to a view of history that treats the fate of what we consider universalistic values as open and dependent on other developments. In this, in such a changed questioning, one would then have to investigate the sources of such universalistic values, of an ethos of humanity, and these sources can be religious or secular, and in place of the front line of the secularization debates, namely religious versus secular, another front line would then emerge, namely that between universalism and particularism. That is at least what I will claim. Now it's clear that an exhaustive treatment of these four questions would completely overload this occasion. Nevertheless, I had to mention all four of them, all four complexes, 
because otherwise I cannot make intelligible the coherence and whole claim of the argument, the ambition of this argument, an argument I have developed in quite a number of books. On this occasion, I will mostly focus on the first two and then be extremely brief with regard to three and four. So the first question, the loss of plausibility. I think two kinds of causes can be cited. On the one hand, progress in research. On the other hand, changes in real history. On the side of research, above all, an improved understanding of the development of religion in the United States is to be mentioned. Also, but to a lesser extent, the increased attention within sociology to the intra-European differences. Very briefly on both points, the US has always been considered a stumbling stone, a stumbling block for the proponents of the secularization thesis since no one disputed its economic and scientific technical modernity, but it remained religiously much more vital and even productive of religion than European societies. By religiously productive, I mean producing new forms of religion that are even able to survive like Mormonism in the 19th century and Pentecostalism in the 20th century. On closer examination, now with regard to Europe, the differences between countries in Europe in religious terms, including contiguous and historically linked countries, such as the Czech Republic and Slovakia, also proved to be enormous and in need of explanation. Here is, it is also instructive to pay closer attention to the respective relationship of the majority of a population to the seriously practicing religious people, in this case, mostly Christians. For Sweden, for example, the term vicarious religion was coined to express a benevolent attitude of those who do not go to church on Sunday toward those who attend the services. Huh? So the majority considers those who go as going also for them, so to speak, yeah? uh, on behalf of them, of all. But it would be ludicrous to speak of a similar benevolence of others in the case of churchgoers in Eastern Germany. Here, on the contrary, what I've called a normalization of unbelief has taken place. And the view is widespread that religious faith has been definitively disproved scientifically and is politically disreputable. Now, on the level of real history, so not scientific progress, it is the developments in East Asia on the one hand and in Africa on the other that have made it clear to many that there is Eurocentrism in the secularization thesis. China, for example, is experiencing a multifaceted religious upswing despite all state repression of religion, which has recently been stepped up again, affecting both culturally indigenous religious traditions, such as Taoism, also Buddhism, and mostly Protestant Christianity. The development in South Korea is spectacular, where one of the most rapid economic and scientific technical modernization processes ever seen in world history is accompanied by a revitalization of the country's own religious traditions and by a strong Christianization. Christianity is growing strongly in many African states. Although at one time in the 1950s, early 60s, <clears throat> even some of the most astute observers 
For example, the great Protestant theologian Paul Tillich, Paul Tillich assumed that the end of colonial rule would cause Christianity to wither in Africa as a European colonial implant. But this growth today is mainly, but not only due to demographic reasons. According to serious estimates, the number of Christians in Africa is currently increasing by 23,000 people every day in the form of the so-called Pentecostal movement, Christianity continues to spread today in Latin America, Africa, and East Asia, and against the greatest opposition even in some areas of India. Now, until his death in 2021, a very famous social scientist, one of the staunchest advocates of the secularization thesis, was the eminent empirical researcher of changing values, Ronald Inglehart. From a certain point on, he linked the secularization thesis to a greater consideration of demography, specifically the fact that more religious societies seem to be more fertile than more secular ones. In this way, he explained, why, well, according to him, the world was becoming more and more religious, even though modernization for him was leading to secularization. Huh? Secular societies dying out, so to speak. At the very end of his life, however, he once again launched a kind of counter-offensive against the critics of the secularization thesis. He now claimed that today, the U.S. was also turning onto the classical path of secularization. According to him, this is supported by the rapid increase in the proportion of people in the U.S. who stayed in service today that they do not belong to any religious community, the so-called nuns. Uh -huh. On some other occasion, I pronounced it in the American style as nuns, and somebody misunderstood this as the increase in the number of nuns, uh, so religious women uh, in the US. This is not what I have in mind. Especially since the early 1990s, this increase can indeed no longer be ignored. While the proportion was 10% in 1997, it rose 10 years later to 15%, reached 20% in 2014, and about 25 today. What once looked like a mere rounding error is about to account for a quarter of the American population today. Of course, researchers in the sociology of religion have long been aware that it is highly risky to base statements about religiosity primarily on data about membership in churches and religious communities. After all, one can be a member without in any serious sense attributing to faith an orienting role for one's own conduct of life. Conversely, one can also be a believer <coughs> without belonging to a religious organization at the time of the survey. It can therefore be ruled out from the outset that the mere increase in non-members, so-called religiously unaffiliated or nuns, could be interpreted without further ado as an increase in unreligious or even anti-religious attitudes. In order to make such a more far-reaching statement, it would be necessary to break down more precisely which attitudes and behaviors with regard to religion the nuns are actually concerned with. We have to distinguish, for example, between atheists, agnostics, and people who describe themselves as nothing in particular. That has proven to be very helpful. When this is done, it becomes clear that the number of decided atheists in the US is only about one-fifth of all the religiously unaffiliated. Agnostics have a similarly large or small share of this group. Indeed, more than half of the religiously unaffiliated are people who 
although they do not currently identify with any specific religious community, can by no means be described as are religious. While about a quarter of Americans today, as I said, do not belong to any religious community, only 10% deny the existence of God. The group of the unaffiliated is extremely heterogeneous in itself. It includes almost half of all US Americans of Asian descent, because their religious traditions evade the denominalization of faith. It also includes a growing proportion of the black underclass. Particularly striking is the finding that in a short four-year period, one in four of the unaffiliated in the US joined a religious community, mostly a Christian one. This indicates that for a considerable proportion of the nuns, non-affiliation is only a temporary phase in life. But of course, this is not to distract from the fact that the increase in nuns does indeed seem to have an epochal character. Various explanatory factors are brought into play in the literature, such as the decline in marriage and parenthood, since people without marriage and children are twice as likely to belong to no religious community than those with stronger family ties. But I think political attitudes are the most responsible. Since the 1970s, Christian churches and religious communities, particularly evangelicals, but even the Catholic Church, have increasingly been perceived as allies of the political right in the United States, leading Democrats and leftists to feel less and less represented by them. Re repelled by them, people are choosing to continue their religious or spiritual journey outside of these religious organizations or to become secular. Now, this is not the place to go into these problems in depth, for example, to ask what role the liberalization of Protestantism uh, may have played in that process. Liberalization of mainline churches. It must be noted, however, that such a political explanation of secularization is different from the explanation resulting from modernization processes. While the one directs the view to seek in a one-sided political positioning of the churches a cause for their loss of credibility, the other treats the weakening of the churches as a welcome or regrettable, inevitable consequence of economic and scientific technical progress. Now, second point, an alternative explanation. We undoubtedly require an alternative explanation. And I believe this alternative is already readily available. I call it the political sociology of religion and regard the British sociologist David Martin, who died two years ago, as its pioneer. This approach foregrounds churches and religious communities stands on the major political questions of a given era. For example, the so-called social question in Europe in the 19th century. The national question, which was so crucial for the loyalty of the Poles, the Irish, the Croats, and if you allow me to add here in my hometown, the Bavarians to their Catholic Church. The democratic question, the rights of the individual, the emancipation of women, and the issue of religious pluralism. Now, do not misunderstand it. I'm not saying all these questions are always equally important. It totally depends on the historical constellations, whether, for example, the national question is the crucial question at the moment or not. The patchwork religious map of Europe, where highly religious regions sometimes border 
on highly secular ones can be understood only from such a historically nuanced perspective. This also allows us to see how far from inevitable certain processes of secularization were and are. What matters is the character of the institutional relationship between state and church or state and religious communities. Excessive proximity to the state and a power-backed territorial religious monopoly were always a danger for the churches if political and economic dissatisfaction spread among the general population. I give you one of my favorite examples. It involves a Catholic area on the territory of the former East German state in the so-called Eichsfeld region of Thuringia, where I once gave a talk in a, in a high school. It was forced to close in the context of Bismarck's Kulturkampf, cultural struggle, after which it was reopened. Later, the Nazis closed it. It was sequently reopened. The next to close it were the communists, after which it was reopened once again. So three political regimes in Germany came and went, and this Catholic school survived them all. The notion of the churches and the whole of Christianity's steadfast closeness to the state must sound strange indeed to the people in the Eichsfeld region, which, rather like Asterix's Gaulish village, holding out against the might of the Roman Empire, has remained an island of the Catholic faith as the various political regimes have arisen and fallen away. Now, tensions of this kind are not solely part of the past. They may also take new and unexpected forms. I won't illustrate that with regard to migration policy, to questions of war and peace, for example. The increased need for individualistic forms of spirituality also seems significant to me. While this need may very well be satisfied within major religious communities and traditions, it may also be a threat to them. This is the rational core of the claim that esotericism and new forms of spirituality are on the increase. But it is empirically incorrect to extrapolate from religious or quasi-religious quest-centered movements which often lead merely to short-lived membership or practice, and are mostly, that's very important, not passed on to the children of those involved to the impending dissolution of all religious institutions. Let me make two brief additional remarks to avoid misunderstandings. An emphasis on political questions does not mean that the political dimension is all that matters and that there is no religious matter as such, or that, as Marxism suggests, religious forms are merely the displaced expressions of material interests. But the turn to and away from particular religions, and I would say the turn to and away from secular worldviews also, and value systems, mostly occurs not on the basis of the precise doctrinal statements of a religion or secular worldview, but via holistic forms of identification. Hence, religious biographies are determined in part by such key political inflection points. And finally, it may be some time before the consequences of such pivotal political forks in the road kick in. We know from the United Kingdom, I mean from studies about the, uh, Great Britain, that for a long time, men's distance from the church did not prompt them to leave because their mothers, their wives, their lovers often acted as a countervailing force. But if women too lose their ties to the church, thus feminizing unbelief, the result may be an avalanche of departures. And if due to historical circumstance, 
the parental generation fails to keep their children in the religious community, then galloping secularization occurring after some delay is likely. This sounds more gloomy than I mean it to be. One may also read the 300-year history of the weakening Christianity in Europe as the history of repeated instances of partially successful rejuvenation, as a reason not to underestimate the vitality of Christianity even in the secularized parts of Europe, and to contemplate the undeniable relevance of its message, its liturgical practice, and welfare and social activities. Now, this turn to a political sociology of religion could therefore be called a first preliminary answer to my question, what comes after the secularization thesis? This brings me to the third point. This, so far, has only been preliminary because it only refers to the explanation of the secularization in the modern history of Europe. Only since the 17th and 18th century has Europe seen the emergence of an intellectually developed and aggressively espoused new alternative to the Christian faith in the shape of what the great Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor in his monumental 2007 work, A Secular Age, called the rise of the secular option. Let me say in parentheses, I prefer this terminology over the terminology of secularization because secularization always sounds as if everybody is affected in the same way by one and the same process. Whereas Taylor's idea was to say something new and additional comes up and some people choose these new, this new option where others, whereas others redefine their own religious inclinations in view of this new option, but not by going over uh, to it. Prior to the appearance of the secular option, there was certainly religious indifference, hatred towards some or all clergy or the church, for example, in light of its role as exploitative landowner, but apart from Judaism and only in very small parts of Europe, Islam, and the views of some intellectuals, no self-confident alternative to Christianity existed in Europe. How did this new worldview manage to emerge and spread? The key question here is, whether the explanation for modern European secularization lies in the conditions of the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries themselves, or whether this epoch-making shift has a lengthy prehistory. Logically, there seems to me to be no third possibility. So we either explain that out of European history in the 18th century and so on, or we say it is a kind of late result of Christianity. Christianity somehow has always already pointed in this uh, direction. Just as the theory of secularization claims to explain the development of the last two centuries, there is a narrative that claims to explain this prehistory, and that is the narrative of disenchantment. Disenchantment is not secularization, though the two are constantly confused. For Max Weber, <clears throat> the main source of this narrative, disenchantment, in fact, meant a history extending across two and a half millennia, beginning with the Hebrew prophets, and certain parallel phenomena in other cultures, such as the Buddha. Weber drew a line that led from these prophets and, but he didn't have much to say about that, the philosophy of the Greeks, after setbacks in the Middle Ages, to a new prophetic awakening in the Reformation, and from there to the early modern scientific revolution, from there to the establishment of a causal mechanistic worldview, 
and the philosophy of the Enlightenment, and subsequently on that basis to a profound crisis of meaning in the European fin de siècle around 1900 and on the eve of the First World War. This narrative has proved to be tremendously suggestive. Much as Nietzsche ascribed to Christianity a constitutive role in a historical process that inevitably led to the overcoming of Christianity, because, according to Nietzsche, the ethos of truthfulness necessarily leads to historical Bible criticism, and this is destructive for the faith. Weber, however great his distance from Nietzsche in the detail, also constructed a narrative that leaves no room for an intellectually responsible and vital religiosity in our era. Now I'm running out of time, uh, so let me just briefly summarize. Uh, in this book, The Power of the Sacred, I have tried to show that this notion of uh, disenchantment is deeply ambiguous, that it has at least three different meanings, and all three different meanings are different from the meaning secularization, namely that it means, now, ugly neologisms, uh, demagification, desacralization, and detranscendentalization. I would have to explain all that and which phases in history can be analyzed according to which one of these three concepts. But the, so the, what I'm claiming is that Weber's main mistake was to concatenate these processes into one narrative as if demagification at some point necessarily leads to detranscendentalization and this to desacralization. This is not the case. The alternative description is to say there are processes of demagification, but also of the rise of new magic. There are processes of desacralization, but also the emergence of new sacralizations. There are processes of detranscendentalization, but there are also moments, historical moments where new strength is given to ideas about transcendence. And there is, of course, not only secularization, but empirically also religious revitalization. So that is the third part. And then the fourth part, I'm saying uh, that, so if the whole debate about the secularization thesis in a certain sense has proved to be sterile, and if religion is certainly not to disappear from the face of the earth in the future, whether you like it or not, we should move from the debates about secularization to the question, what are the affinities of religious or secular traditions to universalistic values? We should move from a mere focus on the history of religion to a focus on the history of what I call moral universalism or to use a term that uh, sounds less artificial, uh, an ethos of humanity. And I'm looking at Björn not only because he's the moderator, but also because Björn himself has contributed to the rich historical sociological literature of the last few decades about the first phase in the history of moral universalism, namely what is called the Axial Age. How did moral universalism come into being at all? Where, when, and exactly why uh, the most important contributors following the German philosopher Karl Jaspers were the Israeli sociologist Shmuel Eisenstadt, the American sociologist Robert Bella, and Björn Wittrock, and my own work in the last 20 years or so is also a contribution to that uh, well beyond this first phase of moral universalism in the axial age. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Hans, for this thought-provoking and very rich lecture. Uh, we are 
sadly, due to late arrival of, of the audience, a little bit behind schedule. Mm -hmm. We can take one, but really not more than one question. Isa Kalimi, please. Wirklich sehr interessante und wunderbare. We have to speak English. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I, I thank you very much for your enlightening and uh, wonderful uh, lecture. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of your uh, uh, lecture that uh, there are two reasons, basic reasons for the secularization, the economic prosperity and technology. Would you like also to add to that, to the, um, that um, I would say nihilistic an irresponsible treatment of the fundamental or core text of Judeo-Christian. I mean, the Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, Old Testament. I mean, <clears throat> simply they destroyed any credibility, any, any value of it. Uh, this is uh, one point. The other, uh, perhaps you can add there also unfortunate uh, uh, scandals in the churches that really added to that, I, I okay, um, the last point uh, for your, uh, thank you so much. End, end of your, uh, thank you, end of your uh, lecture, you said you would like to develop uh, uh, moral values, uh, some goal, yeah, I think uh, without God is not functioning, even with God is not functioning so well, so I, I, I question this. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Uh, let me briefly Very explain response. that where the point at which I mentioned economic growth and scientific technological progress, these are not my explanations for decline of religion, but I'm referring to people who think since there is economic growth and since there is scientific technological progress and both are thought to be destructive for religion. So in the long run, religion will disappear because of constant economic growth and because of constant scientific progress. So it's not me, huh? but I'm referring to an existing thesis that in my eyes is misguided. Huh? And then I only sketched an alternative explanation in, in this alternative explanation. For example, what you said with regard to scandals around the churches, of course, will play an important role. I fully agree with that, but that is a different explanation. It then means also that the churches may be able, for example, uh, to reform themselves in ways that does not drive people away uh, from them. And with regard to Bible criticism, uh, I would say, no, I mean, the point I briefly mentioned when I was referring to Charles Taylor was, of course, that under the conditions of, let's say, a critical study of the Bible, some people redefine their faith, go in a less literalist direction of the interpretation of sacred texts and so on. So there is no determinative uh, power in that. And with regard to your second question, just one sentence, I'm not focusing on all values, but on this, let's say, highly improbable value that when you make a moral decision, you should take the well-being not only of those who are close to you, but of all human beings into consideration. And I'm claiming this does not come naturally. I believe it comes naturally to us to become moral with regard to those who are close to us, but not to those who are not in any reasonable sense close to us. But it is a historical and cultural fact that we have moralities that challenge us to do exactly that in Stoicism in, and so on, yeah, in Buddhism and in the Judeo-Christian tradition. And the question is, how could this come into existence, and why did it come into existence, and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Hans, once again. Thank you. The next speaker is Jürgen Kocker, and uh, 
you all know that he is one of the most prominent historians in the world. He has dealt with questions of the industrial world, the relationship between forms of knowledge, forms of economic organization and state, comparative history really of capitalism, states, and knowledge in, from the 18th to the 20th century, to the, well, 21st century. Come up, Jürgen. And uh, I, I will be um, brief, and I, you, when I say that, you can see directly that there are close relationships, I think, between what Jürgen is going to say and what we dealt with before the break, namely the question of relationship between forms of knowledge, claims to knowledge and truth and science, on the one hand, and the shift, systematically shifting contexts in both economic and political terms. That is what you will talk about. He has received more honors than almost any historian I know of. He has had important positions in universities across the world. He has received, uh, he has uh, been holding position as permanent fellow at the Wissenschaftskolleg, the Institute for Advanced Study Berlin. He has been president of one of the largest research institutions in Europe. The Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin. He has been chairman of the Comité International des Sciences Historiques, and I could go on. I would just say that he has not received a Nobel Prize, but there is no Nobel Prize in history, but he has received the closest there is to that, and that's the Holberg Prize. Uh, I could speak for a very long time. Needless to say, he has played a leading role in a large number of academies, including both Leopoldina and the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences. Warmly welcome, Jürgen. Thank you, Björn, for doing this uh, work and for this kind introduction. Colleagues and guests, organized capitalism and organized science. Let me start by stating from which angle I want to deal with this topic. Basically, I'm interested in the history of capitalism. I'm particularly interested in capitalism's strong inclination to move beyond its original sphere, the economy, and permeate, some would say, colonize other spheres of life, like election processes, or the arts, or sports, very personal relations, education, and perhaps parts of the world of science too. On the other hand, the question, are there limits to this powerful capitalist drive to expand? Are there abutments of resilience? Do we need them? It is in this context I want to deal with a changing relationship between scientific knowledge and capitalism. As a historian, I prefer to start with a space and time specific case before trying to develop um, some more general hypotheses. I want to speak about industrial capitalism. I want to speak about industrial capitalism in Germany in the late 19th and early 20th century when, in connection with major socioeconomic and socio-political changes, new patterns of the production, distribution, and use of scientific knowledge emerged as part of industrial capitalism, but also in some distance to it. Why talking about a period far back and not about the present? Several reasons play a role. But among them, it's the historians believe that sometimes key elements of a phenomenon are better understood by studying its beginnings. And this combination of organized capitalism and organized science, which I want to discuss, began in the late 19th century. By the way, earlier in Germany than in most other European countries, and it's still a phenomenon of today. When I use the concept capitalism, I mean an economic practice or system in which private property and decentralized decisions, 
markets, competition, and commodification also of labor, as well as investment of capital, profit orientation, and accumulation play an important role. In the last quarter of the 19th century, with the increasing importance of new branches like electrical manufacturing, chemicals, and important technological changes in the production of steel and other raw materials, we observe the rise of large manager-directed corporations with complex systematic managerial uh, structures and with the tendency to increasingly integrate scientific knowledge, first into production, later on into management and marketing as well. We also observe new forms of organized cooperation between those large enterprises, cartels, trusts, mergers, close interdependence of production firms and banks. And at the same time, we observe, thirdly, a certain renewal of state interventionism. After some decades of economic liberalism and deregulation under the banner of free trade, since the rise of, since the rise of the welfare state started in the 1880s, state authorities were intervening with greater intensity in economy and society, just as conversely, economic and social interests increasingly organized, were now exercising growing influence on politics and public policy through their lobbies and interest groups. So the rise of large managerial enterprise, the new strength of cooperative self-organization between them, and the increasing interdependence between market and state these were three interrelated developments which did not destruct or replace capitalist uh, order and practices at all, but these developments led to a new mixture of market and organization, to a new pattern which historians have analyzed as coordinated capitalism or cooperative capitalism, or simply as organized capitalism. At the same time, these three developments made the gradual integration of scientific knowledge into industrial production at least easier, if not even possible. In those branches in which essential parts of the productive program matched with relevant progress in closely related fields of scientific research or technical skills, especially in chemicals, electrical manufacturing, steel, non-ferrous metallurgies, machine building, and optical industries. In what respect? Economies of scale offered the financial margins and high managerial, high qualification of the managerial personnel offered fertile ground for investing in and for opening up cooperation with academic institutions and academic personnel. Interfirm cooperation was essential for tapping sources of scientific knowledge from institutions outside the firms. And only under conditions of close interdependence between state and market could govern governments function as intermediators in building coalitions between business, science, and administrations. Coalitions necessary or at least very helpful for continuously mobilizing scientific input into industrial structures, which then would profit from it. 
Considering these factors, one can understand the intrinsic nexus between organized capitalism as defined on the one hand and the road towards growth and success of science-based industries in the late 19th and early 20th century. Firms had different ways of getting at scientific knowledge which would serve their business goals. Personal contacts and individual contracts with scientists from neighboring research institutions or schools was one possibility. Purchasing patents and licenses, another. But in both cases, further detailed research and technical operations inside the firms were needed for developing an inspiring idea or a patent registered proposal from outside into a practicable procedure of production inside. Such steps of transition were hard to perform without qualified employees and specialized staff. Qualified employees and specialized staff were also needed for other types of research work inside the firm, of continuous research work, for surveying the field and observing as much as possible what the competitors did, or for gradually improving established procedures and making them more efficient, or for piecemeal innovations which would supplement and further develop the production program in order to maintain in a dynamic market and challenged by competitors the competitive position of the firm and even perhaps improve it. So it was between the 1860s and the 1910s that firm-based industrial research was established within the larger companies in the branches I mentioned. First, single persons with some academic training were hired who would then build up firm-based laboratories which would grow and diversify, be grouped around central main laboratories and be further developed into fully-fledged firm-based research departments. These labs and departments were staffed by academically trained chemists, physicists, other scientists, and engineers, but also by persons with practical training and by helpers trained on the job. Or most of them regular employees of the firm and situated in its hierarchical and functional diversified system of positions. The work they did is described as teamwork with sometimes an interdisciplinary touch, at least. Um, at the same time, strictly application-oriented and certainly within the scope of the firm's production program under the guidance of superiors and ultimately under the influence of management and changing market conditions, though not controlled in detail. Now, the evaluative comments by contemporaries and by historians differ from industrialization of invention to basically routine. No question, this type of industrial research was very important for industrialists who maintained and augmented it in spite of high costs. It was a type of scientific research clearly different from scientific research in the universities. And this basic difference between industrial research and university research became even more pronounced in the course of time since the 1880s. It was characterized by certain limits. Relatively narrow specialization, though sometimes across 
disciplinary boundaries, orientation towards reaching results in relatively short time spans, frequently some kind of censorship in relation to competing firms, restricted discourse with peers, in other words, restrictions of freedom of research. Both the strengths and the weaknesses were consequences of the fact that industrial research of this sort was an integral part of organized capitalism. Sensitive to the built-in limits of single firm-based industrial research, some major and influential industrialists supported by leading scientists from prestigious universities argued for an alternative way of making scientific knowledge available for the increasingly science-dependent industries. At least since the 1880s, they stressed the huge importance of basic research, Grundlagenforschung, for the long-time success of German industries, but also with respect to the sharpening international competition. They argued that basic research of the kind needed could not sufficiently pursued in market-dependent industrial labs, which necessarily concentrated on direct and fast application. They pointed out that it could take many years to find out whether a new scientific discovery would pay or not in market terms. They emphatically argued in favor of Forschungsfreiheit, freedom of research, which this, they implied, could not be fully practiced within firms, that is, within institutions which legitimately pursued economic interests first. They depicted scientific progress as absolutely central for long-term economic success, but also for the national prestige and national power, including military power, of the newly founded German Empire. And they said it should not be left to the influence of material interests. Rather, it was something for which governments, the state, should shoulder responsibility, including financial responsibility. And within the semi-authoritarian Kaiserreich, the German Empire, very much under the influence of Prussia and her administrative aristocratic bourgeois and bourgeois elites, this argumentation was remarkably successful. A number of multifunctional research institutions were founded in which scientists and economic actors worked somehow together in close alliance with state representatives who played intermediating roles and were very influential in shaping the scientific landscape, both in the single German states and in the empire. The most important of these creations was the Kaiser Wilhelm Gesellschaft zur Förderung der Wissenschaften, literally the Emperor William Society for the Promotion of Science which was founded in 1911, and it is the predecessor of the Max Planck Society, which was founded in 1948, very different in many ways, but still along similar lines as far as basic structures and as far as the position of the sciences between state and market are concerned until today. It was an alliance of three groups which successfully promoted and later on controlled the Kaiser Wilhelm Society. On the one hand, there were prestigious scholars with influential positions in the academic world, natural scientists, but also historians, even theologians and others, 
who were convinced and made the point that their time required a new form of large-scale science with interdisciplinary elements organized outside the rigid disciplinary structure of universities and carried on by full-time researchers without teaching obligations in institutes under the uh, leadership of very powerful directors since they firmly believed that even large-scale research enterprises could only flourish if directed by strong, of course, male individuals. These academic advocates of large-scale science, science in the broad sense of Wissenschaft, including humanities and social sciences too, were not afraid of close cooperation with capitalists. Quite on the contrary, but they emphasized the autonomy of research and researchers as indispensable in contrast to industrial research within private firms. The second group, there were the initiatives and the contributions by politicians and policymakers, namely by mainly by highly qualified functionaries from inside the Prussian bureaucracy and the imperial court. After all, the emperor gave his name, and this way he attributed outstanding national prestige to the new institution. And there were, thirdly, leading representatives of big industry the powerful and wealthy rulers of empires in electrical manufacturing, chemicals, coal, iron, and steel, but also bankers. And they all promised to support the new society, which would be financed mainly from private donations and not from public money. The emerging organization, first a rather loose umbrella organization with a quickly growing number of relatively autonomous institutes in the natural sciences, but also in legal research and even in history. It, the, the organization became much more integrated later, after World War II. This organization acquired after some discussion, the legal status of an association, Verein, Verein des Bürgerlichen Rechts, of a registered society with individual persons as members. No question, there was much state influence. In fact, leading members invited and explicitly welcomed state influence as an effective protection against too much influence by capitalists and firms. But in spite of all outspoken proximity to the governing authorities, certainly in the Kaiserreich, again under National Socialism, and in a different way today, nevertheless, it was and is not organized as a government agency and it has defended its autonomy against political encroachments again and again with varying success. No question, corporate influence has been powerful. And there has been very close cooperation between single institutes and specific firms over the decades, application-oriented also today. But the society as a whole has not been organized as a market player. And some of its academic members were not free of anti-capitalist resentments, which they liked to voice. Research autonomy was also defended against capitalist claims and influences, particularly in the period after World War II, when basic research, Grundlagenforschung, was emphasized as the main task of the organization. So I have shortly analyzed two forms of organized science. 
I skip the sentences about the problematic of the word organized science because of time, sir. I have analyzed two forms of organized science, one within firms on capitalist markets, the other outside such firms, but with close relation to them. Both patterns show a high degree of compatibility and mutual reinforcement between capitalism and scientific knowledge. But it also became clear that the full integration of scientific research into capitalist contexts requires a price, a certain truncation which limits and narrows the possibilities of scientific research. In contrast, the second form of organized science is based on both proximity and distance to capitalist practices, a pattern which allows a fuller realization of the strengths of scientific research. We should not be surprised, neither about the high degree of compatibility and mutual reinforcement between capitalism and scientific research, nor about the severe tensions between them. On the one hand, there are striking structural similarities between modern science and modern capitalism. Both are committed to growth, actually without limits. Both value innovations highly. And in both, innovation is not only augmentation of the existing status quo, but also invalidates previous solutions, theories, and practices. Creative destruction, as Schumpeter analyzed with respect to capitalism, also plays a role in scientific progress. Third, another similarity both in capitalism and in the sciences, competition is a driving force. Also, both are future-oriented, dealing with uncertain futures, with uncertainties and risks, define the efforts both of entrepreneurs and of scientists and scholars. Both capitalism and science have led and can lead to highly beneficial consequences for humankind, but also to catastrophic ones. On the other hand, there are striking differences between modern capitalism and modern science. It is much more difficult to define scientific knowledge as private property than to do this with capital, with material goods, with resources and results of capitalist practices. Big topic. Discourse, including both criticism and self-criticism, as well as consent and recognition, discourse is a central medium of communication, production, and distribution in the world of science, but not in capitalism. Inclusion and exclusion work differently and on the basis of different criteria in science and capitalism. Universalist uh, inclinations and energies are stronger in science than in capitalism. Um, searching for truth, however defined, is something different from striving for gains, profit, and accumulation. So, Along such lines, not to be discussed now further, one can understand why science and capitalism are not only mutual reinforcing twins, but also counterparts. 
why science, in the sense, broad sense of Wissenschaft, contains elements of resilience against being fully organized along capitalist lines, and why the different logic of both should be respected. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was an absolutely outstanding lecture. We will um, pursue this later on if we can collaborate when you are ready with your or approaching finalization of the huge research project on the Max Planck Society. We would be deeply honored if you could find a way of uh, spelling out the implications for what we are doing and doing that whether in this form of symposium or in some other way. But we will do that and I think we cannot and we should not really at this point in time take questions, but we are deeply indebted to you, Jürgen. It was, it was absolutely fascinating and highly relevant for everything else we have said today. So deep, with deep gratefulness. Thank you. Thank you. And for those who feel a desperate urge to add energy and calories, um, you should not feel compelled, but we decided that we should have, given the situation in the world, also a brief report by Professor Stefan Parmentier. This is research that he's conducting together with Rihanna Lechert, the president of Maastricht University and the chairperson of Koara, who regrets deeply, sends out her very best regards, but regrets deeply that she, due to urgent messes, matches with the merger of the medical faculty, or the medical school, university, to the university. She simply cannot be here now. But uh, Professor Stefan Parmentier um, from, the, from Leuven will, is here, and he works at the borderline zone between law, transitional justice, and research and reparation. So the theme of his report is how to repair the irreparable, and it deals with serious violations of human rights. And I think given the situation in the world, it would have been wrong not to have this presentation. So please, Stefan, come forth and give your presentation, and we are very grateful that you're here. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, or actually I should say good afternoon. This is a challenging moment, indeed, because lunch is waiting, and you're waiting for lunch, and yet we're going to start another presentation. What a challenge this is. But I hope to be able to shorten my presentation to such an extent that I will sketch the headlines of it, and leave you with some food for thought, together with the food that will come later. Thank you so much for having me at this plenary meeting. It's a big honor and a big pleasure. So thank you very much. Vielen Dank für diese Einladung. Merci beaucoup pour cette invitation. Muchas gracias por la invitación. I'm going to try to take you on a short excursion to the dark side of society. That is to say, to the dark side of human behavior. Because this is what we talk about when we talk about reparations. And before talking about reparations, we talk about victimization. And this is the core of the talk that I'm bringing indeed together in conjunction and co-authorship with Rian Letchard. We called it repairing the irreparable. And how to do that? Well, it is mostly a troublesome message, 
But on the other hand, I think there is also hope. There is some glimpse of hope at the end of the tunnel. Imagine harm and repair in daily life. I guess most of us have already been encountered with troubles in the household or with the car. And what we normally do is, well, try to repair ourselves. The damage that is uh, in the electrical appliance or somewhere else. Or if we don't manage, we go to a garage or we call a professional salesman and repair shop. And in most of the cases, that will suffice. In fact, the reparation will lead to a, an almost brand new kind of device, an electrical appliance, a car, a house, and so on. It becomes a bit more challenging if, of course, the harm is being inflicted by other people and other circumstances. And the second picture below relates to flooding in my own country, Belgium, where in the summer of 2021, uh, a large flood passed through a specific region in the southern part, creating enormous amounts of damage. This is a natural disaster, one could say, and we will see more of that in relation to climate change to come. So here it becomes a bit more complicated because there's often and obviously victimization, there's obviously also victims, and many of them. Even it becomes more complicated when these victimization, uh, these forms of victimization are man-made, are created by men and women and structures and institutions. And in those cases, it is of course extremely challenging to try to repair or even consider the possibility of repair. So what do we call serious human rights violations? In legal terms, we would be referring to a number of bodies of law, first of all to human rights law, obviously, but then also to humanitarian law. And humanitarian law is the body of law that applies in situations of war. But also criminal law, ordinary criminal law, or criminal law related to situations of war and peace will play a role in this kind of definition of what a serious human rights violation is. And the examples speak for themselves. I think we can easily grasp what we mean by serious violations if we talk about torture, horrendous forms of torture in various parts of the world, today, yesterday, and undoubtedly tomorrow as well. Disappearances of many people who literally are vanished from the face of the earth forms of slavery, sexual slavery, but also sexual violence, forms of killings, and needless to talk about numbers, I think we all understand how large the numbers are in many of the conflicts that we are facing and have been facing over the last couple of decades, if not centuries. And last but not least, genocide. Genocide is a form of killing, of course, but for specific reasons, for belonging to a group a group that is defined on the basis of nationality, ethnicity, race, or religion. In criminological terms, these crimes are also called atrocity crimes. Atrocity in the sense of the, the level and the deep level of atrocity that uh, are associated with the crimes, and obviously because they involve mass numbers of victims, of course, they are relating to mass victimization. Some pictures, endless would be the stream of pictures to describe. The above picture is from Bosnia, Sarajevo to be precise, and the ones below are from Argentina, respectively, where allegedly 30,000 people disappeared in the course of the dictatorship of the 1970s and 80s, and the other one is from Rwanda. Uh, all areas where we ourselves in Leuven and Maastricht have done research in order to understand the sources and the origins of the conflict, the sources and the ramifications of victimization and the ways to deal with those. Because mass victimization is something special. Of course, it relates to numbers, large numbers of direct victims and indirect victims, yes. But on the other hand, it's much broader than this. 
it extends into society and into the societal structures. What is called in transitional justice studies, the social fabric of life, relationships, trust between people uh, and people, and people and institutions. Furthermore, because of the serious nature of the violations committed, there is often a high level of trauma and therefore the need to address uh, post-traumatic stress disorders or symptoms or um, complexes. And to make it very complex, in many of the situations of mass victimization, in fact, perpetrators will be part of the solution. Perpetrators will be part of the new construction of society uh, in economic, political, and legal terms. In fact, it may sometimes be very difficult to make a very strict separation between victims and perpetrators, because the perpetrators of yesterday could be the victims of tomorrow in a form of retaliation, and vice versa. So, as lawyers, both Rianne and I are, in terms of training, we have looked at the legal framework, and the legal framework has evolved enormously in the last couple of decades. I would say that before the um, end of the Second World War, there were, of course, a number of binding legal norms which still exist until today, most domestic legal systems. And those domestic systems do require individuals who have performed and incurred um, harm to repair the harm. That is the case in criminal law, but also in civil law, particularly the area of tort law. However, after the Second World War, a, an enormous body of international law has been developing. As we know, in human rights, this is uh, well known, but also in general international law, in humanitarian law already sketched, and in criminal law. And we see this gradual but steady development between the state's duty to repair the harm that has been uh, damaged, that has been incurred, that has been um, uh, applied in the state, to an individual right of reparation. Now, in legal terms, that makes a large difference because an individual right means that one can claim before a court the right to be repaired. Um, in legal terms, we often make the distinction between binding norms, which are really constraining the behavior of individual actors and courts, and non-binding norms. And non-binding norms are soft norms, but nevertheless, they are often the precursors of later binding norms. In this case, I really have to draw attention to the Van Boven and Bassioni principles, uh, which have been adopted in the context of the United Nations in 2005, and which sketch the scope of reparations. And we don't have the time to go into the details, but please allow me to briefly say, reparations these days, of course, is not only about restitution, restitution of property, restitution of rights, it is also um, a matter of compensation, financial compensation. In the case, the restitution is not possible. Furthermore, the basic principles and guidelines talk about rehabilitation. That is to say, measures to allow individuals to become members of society again through medical support, material support, psychological support. A big category in the guidelines refer to so-called measures of satisfaction. And most people think, well, isn't that symbolic? Symbolic reparations, apologies or name days, or uh, plazas and public spaces called after victims or specific events. Yes, of course, that's part of it, but not only. Also judicial investigations, the right to truth, the right to justice are assumed and as part and parcel of the satisfaction category. And finally, prevention, obviously, because we know how much victimization uh, is having an impact on people's life, lives, and therefore it's important in legal terms to call for guarantees of non-repetition or guarantees of non-recurrence, as it's called. Here you see some pictures of uh, the victims of uh, Chadian dictator Hussein Habre, who are still after many years asking for their financial compensation to be paid out, although he was convicted by several courts 
for uh, being in charge of those violations of human rights, but he never uh, ever came forward. So the question also is, of course, not only what is reparation and how to repair, but also what kind of harm are we talking about? Well, there are various forms of harm, obviously, and we talked uh, partly of that already. Material harm, think of uh, houses, buildings, uh, uh, public spaces. Physical harm incurred to the person, himself, herself, and not to underestimate emotional harm. Human beings are multiple beings. They have multiple needs and multiple um, expectations and also emotional expectations are part and parcel of this particular form of harm during and after conflict. I'm going to try to briefly sketch two cases in which um, we can talk about harm and how to assess harm. And I'll do this under the supervision of our chair, who will be very strict on time. So the first one is one case where I was involved in myself together with a team from Leuven University and the University of Tübingen, where we looked at reparation and restoration, let's say, of society in Bosnia and Serbia. This is a research of about 15 years ago through quantitative means, a quantitative survey with about 850 to 900 respondents. All over Bosnia, we distributed questionnaires to major cities and smaller towns and even villages to understand the level of victimization that people had incurred. And by the way, this is what we call a population-based survey. It's not only addressed to victims, because in such a society, after so many years of war, it would be extremely difficult to be able to single out the victims. Who are the victims? Well, in a certain way, every one of the society is a victim. So we spread it throughout the population and were able to receive a high response rate. Now, I will not bother you with lots of data. We don't have the time for that. But if you look at these, you will immediately see the kinds of harm that people are suffering from. The yellow part is the physical harm that they declare, they report, which could be indeed being beaten up, being put in prison, um, having to flee, um, in the worst case, even being tortured, but still to survive. The blue bars are the ones of uh, material harm in the case of houses, land, property, artifacts being taken away or destroyed. And the, well, purple, I should say, bars are related to emotional harm. And this is really striking because the emotional harm is the highest of all. There's very few studies that actually say the same in the sense that they're not uh, investigating these kind of issues. They're only focusing on material and physical harm and leaving aside the emotional aspects. The second bars of each color relate to the situation after the war. And even after the war, as you can see, there's a lot of harm that can be identified. Now, these are the actual figures. Again, I will not bother you with these, but you should know that it's based on actual research and, and quantitative figures. And I'll just uh, highlight the main conclusions here. If you ask people what would make you feel better about what happened during the war, and in other words, in which way would you think that reparation could take place without naming the word reparation? That's a technical legal word. Well, many of them actually relate to memorials being built for the victims who disappeared, who were killed, who um, were very serious victims of the conflict. Also, truth-telling and truth-seeking. We want to know what happened, after all, not only in our individual cases, but also across society, and not to underestimate the need for acknowledgement want to be recognized as victims of a particular type of crime, or maybe successive numbers of crimes. However, on the negative side, let's say, it's very difficult to have people talk about what happened. It may re-traumatize them, re-victimize them in such a way that even for researchers would not be uh, acceptable to uh, sustain. 
And also the level of forgiveness or the readiness of forgiveness is very low with many of these uh, persons who have been asked to report. In some cases, there is actually a high don't know category, obviously, because these are very, very difficult issues to deal with. And therefore, it could very well be that people need more time to think and to be offered information about several possibilities and categories rather than having to answer on one specific moment. The second question that we address in this presentation is about the mechanisms, or as we call them as well in legal terms, the forms for victim reparations. And here I refer to case study number two, which is the one that uh, Rianne Ledger has been involved in through a large research grant from the Dutch National Agency. Um, this is a VD grant relating to reparations and experiences of justice in international courts and tribunals. And indeed, um, she is looking, or has been looking, at various forms of reparations through judicial uh, mechanisms in what she calls the necessity to look at external and internal forms of coherence. I could, could go at length explaining that, but I won't because of the time. So her research is about experiences of individuals about forms of procedural justice, how were they treated by the courts and the tribunals through which they were involved. And she pays attention uh, to the voice, that is to say, information um, and the possibility to express oneself, interaction with judicial actors, information by judicial actors, and the length of proceedings. Furthermore, she's been looking at uh, substantive justice what really comes out in tangible terms in forms of reparations. In accordance with the preferences of the victims as they have been expressing themselves in the course of the proceedings. And how these experiences of procedural and substantive justice have an impact on their general view, views on justice, on their perceptions of justice. She's been studying four different legal regimes um, courts in Cambodia, in Guatemala, in Cyprus, but here we only deal with one particular instance, which is the International Criminal Court, situated in The Hague, and in relation to crimes committed in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And as you see, this kind of research is not so much quantitative, but more qualitative, because they asked their respondents uh, to um, also draw life histories in which they talk about the ways in which they have been incurring harm over a longer period of time in in-depth interviews as well. There's one specific case uh, of Germain Katanga, who is a person considered to be a warlord in the eastern part of the Congo and who by the ICC, the International Criminal Court, has been uh, sentenced to prison sentence but in the reparation part of the uh, sentence of the, uh, of the judgment, uh, we can see that the vast majority of the applicants could also demonstrate to be victims of the crimes committed in the eastern part of the Congo. And the court awarded individual reparations to the amount of about 250 US dollars. This may strike us as very low, uh, but of course it also relates to the cost of living and the standard of living in particular uh, parts of the world, in this case, in the Eastern Congo. Furthermore, which is interesting, the court also ordered collective reparations, not only individual amounts, which, by the way, sometimes generate new uh, problems when people go back to their communities uh, with a bag of money and others in the community could be seen as to uh, become jealous or uh, can actually <laughs> foment new forms of conflict. Collective reparations are more like, well, collective structures, housing, education, legal services, medical health, and also psychological support, not to underestimate. So the court was doing both types of reparations, which is very important. Here again, there's a lot of empirical data that Rianne Ledger and her team have collected, and they look at uh, procedural justice as an larger indicator of justice in general, 
And for example, the key issue, the key message here is voice. The way in which victims have the impression and have the experience of having been heard, having been able to express their needs, express their experiences, and being informed by the lawyers, by the court personnel, and by everyone involved in this complex and long court procedure. Long because it takes years and years before a person like this is actually sentenced to a prison sentence. So voice and information are key, which also means that um, one has to have a closer look at substantive justice. What do people actually value most in terms of tangible outcomes? Well, they value most that the perpetrators of these most horrendous crimes committed in um, their lifetime are punished. They're punished according to procedural rules, firmly established and predisposed. But also that reparations are taking place, and preferably that reparations are being dispensed by those offenders themselves, by the perpetrators. It's a bit too easy, according to the victims, to ask the state to intervene because the state is only a proxy for the perpetrators themselves. So if perpetrators themselves can offer reparations, symbolic or material or other types of reparations, it is more highly valued than if other bodies, the state or insurance companies, step in. Okay, now to conclude, I'm trying still to be within my time frame, dear Chair, I think we can easily argue that there is a turn and an enormous tendency um, towards reparative justice. Reparative justice for lawyers and criminologists means something else than retributive justice, which is about convicting those who have committed crimes. It's something else than restorative justice, which is still further away, it's restoring relationships. Reparative justice is somewhere in between. It actually allows and calls for reparations of the harm that victims have incurred, particularly after such violent and complex and long-standing conflicts and human rights violations of the ones that we discussed. The legal framework has been developing enormously, particularly after the Second World War. And you will not be surprised that Germany has played an important role in this. So it's very appropriate to talk about these issues here in München today, because Germany has uh, probably set up the largest ever reparation program uh, in relation to the victims of the Holocaust, both in terms of individual uh, compensation and in terms of more general reparations to the State of Israel, uh, including memory structures and the idea of uh, commemorating the past, which is also a symbolic form of reparation, obviously. Now, there are discussions underway in this country, as you may know, about uh, dispensing reparations to the Herero and the Nama peoples of uh, uh, Namibia for the crimes that were committed in those days, in the early 20th century. That is another issue. It's a bit more complicated, also because of the time that has lapsed in the meantime. And of course, legal frameworks, which developed after the Second World War, are not necessarily applicable to the situations before the Second World War, which makes it more difficult also for historical injustices to be repaired in the same way as more recent uh, crimes or violations are re repaired. Think of the colonial past of many European states, to start with my own country, Belgium, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Congo and Rwanda, Burundi, but also, of course, uh, Portugal in, with its colonies and Britain with its colonies and France uh, with the colonial past. So these are very uh, complex issues, but very topical issues, and in the next decades, I'm absolutely convinced that they will gain more, um, more uh, interest and more attention even. It is also really interesting and important to think of assessing the harm and trying to, uh, to, to find appropriate methods to repair. Think of ongoing conflicts as we speak in Israel-Palestine. 
victims are being generated day by day. So harm is being generated. And sooner or later, the question about reparations will come up. Ukraine, same story, but in a different context. Ethiopia and Yemen, some of the conflicts which are under the radar today, but which are very much going on. Uh, and this is just to name a few. So at the end of the day, we conclude through our research that it is extremely difficult to repair the harm that has been inflicted because the harm is too extensive. And medical doctors will tell us what the harm is and economists will tell us what the harm is and psychiatrists and so many disciplines can be involved in assessing harm uh, and also in providing reparations, services, monetary compensation, other forms of uh, reparation. At the end of the day, however, we contend that it is impossible to repair the harm that has been inflicted. It's irreparable. Still, there is hope. The hope lies in asking victims what they want, asking victims what they expect. And with those expectations of needs and of uh, necessities, I think a new chapter can start to begin. But of course, it also means that it's crucial to prevent harm from taking place in the first place. Uh, it's much better to prevent than to curate at the end after all of this has happened. And how do we know? Well, we have to ask the victims and their attitudes, grasp their attitudes toward reparations through a specific form of methodology. So the concluding phrase is this one. Justice, sometimes in the form of criminal justice, has an expressive function, namely that in the eyes of the victimized populations, justice is not only to be done, but also to be seen to be done. These are uh, a, a profound uh, insight from two colleagues from Tilburg University. I'll stick to that. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for encroaching a little bit on your lunchtime, but I hope to have been able to give you some food for thought and happy to continue our discussion over lunch and later on today. Thank you. Well, sincere thanks to all speakers for delivering brilliant lectures, but most of all, sincere apologies to the audience for having the lunch being eaten a bit late. We will reconvene as planned, and um, thank you so much once again. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the life science session of Academia Europea. My name is Eva Kondorosi and I am the chair of Class C, the life sciences. Today we have uh, a little bit of delay in the program, but I have to tell you that there is also some flexibility because unfortunately one of our keynote speaker, uh, Jeff Gordon, did not uh, uh, come to this meeting for uns uh, unforeseen reason, he had to cancel his presentation. So uh, anyway, we are already late. We try to keep the time because then we are going to have the new member presentation and uh, we have to be really in time. Uh, this uh, session uh, is devoted to three prizes. Uh, one of them is the Erasmus Medal presentation, and there will be two uh, prizes which belongs to the Class C. So we are going to start with the Erasmus Medal because this, this is the tradition that all the life science sessions or other uh, sessions, depending who is going to give the Erasmus Medal, start with this presentation. And now I would like to ask uh, Professor uh, Guyash to present the Erasmus Medal because he is the president of the Erasmus Medal uh, Committee. Thank you, Eva. Ladies and gentlemen, the Erasmus Medal is a premier medal of Academia Europea, and since its inception in 1988, Academia Europea bestows the medal 
on a candidate and distinguished scholar every year during the main day of its annual meeting. Allow me to read the quotation from the regulations of the medal. The Erasmus Medal of Academia Europea is awarded to a European scholar who has maintained over a sustained period of time an outstanding level of international scholarship as recognized by peers. It's perhaps the highest recognition for purely scholarly achievements that the academy can bestow on a scholar. The medal is awarded at the annual conference of the academia, and on that occasion, the recipient will give the annual Erasmus lecture. The medal is rotating between the four classes of Academia Europea, and this year, the medal is within the class C, Life Sciences class. The laureate is Professor Jean-Pierre Changeux. Allow me to ask now Professor Ulla Peterson, one of the founding members of our academy and vice president, to deliver his laudation. It's a great uh, honor and, and privilege to be able to say a few words about uh, the Erasmus Medal winner 2023, Professor Jean-Pierre uh, jean uh, Professor jean is one of the most eminent neuroscientists working today globally and has been recognized uh, all over the world. Is a member of virtually every uh, important uh, academy in the world. And uh, we are not exactly the first to, to honor him, but we are delighted that Professor Changer is with us today and will uh, give us considerable insight into a molecule that is of enormous importance uh, for life. As I mentioned, uh, Professor Changer has been receiving award after award uh, over uh, a very no considerable number of years, and it would not be a good uh, use of uh, his time for me to go through all of these awards, but these represent some very serious uh, prizes uh, and awards which testify to the significance of the work that uh, Professor Changer has been engaged in. So we will hear, of course, from Professor Changshu a great deal about a particular molecule, uh, the acetylcholine receptor, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which is an ion channel. And Professor Changshu's work, uh, from a molecular biology point of view, has elucidated important mechanisms whereby we now understand how when the neurotransmitter acetylcholine binds to this protein, conformation changes, and it can move from a low probability of being open to a high probability of being open. As I just mentioned to Professor Changer before the session started, the last time I had the honor of giving a laudatio for an Erasmus lecturer was actually a person who spoke on a theme which was not entirely different from the one we are hearing about today, but from a different point of view. So here at the top of the slide, you have the one of the uh, many versions of jean model, and below that, you have the physiological uh, action of this molecule opening up, and here are the signal channel recordings, and uh, uh, I have known uh, Professor Sackmann, who was the Erasmus lecturer in 2006 in Budapest for many, many years, and uh, obviously been very interested in the physiological perspective. But today we will hear about the molecular uh, perspective and particularly the allosteric actions that will be elucidated in some detail by Professor Changer, I'm sure. In addition to be a top scientist who has made real discoveries which have stood the test of time. 
uh, Professor Jean Jeu also has a remarkable uh, career in producing uh, work that has reached the general public. And here I only got a small selection of the many books that uh, Professor Jean Jeu has authored. And as you see, many of them have been uh, translated uh, from French uh, into English. So this has been a big, big effort also for general education of people and also to generate interest for what is a very significant field. For me personally, it was interesting to see that there was a book made in collaboration with a very great uh, French composer, Pierre Boulez, and there's a kind of personal relationship for me, because my mother was a classical pianist, a pupil of Bela Bartok in Budapest, and spent a lot of her life playing contemporary music, including the famously difficult uh, second piano sonata of Boulez. So I was fascinated that uh, Professor Jean Chou had this uh, interesting collaboration with this very great uh, composer. So I won't uh, steal any more of Professor Jean Chou's time because it's more important that you hear from him about his work than you hear from me about him. So I will call on, uh, on Professor Jean Chou to give his uh, lecture on uh, the allosteric uh, actions of the uh, acetylcholine. Uh, the title of his lecture is The Brain as a Chemical Machine and the Importance of Allosteric Receptors. And I will try to remove this slide if I can and get the other one, but probably I need your uh, help for that. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Peterson. I may say that I'm deeply touched and, and uh, happy as well uh, to receive this uh, prestigious Erasmus Medal. And uh, I want to thank from the start um, Professor uh, Makarov, uh, who is uh, the chair of uh, Academia Europea, and of course, uh, uh, Professor Eva Kondorossi, who is uh, the chair of uh, Class C, and uh, also Professor uh, Goulash, who is here, and uh, the member of the, editorial, uh, the board of trustees of the Academia. Uh, now, the title of uh, my slide is The Brain as a Chemical Machine. And uh, in addition, there is uh, a second statement, importance of allosteric receptors. So for those who don't understand the words, I will try to explain. Now, uh, this uh, uh, gave me the opportunity to mention one sentence, one statement from uh, Erasmus himself, which is, concedo nulli. I will not concede on anything at the time of uh, science. is under heavy criticism. I am not going to concede anything and talk about science. So the, uh, does it work? <laughs> does it, it does not move. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, uh, uh, the title uh, of my presentation is uh, Brain as a Chemical Machine, and I I'll try to convince you that it is indeed a chemical machine. And uh, the work I am going to present uh, was done by several students, colleagues, and friends. And here I am not going to show all of them during the past 40 years, uh, but only a few of them. And, uh, Pierre-Jean Coranger, Marc Delarue, Marco Secchini, Marina Picciotto, Sylvie Granon, uh, Fanny Kukuli, and Claire Sergent. You see that women are not forgotten from the list. Uh, the human brain is a rather um, uh, complex uh, structure. It's the most uh, 
uh, evolved uh, organ of the brain of the body, and uh, you can see here the mini convolution and and the mini uh, uh, specialized cortical areas, uh, which uh, are present in the human brain. So it's a really a complex architecture, and uh, all this is the result of Darwinian evolution. And uh, in fact, during hominization, the size and volume of the brain is increasing, compaction, and the number of cortical areas I just mentioned. Now, the brain is made up of cells. There are neurons and also glial cells. And the neurons are here illustrated on the left of the slide. And this is a pyramidal cell with dendrite coming, coming down and axon coming out. Now, this uh, network has a very important feature. It's a discontinuous network in the sense that uh, uh, the contact between uh, nerve cells are not continuous, but discontinuous. And this is an important characteristic of this network. No electrical communication except on few specialized electrical synapses, but most of it is coming from the release of a neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft and uh, the effect of this neurotransmitter on the receptor present in the postsynaptic domain. Now, the uh, additional uh, complexity of brain architectures come from the number of these neurons which make this network, 78 to 80 billion neurons, and uh, as far as the synaptic contacts which are present, about a million billion, 10 to the 15, synaptic contacts in the cerebral cortex. So it's an extremely complex network with also a complex architecture. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, initially, and uh, Bert Sackman was, uh, of course, involved in it, it was mentioned before, uh, there are electrical signals which uh, uh, circulate on the networks. And uh, sometimes it was thought that the brain was an electrical organ. No, it is, of course, part of it is due to electrical transmission or communication. But most of all, at the synapse, uh, electrical communication does not operate. And then you have, as I said, a neurotransmitter, a chemical substance, and there are a few classical neurotransmitters like acetylcholine, norepinephrine, dopamine, and, uh, and uh, GABA, and also a lot of peptides, about 100 of them. And uh, all these make a, a highly diversified uh, chemical machine where all the communication in these billions of synapses is mediated by chemical. So our brain is a network of connection which all of them, or most of them, are connected through chemistry. Now, the uh, issue, of course, is uh, where are these uh, neurotransmitters acting? And uh, from uh, the beginning of the 20th century, there was a proposal made uh, essentially by John Newport, an Anglais, where he used uh, folds, which were, as you see on the left, anesthetized, and then uh, beans wake up, if I may say, after injection of nicotine. So he concluded from these experiments that there is uh, some kind of sub substance which combines with nicotine, curare, or anesthetized, and uh, is, this uh, substance is not identical with the substance which contracts. So there is a specific receptive substance which is uh, recognizing the neurotransmitter 
and localized under the nerve terminals. So the question is uh, how the receptor mediates the response. At that time, proteins were not that known, and it took more than 70 years to identify, or about 70 years, to identify uh, the protein involved. So, first of all, receptors are essential for neurotransmission throughout the whole brain. And the second aspect concerns drug design. And a very uh, simple way of looking at designing drugs, like Curare, for instance, is um, to uh, have a competition with a single binding site, which normally bind the neurotransmitter. So this is, uh, as you see on the left, a simple way of uh, designing drugs, which are referred to as competitive uh, active drugs on receptors. You have two famous examples here, uh, that Daniel Bové, uh, Flaxidil, which is an antagonist of acetylcholine and block nicotine action. And, and here, propranolol, designed by James Black as a first competitive blocker of beta adrenergic receptor. Then things have changed. And they have changed from two reasons. First, a concept of allosteric interaction and allosteric drug design and the identification, uh, the biochemical identification of receptors. So the uh, concept of uh, allosteric interaction is uh, uh, issued from uh, molecular biology of uh, regulation in bacteria. Uh, it is some kind of uh, way to understand the cybernetic of uh, metabolic signals in the bacteria. And on the left side, you can see a uh, pathway, the biosynthetic pathway of uh, isolacin from threonine, uh, which is uh, starting by the first enzyme called threonine deaminase. And um, just illustrated by this yellow arrow, you can see that there is a feedback uh, from the end product on this first regulatory enzyme. And um, I was uh, starting my PhD thesis in the laboratory of Jacques Monod at the time at the Institut Pasteur. And I was uh, very much interested by trying to solve the issue of uh, how do uh, isolacin inhibit uh, the first enzyme, threonine deaminase, even though it cannot be taken as a competitive inhibitor. And the first thing uh, I did, and this was also done by Gerhard and Pardi, was to try to uh, remove the regulatory action by isolation and keep the enzyme activity. This is illustrated on this slide. You can see that after heating at a rather high temperature, you have a disconnection which is taking place between the isolation site and the uh, catalytic site of the enzyme. Now, in the paper I gave at uh, Cold Spring Harbor in 61, and uh, Jacques Monod said, you should sign it by yourself. This is your responsibility. And I did. And uh, I proposed two models. One, the first model, one here, is uh, uh, the typical competitive uh, mode of drug design and uh, two overlapping sites. And the second model I suggested was model two, uh, postulate two different binding sites, one for the substrate, the other for the regulatory signal. And uh, this was further discussed by Jacques Monod and François Jacob in the discussion of uh, the Spring Harbor meeting and uh, discussing the work I had presented, they coined the word 
allosteric, which means that the two sites have different stereospecificity. So the idea is that we have a protein topographically distinct site and that the uh, reciprocal effect of binding of lag onto the site is mediated by a conformational change. And I will try to illustrate these aspects very soon. Now, at the end of my uh, PhD thesis, several aspects uh, of the uh, enzyme dynamics of uh, training deaminase uh, were presented. And uh, then uh, uh, Jacques Monod became uh, uh, very interested in uh, the work. And I uh, decided to, for the conclusion of my thesis, to present a model, which was actually published with uh, Jeffrey Weiman in 1965, where to uh, account for the cooperative interaction that we have, like in the case of hemoglobin for oxygen, then we postulate that uh, these uh, uh, allosteric proteins are oligomers, they are made up of uh, subunits here too, and then they can pre-exist to ligand binding under states which are either relaxed and active or tense and inactive. Uh, one bind the antagonist, the activator, the other the inhibitors, and uh, the sites are located and positioned from the uh, site where the substrate does bind. So this is, uh, if I may say, some kind of molecular switch, and uh, this uh, was for us a minimal model of signal transduction by selection, not instruction, like Lamarck, selection, like Darwin, of pre-existing conformation. So we have some kind of uh, lock which is already present and can be switched on and off. So this uh, was, uh, of course, what uh, led me, and I propose that in my uh, thesis uh, discussion, I took the liberty to say uh, what is true for uh, 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 bacterial enzyme is also true for the communication in the brain. So I made this statement in a rather uh, uh, unexpected way, but it went through, and Jacques Monod accepted that I leave my, this statement on my thesis work. So that's what the main uh, argument for me to continue uh, on the brain, and in particular on receptors. As I said before, they were not identified since 1905. And uh, the way we use to identify the receptor for acetylcholine was to use an uh, electric organ from fish, which is extremely rich in a cholinergic synapse, and uh, to use a highly specific uh, target, ligand, which is a snake venom toxin. So combining the electric organ, which is very rich in one category of receptor, which is the muscular receptor, and toxin, the uh, nicotinic receptor was isolated, purified, and you see here the first picture on the left, lower left, uh, that was presented of uh, any kind of receptor uh, identified up to now as this uh, kind of do-nut with a uh, dark side. And you see here the uh, organization of the postsynaptic membrane when you see a broad collection, uh, a pseudo-crystalline collection of this uh, receptor, which look already as having several subunits, five subunits. So this was... Uh, if I may say again, the first presentation uh, of uh, any picture of a receptor uh, ever identified. So uh, further work done uh, with uh, Ferdinand Huchot from Germany, by Carlin in the United States, and Raftery also in the United States, was shown that this muscle receptor is uh, heteropentamer, of 300 kilo Dalton to alpha 1, beta 1, gamma 1, delta. And uh, the full amino acid sequence 
was uh, subsequently identified from uh, the first 20 amino acid sequence that we did with Anne de Villers Thierry. And uh, then the group of uh, Numa, Heinemann, and ourselves have uh, worked on the full amino acid sequence, which, as you can see, uh, is uh, composed of a, a synaptic domain, which carries the active side, a transmembrane domain where there is an ion channel, and a cytoplasmic domain. So this uh, kind of uh, theoretical model inspired by the amino acid sequence, uh, some further work on the ultrastructure of the receptor uh, was done by several groups, including Unwin One. And here you can see the interesting outcome of uh, this electron microscopic structure. The two acetylcholine binding sites, which are visualized there, are far distant, 40 angstrom distance. And uh, these sites are also distant from uh, the um, channel, which is here shown in green. And uh, the distance is uh, uh, about uh, 60 angstrom, which is very large. And thus, this is the first simple evidence. There were all the other ones, of course, that um, the nicotinic receptor is an allosteric protein, as uh, was shown before. So there is uh, here a new era of uh, molecular biology of the brain, which is a molecular biology of receptors, which has been continued by many colleagues and friends. Now, in our case, we wanted absolutely to have the X-ray structure of uh, the nicotinic receptor from the uh, fish electric organ. And uh, we tried, and it did not work. One day, I was asked to be the referee, so always ask, answer positively to referee here. Uh, I uh, uh, had uh, to referee a paper by Tasnim et al where they found some uh, sequences in bacteria, again bacteria, which resemble the nicotinic receptor, and as you can see here on the left. So you have on the very left uh, some uh, eukaryotic members, and on the, on the right, some prokaryotic members. When I saw that, I immediately asked uh, Pierre-Jean Coranger in my lab if he was interested to try to isolate this receptor. And uh, I may say that uh, having accepted the paper that has been, we started to work on uh, the receptor from uh, bacteria. And uh, uh, we were able actually to demonstrate uh, a physiological response on the receptor from Gloeobacter violaceus, which is a proton gated ion channel, and record the Sackman uh, single channels, as you can see here. Uh, now, from the sequence of this receptor, we uh, propose that, uh, in fact, and this was also the aim of Tasmin, that uh, the bacterial receptors would phylogenetically be at the origin of uh, the nicotinic receptor family in the brain. So we have in our brain uh, receptors which are highly similar to the uh, uh, receptor from bacteria. On top, uh, Elik and Glick. Glick is the one we uh, identified the structure and also in parallel Elik, the work of uh, Ilfan Dutler. And then the uh, group of hips further identified other receptors like uh, Glucel from uh, uh, worm, GABA from humans, uh, glycine receptor from fish, uh, 5-HC3 receptor, and uh, several species of the nicotinic receptor, like as you see alpha-4, beta-2, and alpha-7, both of them being receptors present in our brain. So, uh, they all have a highly similar 3D structure, and uh, 
this is, as I said, a new era, and indeed, uh, following the nicotinic receptor, uh, several categories of receptor families were identified, GPCR, TKLs, TRPV, and so on and so forth. So this is, uh, again, an uh, important outcome of uh, these studies with fish electric organ, which led to brain receptors. So if it is an allosteric protein, then the active site and the ion channel will make an allosteric interaction, and uh, one should be able to identify the conformation transition between the resting and channel open state. And uh, here we use uh, two techniques, thanks to uh, the group of Marc Delarue and uh, the work of Marco Secchini. With Marc Delarue, we did the X-ray structure, and you can see that there is a, a transition from uh, close to open, and there are change within the uh, quaternary organization of the molecule of twist and, and uh, bloom. And uh, here, uh, you can see that uh, this uh, can be the case uh, using molecular dynamics, and uh, which is to have a computerized description of uh, the receptor from its atomic structure and confirm uh, this uh, transition. Uh, and uh, therefore, we think we have access now, and of course, further studies are being done on the uh, transition uh, of the receptor in a few microsecond time scale, uh, which is consistent with the uh, model, which I refer to as mono y man And uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, important uh, observation, because uh, it shows that uh, there is a bottom-up uh, effect of this transition, as in the case of the ion channel on axons, which is that uh, uh, these uh, transitions in our brain uh, are uh, under the control of the allosteric transition of the neurotransmitter receptor, so the brain as a chemical machine, and uh, that uh, the, there is a bottom-up effect of this transition on the actual function of our brain. And, um, okay, thank you. And this is uh, uh, why we uh, just say uh, why the human brain is so slow. Now I come to another issue, which is uh, very important for drug design. I talked about uh, uh, competitive drug design, and this work opened to another way of uh, designing drugs, which is the observation that you see on the right of the, the neurotransmitter, that there are sites, in addition to the neurotransmitter site and the ion channel, which modulate the transition I just mentioned before. And uh, these sites are located either in the uh, outside synaptic domain, transmembrane domain, and even cytoplasmic domain. So we have, uh, if I may say, a new pharmacology uh, from uh, sites, different from uh, orthosteric sites, which have the advantage of being uh, free from interference with actual brain signaling, since these sites uh, are absolutely uh, structurally different from the neurotransmitter binding site. So one of the drugs that we have studied as a positive allosteric modulator of alpha-7 is ivermectin. And you can see here uh, how uh, efficient is uh, ivermectin in enhancing the response of human alpha-7 receptor and uh, by tens or even more fold. And also to show that uh, when there are mutations in the transmembrane domain, then there are uh, uh, interference 
with the effects of uh, ivermectin. And uh, the group of Ips and Guo identified the site at the atomic resolution of ivermectin, and you see it in yellow, and this site is in the transmembrane domain in between alpha helices, which compose this transmembrane domain. So there is, a, for uh, this receptor, a new category of site, a new site for drug design, which is different from the orthospheric site and from the ion channel. Now, just to illustrate the importance of this uh, new pharmacology, recently, Eva Kaftor uh, was identified as a positive allosteric modulator of uh, uh, CFTR protein, and this is uh, one of the key components of cystic fibrosis tree therapy. You can see the site uh, in pink on the uh, lower left. And uh, a recent uh, work done uh, uh, by Kobilka and colleagues uh, for an allosteric site modulation of the mu opioid receptor, which may be very important to inhibit morphine antiception and minimize the withdrawal signs. These are only two examples uh, for, uh, uh, I am ready to finish now, uh, since uh, uh, there are uh, quite a number of uh, marketed allosteric medicines, I call them. 91 allosteric modulators are available on clinic. And uh, in addition, there are many conformation-specific monoclonal antibodies which are efficient against cancer and other uh, receptors on T cells and uh, are therefore very important from a therapeutic point of view. So this is uh, clearly uh, a new pharmacology which came up. Now, since I am late, I will just uh, uh, go briefly uh, until the last slide. I was expecting to talk about nicotine as a drug of abuse and the identification of the receptors which are involved in the nicotinic receptor present on the uh, ventral tegmental area which release dopamine. So you can see that one can uh, build circuits uh, where this new pharmacology can be used. And last but not least, to Cases of uh, schizophrenia where uh, nicotinic receptors are known to increase the risk. Uh, and uh, there is a, a way uh, to show that uh, these receptors are present on inhibitory neurons, which themselves control the pyramidal cell activity and the conscious processing. So I am not going to discuss all that, but just to illustrate that uh, uh, this uh, allosteric drug design and the allosteric properties of the receptor may have important consequences on brain disease. Now, in conclusion, I will again speak about a new world of receptors where there is a receptor diversity uh, and, uh, of course, brain disease. And there is a new pharmacology which is... Uh, uh, to design drug, uh, again, allosteric sites, and there, further design drugs which are characteristic of some of the multiple conformational states that these uh, receptors are undergoing. And uh, there is a possibility now to design agonists from antagonists, from diseases. So, as I said, there is a a new pharmacology going on. And uh, just to pay tribute to Erasmus, uh, which I found the founding father of European humanism and century editor of Academia Europea. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. It is really remarkable how this allosteric concept has developed. And we had this fantastic comprehensive review, all from bacterial original channels up to the modern day neuropharmacology. Uh, very impressive indeed. Thank you so much. So thank you very much, and we continue. The next speaker will be Professor Dirk Inzi. Dirk is a global leader in plant biology. His research ambition is to obtain a holistic understanding of molecular network regulating plant organ and crop productivity. His work has opened up new perspectives for providing food security for the growing bird population in changing climate. He became a professor at Kent University, and he was a scientific founder of the biotechnology company Crop Design. In 2002, Dirk was appointed uh, director of the Center for Plant System Biology at the VIB. So, his, the title, are you here? <laughs> the title of his talk, Gene Editing Crops are now a real, real, reality, but not in Europe. So this is a challenging future. Seems to be difficult to get rid of uh, receptors. <laughs> <laughs> which, which one is it? Which one? Which is one? It's Inse. Uh, Dirk Inse. Uh, you loaded. You, you put it on this picture. Do you see me in this picture? Yeah. Okay. I hope you put it. It's good. Okay. Uh, th thank you very much, like Eva, for this very kind words, and again. We will change uh, gears like now, and I can, um, I'm going to talk about gene editing. It's, um, it's a field of research which interests me very much, and it's somewhat related to the research I'm doing myself, but I'm more going to, to, to give you my views like, on uh, how, uh, in fact, um, policy can influence um, uh, our impact like, on society. So uh, I changed my title a little bit, and um, instead of gene editing crops are now a reality, but not in Europe, I added uh, the yet uh, here, uh, because I think in the last uh, months, we have seen uh, quite some changes, uh, like which uh, um, I would say are, uh, look rather promising that we will also finally have a legislation in Europe that allows uh, to use for this uh, new technology. So um, as an introduction, I, I would like to remind you that almost everything what we eat is the result of plant breeding. And um, you see here a number of pictures, and like in fact, um, um, uh, for example, something like a broccoli like, or a, a cauliflower does not exist actually in nature. It's, it is a kind of brassica species. Um, corn developed and from a Mexican plant, uh, it's called teosint, but you see also banana, for example, and like, and, uh, in these plants, you would not eat on them, I think. Same for carrots and so on, and they can give you thousands of examples. And so what actually is uh, plant breeding is, uh, is doing is look for alterations in the, in the genome, in the genetic uh, 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 code like, of the plants. And many of the traits are like, determined by relatively simple, uh, simple genes, like, in fact. And, and you're all familiar, like, in fact, with uh, the the founding work of Gregory Mendel and Quentin Michaud on that, for example, number of characteristics 
here shown and like were uh, determined by genetic determinants without knowing what the chemical nature of these uh, changes like were. Like in fact, this had an immense like, impact like, on uh, plant like, breeding, like, obviously. Like, and, um, there are many examples, again, only two, uh, just to, to set the mind. Like, is, um, you see on the left side is um, uh, maize, like, in fact, uh, let's say an old varieties which were branched. In fact, like, and, and the new varieties, which you all know, which have a monostock, like, and, um, and that is just because uh, single genes have been modified, like, in fact. And, like, and, and I think uh, most of you will be familiar also with um, Norman Borloch's uh, work, which made new wheat varieties, which are reduced in size, like, which were much more resi resistant to wind, have a much better harvest in index. And it is estimated that that saved at least uh, like half a billion like, of people for, from starvation. The man got also for this uh, Nobel Prize. However, uh, in many characteristics which are uh, interesting for breeders are much more complicated. And that um, we, um, we see um, uh, that they are complex, they are determined uh, like by multiple genes, what we call polygenics. Um, they are very much influenced by the environment. Uh, there is an also continuous range like in, uh, in phenotypes, like in fact, uh, so it's also determined by the genetic background as such, like in fact. And as you can imagine, like in fact, they are much more tedious uh, to breed for. Uh, the classical examples, many uh, yield-related telecomponents, uh, things like grain weight, uh, tolerance to drought, which is now really becoming very relevant in view like, of um, climate uh, change. So this, uh, for, on these traits, we have been working myself like, a lot and uh, only showed two slides, like, in fact, to, to illustrate. Uh, so the question that interests me is uh, what determines uh, size in organisms? And uh, it's, um, that looks like a simple question, like, in fact, but if you think about it, what it determines the size like, of a leaf, like, and what are the mechanisms behind all that? And we have been working on that on both in maize uh, and on a model plant, uh, Arabidopsis, the white mouse like, of a plant biologist. And, and just to give you an idea, like in fact, um, our work, and of course, in, in concert with work from many colleagues, some of them will be here present like here, um, have showed that there is a really a complex uh, machinery uh, which are uh, really controlling this growth. Essentially, the number which controlling the number of cells and the expansion of cells, the growth of these cells in a developmental uh, context. And again, so these are examples. I mean, if you want to really breed like for uh, for these complex traits, like I mean, I can tell you, and I will come back to that, that we have now a huge amount of information how these uh, systems are like work and like, in fact and that this information stream is really uh, becoming even much more greater with a uh, huge amount of single cell technologies, uh, spatial transcriptomics, and the ability to sequence uh, plant genomes at a never uh, anticipated kind of speed. Now, I just told you that breeding uh, relies uh, on genetic variation. And it, uh, of course, you're all familiar with that. Um, this, uh, there are, we are continuously exposed uh, like, to radiation like here and, and other sources and which, uh, which makes that there are once in a while mutations in, like in, in the genomes of organisms. And you actually, um, and spontaneous mutations were for a very long time the only source of like variation. And that, uh, you see two examples what you could maybe, if you're lucky, can find in your garden and like even. So this, um, uh, this was changed in the last uh, century and people start to realize that certain mutagens, like EMS, and again, um, but also radiation could increase uh, the frequency of mutations. And, and there were uh, big installations, like this one shown uh, like here, uh, made, uh, where people put a very strong radioactive source in the middle, and uh, like, in fact, uh, like, and you grow plants uh, like really uh, around that, and you look for changes uh, like, uh, in phenotype. And um, you might think oh, that this, this, of course, is a very random uh, approach. Uh, like, and, but um, just to illustrate the importance of that, and that's maybe not known to all of you, and like, this, there are currently, because there are more than 3,300 uh, plants, crops, like, in fact, like, and many, also many uh, ornamental crops, like, in fact, like, and which are on the market, which have been obtained by this mutation breeding, by the use of mutagens or by the use of irradiation. And in fact, um, 
there is a, a, a database here uh, which where you can follow all these things and like here for um, and uh, in, in, in total more than 210 plant species have been modified and I can tell you there would be in for like things like durum wheat, things like barley, like, which will make beer like of, and whiskey, like, but they would not have been in the current form without this technology. So, so this is um, this technology we call um, still conventional uh, breeding. It's so it's possible to use this technology, still used by breeding kind of companies, and like, in fact, um, in the technologies called uh, tilling. But as you can realize, it's uh, random. It's not targeting. You just bombard these plants like with, uh, with radiation, and you get numerous cell mutations, and then you look for something which is uh, useful. So in, um, in, in fact, um, uh, if you analyze that, you can conclude uh, that although it has been benef very beneficial for mankind, that it requires a huge amount of time. I mean, on average, like it's seven to 25 years, and in some cases, even 50 years, before you can make a new variety, bring it on the market. The reason really is becoming, and that's really a problem by itself, like in fact, because there are urgent needs, for example, to make crops which are more adapted uh, to climate change. It's non-targeted, so it's based by coincidence, and it's really like, in, like searching in a needle in a haystack. It's also not applicable to uh, quite a number of plants. Quite a number of plants are vegetatively propagated. I think, for example, about wine. If you have a Sangiovese uh, uh, variety and you start to breed it with that, you get another type of plant with another chemical composition. So it's not longer anymore Sangiovese. And it's often difficult to separate positive and negative on the traits. And for example, and, and what many people are often doing, they look for wild species. Like, for example, potato is subject to a very uh, uh, devastating disease, Phytophthora. One looks for wild species like where there is uh, some resistance, and you cross it and you try to bring in the resistant genes in the commercial varieties. But what turns out, there is a gene just next to the, the, the resistance cell genes, which really reduces the quality and the quantity uh, like of yields, and it's very difficult to separate that. And it requires a vast amount of, a vast, a vast amount of investments uh, despite the use of molecular markers. So in the, in the 80s, uh, like last century, an, another technology was uh, developed, and that's all, all very well known to use, called um, genetic mod modification, where actually with uh, using a natural occurring uh, gene transfer system, an agrobacterium, it was possible to transfer DNA genes from uh, one organism, uh, like in fact, uh, from the bacteria to the plants where it was uh, built in. And you could actually use all kinds of uh, genes, uh, like also from other organisms, so non-plant -like organisms. So we call, so as you all know, like in fact, um, this is still um, virtually forbidden like to, to cultivate these plants like in uh, Europe, with the exception like, of some areas in uh, uh, Spain and like Portugal. Nevertheless, um, Europe is imported, importing huge amounts like, of GMO uh, maize and uh, soybean. And it's, I do not exaggerate by telling you that um, we uh, Europeans are partly responsible for the deforestation uh, like of the Amazon forest because uh, we import all this produce from there. So it's a kind of really, it's a kind of strange uh, thing that we cannot grow these things in, in Europe like ourselves. So well, on the worldwide level, um, they are now cumulative since the first commercial release in 1996. 2.7 billion hectares of uh, GMO crops have been grown, and like, in fact, in many areas of the world, except like Europe and, um, and Russia, and also remarkable, also not in Japan. At the, notice that it's Japan is also colored here orange. So there are areas where it is not allowed to grow well in them. And I can I come back to that because um, in, it's an in, in interesting view of gene editing. And there are a number of limited um, applications on the market, but for example, like in soybean, Currently, something like 75% of all soybeans or GMO for the corn worldwide, that is more and more than uh, 50%. And again. Now, um, in, um, in actually, in 2012, a new technology appeared, and that is called gene editing. And that's, in fact, uh, again, without going into any technical detail, this is an, a system, like, in fact, where an enzyme which you bring into plants 
makes a certain nick at a predetermined position. You, we can determine exactly the position where it's going to happen. And there, and in fact, that, is, uh, that place has been repaired. And there are many variants of that. And again, uh, that creates genetic variation in the place, the predetermined place. In the end product, the end product of the, the modified, um, in this case, tomato, they will can contain a modification, but there is no foreign DNA anymore present in contrast to uh, what you do uh, with uh, GMOs. So the first publication where we sh people showed that we could use it, actually it's a system from bacterial origin, we could use that system and like, in fact into other organisms was in 2012 and um, so only in a little bit more than 10 years ago and, and it is, I can just tell you it's an extremely precise technology which in fact is also very efficient which reduces the time of breeding with uh, uh, approximately uh, threefold. It's cheap and easy, and they, uh, the improved variants cannot be distinguished uh, by uh, variation obtained by conventional breeding. In fact, they can be distinguished because there are less modifications, so they're much more precise. I come back to that. There's no DNA from unrelated species, and it uh, can rely, as I already showed you, um, and there are many other examples, on an overwhelming knowledge of plant genes and genomes, and like, in fact, that we know exactly which genes uh, to target. And then, and for this, um, very rapid for the Nobel Prize Committee, the two ladies, in Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, received already in 2020 the Nobel Prize because not only important for crop improvement, but also important for restoring uh, a, a, a certain status and again, um, in human diseases. And again. Now, um, in fact, uh, people sometimes ask me how, how uh, how, was, how strong is this technology? Like, can, we, can you make a comparison? Well, this is an attempt to do that. In fact, um, you could say that the old technology of breeding is, uh, is like uh, driving in, like in Munich, like here with, uh, with a map and, uh, and trying to find your way like in this complex street systems. And, like, and, and I think the, the CRISPR-Cas, uh, the gene editing, is like a, a GPS. It brings you exactly to the place where you have been. And, like, it's much more efficient and is truly a game changer. And, I mean, there are, there are many, many, many variants on, of that now, which we'll not we'll discuss on again. So I would like to, to really to um, step back now and uh, really consider uh, technologies without an, an, any preconceived idea, like in, like in fact. And I'm going to ask you, which technology would you trust more if you would use for plant breeding? So this is conventional breeding. You see in green two plant varieties. Right? That's uh, light green and, and, uh, and dark green, you have to cross all that, and the outcome is this mix of the two genomes. That's what actually happens. It's very well documented in many, many cases. So you mix everything and, can you, and you hope to find actually something which is uh, useful. The second approach is the conventional random mutagenesis, irradiation of crops, and there you really can see actually, but you, it's just random, you have to, to generate a lot of mutations, and, like, and, and it's very difficult to get rid of that, those are like in further breeding programs. And the third one is the transgenesis, the GMOs, like, like you all know, where you really introduce specific pieces of DNA in the genome. And uh, the uh, fourth one, gene editing, where you target very specifically and as a gene, and you make a modification in this particular gene. I think if you would be um, not uh, biased by, uh, by, by previous knowledge, I think most people would choose uh, for the gene editing solution to really modify uh, crops. And that is also what's up, what we see in the literature. And um, in an organization, I will show you one slide later, uh, EUSH, we maintain a database where we um, we looked for all peer review publication on gene editing and crops. So remember, the first publication was only in 2012. And now we're ready to, uh, almost 800 peer review papers in more than 70 different species with a very high diversity of applications for the benefit of producers and again, consumers. And uh, without, I mean, we could talk many, many hours about that. But Many of these applications are really for improved food and feed quality, of course, for yield, for stress resistance, for biotic stress resistance, that means resistance to pathogens, and so on. And so um, we can find and we can really refine these searches in the database. 
So there are enormous amount of uh, benefits that one can foresee uh, with using this technology. For example, it's uh, been shown that it is possible to make pathogen and pest resistant varieties, which of course uh, uh, leads to less production of pesticides, improved nutritional quality for a higher, healthier food. That I can uh, protein crops for Europe, important, we already said, we import everything, and in fact, like from, uh, from nearly from North and, and South America, and uh, as alternative protein sources for our population. Improved uptake of nutrients and such as nitrogen for biodiversity, less fertilizers, resilience to drought and high temperatures, of course, for food safety, uh, climate resilience, uh, high, higher yields, I mean, uh, if you can produce the same amount of food in a sustainable manner in a certain area, you can maybe start to uh, think of renaturing reforestation and also uh, the development of alternative energy sources and particularly sources of, of carbon. In fact, for chemistry, of course, that should be done uh, not in competition with uh, food production. There are many, many examples and like, fantastic uh, findings. Um, here, only two on uh, disease resistance. Uh, this in the left side, you see wheat, the control, which has been attacked by a fungi. Like you see the brown uh, color, it reduces very much of the yield. And by really targeting the susceptibility gene, so a gene which in the, in the genome of wheat, which makes plants less sensitive to uh, this infection, you get resistant to the varieties, and the same in stone and tomato. Personally, I also think that the whole um, gene editing will play an important role in, in our fight uh, against climate, not only in adapting to climate change by making climate resilient crops, but maybe also by mitigating climate change, by making plants, and again, there are huge research programs are underway, which much better, better capture uh, CO2, which um, produce more CO2 back into the soil. It's what is called regenerative, regenerative agriculture. We need to develop protein crops so that we can actually maybe reduce our meat consumption. And uh, that also there is a lot of things to be done. And also another actually uh, greenhouse gas, nitrous oxide, and like in fact, which is a, a side product, both like from organic and unorganic fertilizers. Maybe we can uh, make, well, people can make plants and we'll hear more about that later which are better in the uptake of nitrogen and uh, thereby maybe also um, have less problems with the release like, of this uh, very strong, powerful greenhouse gas. So the fact that uh, so many applications like, are uh, already on in the horizon, at least in the scientific literature, and there will be much more in the patent like, literature, uh, made that the world is embracing this technology. And uh, here you see, um, that uh, those countries in this kind of um, greenish, uh, like a greenish blue thing, like is uh, where there's already legislation in place. That means the, the vast majority of um, South America, also North America, uh, China, India, Australia, and in many other countries, the legislation being discussed. And like in fact, and like, and you see also remarkable that in Japan, you remember Japan was very much following Europe in terms of GMO that Japan also colors uh, like their um, uh, this green, uh, green, blue, like in fact. And uh, in fact, uh, Japan was the first uh, country to commercialize, in fact, uh, the, and genome editing uh, crops. In fact, there are several now on the market, different plants. It's quite interesting because um, this was not timed, but this, um, this uh, plant actually produces a natural curing uh, neuro a neurotransmitter, which was discussed actually in the previous lecture, in fact. And it's, um, it's uh, because you make more of this GABA, this GABA alpha butyric acid, uh, and, uh, and gamma amino butyric acid, you get a lower blood pressure. And that is currently on the market and it's very popular, apparently, like in Japan. So, uh, what is the situation in Europe? Well, um, unfortunately, in fact, in 2018, already the um, the uh, European Court of Justice ruled that CRISPR crops are GMO, which makes it de facto impossible to grow uh, plants like here. Um, even when you have one nucleotide changed, you know, when the genome of an, a maize plant has something like three billion nucleotides, if you make one change, it cannot be grown. If you make one change with CRISPR, it cannot be grown here. If you make 
10,000 changes by chemical mutagenesis, no problem. But just, it's just to, to clarify how uh, this is, um, how strange this uh, ruling can like, was. Like, it's not based upon science, it's based upon the legal consideration that's um, a dragon like, over legislation. Like, in fact, we have like, in Europe. And that created a local problem. Like, fortunately, um, many, many organizations, scientists, but also academies, like many academies, also professional organizations, uh, also farmer organizations were really very much opposing this uh, ruling. And um, uh, as a result, in fact, uh, because you cannot go in a, in appeal in, for the European Court of Justice. So you have to start the procedure, in fact, uh, that uh, to, to overrule this decision, but that can only be approved uh, by the European Parliament. So fortunately, fortunately, the EU Commission, in fact, um, realized the importance of gene editing for food security and sustainability. And after um, a consultation with many stakeholders, they started a, a legal initiative to bring this um, legislation back to the Euro European uh, Parliament. So this is now uh, an ongoing kind of process. And like, in fact, uh, there's also a lot of consultations uh, from all kinds of state stakeholders you can imagine. And this resulted, in fact, uh, this year in uh, July. There is a proposal being published uh, like on the regulation for the, uh, for, uh, of the European Parliament of um, so-called new breeding technologies, so CRISPR and gene editing is all uh, called like that. And in fact, uh, this uh, legislation is, um, is a kind of mixed uh, bag. Like in fact, um, the classical GMOs remain uh, GMOs here in the, the right. And of course, the conventional uh, breeding, that means also mutagenesis breeding, remains conventional. But then the gene editing application was split into two parts. Um, uh, one part will be considered as conventional, the so-called category, new breeding, new genetic technique plants, uh, NGTs. And the other category is, uh, is a kind of um, considered as a kind of GMO, GMO but a kind of light version of that's really complicated and can and there are um, uh, a number of um, characteristics which distinguish these two categories. For example, in category one, the number of gene edits, the changes in the genome should not be more than 20. You cannot insert uh, pieces of DNA with more than 20 nucleotide base pairs. And so uh, and if you have more, then you go to category uh, two. This is, this is quite restrictive because many interesting applications which already shown like here require more than uh, 20 gene edits. And one example is here is in fact um, uh, wheat with a lower gluten content was developed in fact like in, uh, in Spain. And wheat is an exploit plant. That means uh, for every gene there are six copies. And there are many genes which are called uh, for this gluten. Uh, that's, um, and uh, it was shown that you need 32 edits to lower the gluten content so that you have less problems like when eating it. So without uh, going into any detail, uh, we have now faced with a uh, legislation where we're going to have a conventional um, breeding products which just require variety uh, uh, testing. There will be a category one gene editing plants which will require variety testing always and, like, and, um, and uh, it needs to be registered there has to be a labeling on the seed back and uh, no use in organic uh, agriculture. This is something where I personally have a lot of problems like with because, in fact, uh, uh, with this gene uh, editing technology, we can make pest resistant plants, we can actually disease resistant plants, and we can really strongly uh, reduce and, in fact, the use of things like copper sulfate, which are being used in organic farming. Like, and, it could be very complementary with organic farming, but that's another discussion. And then you have a category two uh, NGTs, like which um, uh, they need a kind of light pre-market risk assessment. It depends on the trade, so it's really complicated legislation. There has to be uh, like a GMO traceability and labeling throughout the whole chain, which really is going to be very difficult. Again, uh, uh, no use in organic uh, agriculture. And, and there is, but there will be no cultivation opt-out. That means uh, once that product has been declared uh, uh, safe for use, it will be, can be used all over uh, Europe. And then we have the classical GMOs, which is, uh, still uh, will be virtually impossible to grow uh, in uh, Europe. So why this uh, new legislation I'm nearly uh, to, to the end? It's, um, it could create at least a regulatory environment that allows, uh, allows for some um, use of some 
um, to some extent, gene editing for crop improvement, and again, which is really important, I think. It also creates a regulatory, uh, regulatory environment that is more in line with the legislation in other parts of the world, which is really important because um, uh, we, otherwise there would be really big problems like with the trade because now every GMO uh, crop, which comes new variety, which goes, goes to, comes into Europe, has to undergo like a, a very lengthy uh, legislation procedure, testing and all these things, and that would be really a disaster. Of course, like it, um, it allows a wider diversity of genome editing crops. I think um, it, there are many, many uh, cases where we can use to improve local varieties like and so on and the European farmers would be more on the technological um, uh, uh, level playing field uh, using this technology. So what's happening now? Um, we uh, now this uh, proposal, in fact, by the uh, EU uh, uh, Commission will have to be discussed by the Council of the EU, which essentially is the Council of Agri Ministers in Agri Agriculture. It has to go to the European Parliament, where there are two committees, so-called the Agri Committee, which deals with agriculture, and the Envy Committee, which have to collect like, all, um, all this information, all these uh, suggestions for improvement, like, and, and so on and so on. They have to bring this back into reports, the reports going back to the Council and to the Commission. And all this, uh, this will be brought together uh, in a kind of proposal for the European Parliament, we hope, in uh, April uh, next like, year, like, in fact. And, and uh, we can only hope uh, that um, uh, that uh, there will be an evidence-based um, policy making. And I think it looks, uh, looks okay, but, um, well, it remains uh, politics. So uh, I have one uh, final slide, and, I can, um, and this is a kind of uh, general message, and I can, in fact, um, so as when the European Court of Justice, in fact, uh, ruled that uh, the gene editing crops were GMOs, we and, and others like in the scientific community uh, were actually pretty, pretty upset like about because it's kind of non-scientific and not rational. And we mobilized uh, the entire plant science uh, community. And in fact, an organization which is called European Sustainable Agriculture through Gene Editing, which um, uh, currently represents under, under 40 plant science centers. It advocates for the use of gene editing for sustainable agriculture. It's a non-for-profit organization. There's no membership fee like at all. But what is important is that we speak with one voice towards the, pol the political world. But the fact that we speak with all institutes and like in Europe, uh, same voice, makes us all also that we the people listen to us. And um, so we are an important uh, knowledge partner for the EU Commission. Uh, we provide information to all members, organize stakeholders conferences. We had an exhibition in the European Parliament and uh, participation in all kinds of many webinars, hearings, and so on. And I can't, um, so uh, with this, I like, um, and see that the chair lady is uh, anxious, waiting. Uh, can, I uh, can only hope that if the future could, could whisper, uh, it would call, up, could call out for CRISPR. Thank you very much. So it was a fantastic, very clear, and very convincing talk. You Thank don't you. need to convince me. But maybe there are some questions to your talk. And uh, we have to see also how do you see uh, how the general public react to this one. Because there are still many resistance and uh, not enough information. So how we can deal with this? Yeah. It's a, it's a crucial uh, factor, and um, we noticed this like, in, in many of the, the conferences which were uh, organized. I think we scientists uh, tend to preach for, uh, for those which uh, understand science. Like, and, but it's absolutely essential that all stakeholders are involved. That means uh, the, the, the users, uh, the consumers, but also the retailers, uh, the, the, the breeding companies, and, like, and so on. And, like, and, I must say that, um, in general, the, uh, the public perception of gene editing is much better than it is for GMO. For GMO, it's still very difficult, non, almost non-debatable, I would say. Like, and, but for gene editing, uh, because people understand uh, that this might be a solution uh, like, to get 
to solve some of the societal problems in terms of pesticide use and climate change and so on. And again, it's much more precise and like that um, there is public perception is much better. And there has been uh, now a number of surveys being made and particularly in Scandinavian countries and again, there we would, when there would be a public vote, it would certainly be in favor of gene editing, not for GMOs. Eh? What about, maybe we can make some much more advertisement for this one, what you showed here today. It can go in the television, it can go to the schools and we can influence maybe or educate better yeah. the people. Well, it is there's certainly an, an um, inverse relationship between education, um, you know, between understanding the technology and being, uh, uh, this, the more you understand, the less uh, opposition that there is. That's clearly been demonstrated and it's, uh, it's indeed uh, 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 the case, I think it should be done by young people. I think there are many, um, many organizations uh, like Gene Sprouts, like there's an organization of youngsters now which are advocating for this technology because they really see the, the opportunities that are there. And um, we need a, a, a Greta Thunberg like, which brings this message, like, in fact, very strong, like, and, that, um, and uh, that would help like, enormously, like, uh, absolutely. This, uh, yeah, Caroline. Wondering, how did they come up with these 20 base pairs? I mean, why not 19, why not 21? To me, yeah, it's well, a mystery. Well, actually, the, 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 this is, uh, that is indeed true. The, the, the 20 edits is just also arbitrary. Um, I don't know where this comes from. The 20 nucleotides is actually explained by the following. If you take any random sequence and you uh, do a search in the, in the genome, for example, of a rice like, and so on, uh, anything what is smaller than 20 nucleotides, you will find it at random. At that system. Everything what is bigger than 20 nucleotides, you will you maybe find, but maybe not. So it's just, it's an, it's an empirical, uh, yeah, it's, it makes no sense, like it's just, uh, so it can be that the sequence, which is 20 nucleotides, like it's just, uh, when there is one more, it will be a GMO, and otherwise it, it's, it's just, uh, it's, you cannot understand all that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's an um, it's a, 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 just a bioinformatics survey which dictates that, that and they took it over from this joint uh, European laboratories with did this analysis yeah, on the basis of rice genomes and uh, it's uh, yeah. I have also big problems with that. <laughs> okay. I think yeah, we have yeah. to move on because we have uh, limited time. So our next speaker. <laughs> Our next speaker will be uh, Mark Jeste from Girona. <clears throat> he studied uh, in Spain, was a postdoc uh, in Oxford, and presently he is a research professor at the ICREA. And uh, he is representing actually the Young Academy. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you, Professor Koromozzi, for the introduction and the Academy Europea for inviting me and my colleagues, uh, the chairs uh, and previous chairs, uh, Monique, uh, Gemma, and Catalin, for thinking me of uh, giving this talk, which is a pleasure for me. So, um, semen is uh, made up of sperm cells and uh, seminal plasma. And the, uh, in the take home message of this talk is that although most of the research that has been doing, has been done thus far, um, has paid much, much more attention to the oocyte than to the sperm, a sperm uh, variables are very important for the success of reproductive uh, biology and as well as for handling infertility. So if I can start with the introduction, infertility affects between 10 and 15% of couples, so one into six couples in the Western countries. And when we are 
seeing on the factors that underlie this infertility, we can see how the male factor is between 20 and 30 percent. This depends on these figures depend on the uh, literature source. We also have a female factor with a prevalence between 20 and 35, and then we have some uh, gray um, scale because we have either both factors or idiopathic, which we don't know why this infertility is going on. If we uh, look into that perspective from this diagram, we can see how the oocyte and the sperm are crucial for the embryo success, but they are also crucial for fetal development, not only the oocyte, but also the sperm. And then, in order to understand that, we need to look into the variables, into the components of the semen. So we have from the one hand, in the middle of the figure, we can see the seminal plasma components, and then we can also uh, see other sperm cell components, such as uh, the DNA, the RNAs that the sperm uh, bear, and proteins and uh, components of the sperm like the centriole. So all this is crucial to understand why many or some of the cycles or some of the couples that try to do ERT, assisted reproductive technology, fail when they attempt that, even when they use uh, ICSI, which is the intraseptoplasmic uh, sperm injection. Because this uh, audience is very broad, I try to uh, formulate that from a philosophical of science uh, perspective by, uh, um, uh, by um, coming with the Kuhn's cycle of paradigm, trying to say, not, I'm not pretending to say that this is like Darwin uh, change or, um, or um, Einstein change of physics, but just to say that perhaps we are reaching in a moment where we are seeing that the sperm factors are much more important than we previously thought, and perhaps in the future, in reproductive biology, this paradigm giving so much relevance to the other side uh, might, might be uh, reformulated. So going into detail into these uh, components, let's talk first about the seminal plasma. And the seminal plasma is the liquid part of the semen, which comes from the activity of the different glands of the uh, male reproductive tract. This includes not, all, not only the testes and the epididymis, but also the prostate, bulbaratory glands, seminal vesicles, all them producing significant components that we do not know uh, completely what they do, but we know that they, may, uh, pl they play a role, a very important role. Um, these components are sugars, like you can see in the middle of the figure. We have as well lipids, ions. For example, the zinc is very important. We also have proteins, even uh, DNA, uh, free the seal free DNA, microRNAs, and the most funny thing that has been uh, now emerged recently or more recently is the role of the extracellular vesicles. Extracellular vesicles that differ uh, on from where they come. So we have epididymosomes because they come from the epididymis. We have prostosomes that they come from the prostate. And all these uh, uh, extracellular vesicles appear to have a particular content. So we can find inside these vesicles proteins and also microRNAs. And which is the function of these uh, uh, components or of the seminal components? So we have a dual function. So we can see how on the upper uh, of the uh, right figure, we can see how they provide like an uh, environment for the sperm to survive after ejaculation, because it's after ejaculation when a sperm and seminal plasma mix. And this function is assisting, for example, for the osmotic uh, change that occurs upon ejaculation and activates the sperm motility. So we have clear a function of this seminal plasma like a supportive role for sperm cells. And then we also have a very relevant role with regard to the female reproductive tract. And this role, as you can see, uh, is related to an immunomodulation role as well as uh, providing support in early uh, embryo development and fertilization. If we can see this in, into more detail that a specific function of seminal plasma in the female reproductive tract, we can see how, for example, in the case of the cervix, this seminal plasma has a role regarding the phagocytic clearance, also what is called netosis, which is a way 
of uh, the female reproductive tract reacting against pathogens and also against the sperm that do not, are not fit with the best um, uh, features. Then we have a function on the ovary because it looks like it could be some, in some species this is very clear, in the humans is less clear, but it could be like a, a, a synchronization of the ovulation in some extent. Then it also plays a, a role in the oviduct, which is a, a noun, a general noun to refer to the fallopian tube, the number three in the figure, and also a role regarding the uterus and the uh, uterus draining lymph nodes. In this case, if this function is preparing the uh, uterus for implantation, providing it with immunotolerance with regard to the embryo, and also activating the immune response. So it is clear from that that the seminal plasma, even if in some uh, reproductive uh, techniques it is usually removed, especially for, for sperm carrier preservation, we have now been collecting evidence, much evidence, especially from farm animals, which tell us that the seminal plasma plays a role. And if we do not uh, have the seminal plasma, and this is very clear, for example, in the studies conducted in horses, donkeys, and even uh, cattle, we can see how the response of the endometrium is much more virulent than when this seminal plasma is present. So clearly, it has a role. Moving into the sperm components, in this figure, we, sh we show uh, different parts of the sperm. So in, uh, sperm is a very specific cell because it barely has cytoplasm. We can see how mitochondria are organized in the mitochondrial uh, piece, which is surrounding the first part of the tail. And we can also see components of the sperm. In the nucleus, we can find DNA, RNAs, and also we have the acrosome, which is a, a, extra, a, is a um, Golgi complex modified that contains some enzymes that are crucial for fertilization. So let's now talk about each of these components in some detail. Let's start with the centrioles. The centrioles that you can see are located in the connecting piece in the neck between the tail and the nucleus, we can see here. But the most interesting thing is that the role that these centrioles play differs between a species. So from the one hand, we have most of the mammalian species, the Eutherian mammals, like uh, humans, pigs, cattle, horses, and so on, which is represented by uh, letter A, where the two centrioles that you can see in the figure, we have the proximal and the atypical distal one, and this proximal centriole plays a role because it organizes the uh, sperm aster and then the prunuclei migration and the prunuclei polarization upon fertilization. So this means that the centrosome the zygotic centrosome that appears after fertilization, which then breaks into two separate centrosomes that we can see in the oocyte after fertilization is, or it comes from the proximal sperm centriole. This, however, doesn't happen in mice where these two, proxy, two centrioles, neither the proximal or the, or the, the distal, are not really uh, clear that they, they, they exist, they are there in uh, the electron uh, tra um, transmission electron microscope, as you can see. So the consequence of, of that is the number of aneuploid uh, embryos that we can have because of a problem with the sperm proximal centriole, which means that in humans or in cattle, we can have some cases of miscarried embryos or embryo development failure because of uh, wrong or abnormal morphology of this proximal sperm centriole, and this doesn't happen in mice. So this is very important then that in the case of humans, it is important to look into this component because this component in some cases underlies some cases of, of infertility. Yet when these sperm are evaluated in the fertility clinics, what it is usually weighted it is the sperm motility. Of course, the sperm motility can tell us something about the sperm cell, but cannot tell us everything about the sperm cell. And in the case of the sperm central, of course, we do not have today any way to evaluate that because evaluating that would mean um, uh, disrupting or destroying the cell itself. So it's not, it's not something that is feasible. Regarding the proteins, we can see here a list of different proteins that have been reported to be involved in fertilization. Again, a sperm motility is important, but this does not explain only what a sperm does. 
Even some studies we can see on the, on the, on the right of the figure, the pre-implantation embryo development, have identified potential sperm proteins that could be present in the oocyte after fertilization. Yet, because most of these data come from um, um, models, um, we will concentrate on one of the proteins that appears uh, here. I don't know if this it works my... No, it doesn't work. Oh, yeah. The PLC zeta, PLC zeta uh, protein, which is a protein that is present in the, uh, between the sperm nucleus and the sperm membrane. It's a very, 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 very small part of the cell, which is called the perinuclear theca. But there we have this protein. And what does this protein do? This protein does what is called the oocyte activation. So oocytes leave the ovary, but they have not yet complete meiosis. So they are arrested in meiosis in metaphase two, and they can only be alleviated from that arrest when they are fertilized by the sperm. And the reason of that, it is because there is a sperm protein called PLC zeta that activates uh, the oocyte by uh, digesting PIP2 into diacylglycerol and inositol triphosphate in some PIP2 that are present in oocyte vesicles. This releases the calcium that is uh, stored in the uh, a smooth endoplasmic reticulum and this triggers the oocyte activation. This means that the oocyte, after this fertilization, and because the increasing calcium that occurs, uh, after this uh, release from the endoplasmic reticulum, the cytosolic increase in calcium uh, levels uh, alleviates the uh, oocyte from the metaphase to rates and thus the oocyte can continue and complete the meiosis, the, the second meiotic division. Immediately after that, the uh, new mitosis of the zygote or the mitosis of the new zygote will uh, start. What happens with that? This in Recent data indicate that mutations, either in the promoter or in the coding sequence of the gene encoding for this protein, the PLC zeta 1 gene, are related to infertility. And this infertility cannot be sorted out without using donor sperm or using what is called artificial oocyte activation. Again, we, again we have some a sperm component that plays a crucial role for the oocyte because the oocyte without this protein, sperm protein cannot uh, go farther, but it is something that, of course, we cannot evaluate because evaluating those, that in the sperm means destroying the cell. We can do genetic studies, but then uh, it is not clear um, with the, the, the copies of, the, of these two genes, the paternal and the maternal one, the functions that they do. But uh, now we also have uh, some recent data that indicate that uh, alterations in this protein could be some sort related to uh, embryo uh, development as well. Going to the sperm chromatin, sperm chromatin as any type of chromatin is uh, uh, made up of uh, pro uh, uh, proteins and DNA. The proteins in this, this sperm chromatin are very particular because most of the sperm chromatin uh, is linked to a, a specific proteins, very basic, very rich in lysines and arginines called uh, protamines. Some species like humans present protamine one and protamine two, two, two different protamines in the chromatin. Others, they don't, like for example, um, a sperm from cattle, a sperm from pigs, uh, they just present protamine one. Uh, here, the interesting thing is how during a spermat a spermatogenesis, so during the meiosis within the testes, the histones are replaced or by uh, transitional nuclear proteins, TNP, and then these transitional nuclear proteins are replaced by proteins. So because most of these histones are removed, most of the potential epigenetic marks that these histones can bear are as removed as well, but we will uh, take that uh, into more uh, detail later. So here, what I wanted to show is that um, most of these histones are, re are replaced by proteins, yet we have some histones. And then in the model, the way that at the end this sperm uh, chromatin is organized is, as you can see here, we have like a structure in which we have like a donut, a torrid form, like you can see here, like a, like a big tire, and then here regions that link these uh, toroids these donuts with nucleosomes. So we have the histones 
uh, related with the toroid link regions, regions that contain specific genes and are associated to histones, where, whereas most of the other sperm DNA is associated to um, proteins. So here the important thing to say is that the con we have two different parameters to evaluate. One is the condensation of the protein, the, sorry, the condensation of the chromatin, which is how these uh, toroids are formed, and the other is the integrity of the DNA, which means whether the DNA contains any break or not. Most of the studies that come from that, the problem that they have is that they have been conducted in infertile patients, and sometimes this uh, infertility uh, factor can affect as the results, and it is very difficult to understand what's going on. Of course, we can uh, use animal models, but this uh, can have different uh, problems regarding how animals are selected, the selection, uh, different selection pressure between humans and the other mammalian species, and so on. So here we have an ex uh, a data that uh, this study we conducted, uh, in which uh, we found that we, we employed to the we employed. Uh, donor sperm, but what we used was in the in the at, at, uh, in the top of the figure we have double donation because we do, we run the the, the experiment with do, uh, sperm from donors, so theoretically fertile, and all sites from donors as well, theoretically young women, uh, younger than 35 years old, and then on the on the bottom we have the single donation, which is just uh, all um, sperm donated to sperm, but with the, with all sites that uh, came from uh, patients and perhaps they could underlie some cases of fertility. And what we can see is that uh, the impact of the sperm chromatin did not depend on the oocyte quality or on the oocyte source. And this is very important if we then compare with these other data. This other data uh, is uh, data that was conducted with fragmented DNA, different categories of fragmented DNA. So these authors compared on the, on the top table, table one, they compare in vitro fertilization and exit, two different types of um, two different types of assisted reproductive techniques. And what they found was that, as you can see uh, uh, in red, that the percentage of abortions were, were very high in the case of the sperm that present uh, high DNA fragmentation. As you can see in the 40% figure, that you can see at the uh, right of the table. In addition to that, as we can see in the lower table, the way that os the oocyte handles with the sperm uh, DNA fragmentation differs on the oocyte quality. Because as we can see, when oocytes come from females older than 35 years old, the impact of the high DNA fragmentation that we have on the on, on bottom is 5.6% of uh, pregnancy rate, which means, uh, sorry, of implantation rate, which means that this contrasts with the 44.8% when the oocyte is uh, younger than 35 years old, which means that not only uh, the relevance of the sperm chromatin of the sperm DNA integrity, but the quality of the site is important to address the, this uh, oocyte damage. Actually, when we uh, compare again this effect of the DNA integrity between the double-double donations and only the donation of a sperm. So we have here donor-donor cord means that a sperm were from donors or side from donors. And then we compare that with the other table, which is donor and fertile cohort, which means sperm from donors, so theoretically fertile, and all sites from patients. And what we can see is that the impact of the sperm DNA, the decimal impact of the sperm DNA that we can see with fertilization rate implant blastocyst rate and the relationship between blastocyst and m 2 site, so is a way to evaluate the embryo development, is clear, so it's significant, when we are using all sites from donors, but not when we are, when we are using all sites from patients. And this is because these uh, all sites have a reduced fertilizing ability and thus these all sites, because they are not properly activating any mechanism to try to repair this DNA, are uh, not um, are masking the effects of that DNA. So this is also important to understand that, uh, if, as we can see in this figure, that the different DNA alterations that we can find, which are the alterations that uh, can be in the toroid link regions, which we can see here between the two donuts, here these regions, and also these regions that attach the uh, sperm chromatin to the nuclear matrix. So when 
when breaks of the DNA uh, of this DNA are involved, this has a, 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 a much impact, a huge impact on uh, implantation rate, as we will see later. So, uh, summarizing the figure, so it means that when we have a sperm DNA alterations, the oocyte tries to repair that, but this depends on the age of the oocyte in most of the cases. So that if the if the sperm DNA damage is very extensive the oocyte will not be able to repair that, and this will end with uh, embryo developmental arrest or even miscarriage and abortion, uh, and abortion. or uh, if the impact is low and the oocyte retains the capacity of uh, rem remitting that, a sperm will be able to, um, the oocyte will be able to repair, and this will be able to be correct. It is important as well to uh, indicate, and although this research is still in its infancy, is that the, the DNA breaks that occur in the sperm DNA or the impact of those DNA breaks differ on whether the DNA, the DNA breaks are only in one strand, we speak about single strand DNA breaks, or are double strand DNA breaks. So when there are single strand breaks, this usually ends with the embryo rest or even uh, total fertilization fertilization failure, so this means that the oocyte is fertilized, but then nothing happens, or if it uh, happens, it, the embryo rests after five, six days of development, so this embryo cannot be transferred to the female, but uh, in contrast, if these DNA are less numerous, but they concentrate in these regions that attach the chromatin to the DNA that I am, I am, I am trying to uh, show here, then perhaps we can see embryo development, but uh, what we can then have to face is implantation failure or miscarriage. Going to the sperm uh, epigenome, uh, the uh, sperm uh, also have different um, epigenetic modifications, and these modifications occur over the uh, spermatogenesis. So we uh, start in the primordial germ cells with the demethylation of DNA and of histones, of imprinting and histone for the acetylation. Then there is a progressive methylation uh, of uh, DNA, methylation of the histones, and then uh, when the sperm cells leave the testes, they uh, maintain this genomic imprinting. But what happens when these sperm uh, go into the oocyte? When these sperm go into the oocyte, uh, there is uh, active methylation from the uh, male pronucleus, and then there is also a replacement of the proteins by histones. This means that only the histones that are originally uh, in, in the presence of a sperm are then kept in the oocyte. So this means that the number that these histones that can uh, hold uh, epigenetic marks uh, can have is uh, smaller than in the case of the oocyte. So in the case of uh, um, the potential ability of the father to uh, pass on uh, epigenetic marks to the, uh, to the children, we have on one hand paternal imprinting because certainly there are some genes that are particularly imprinted and methylated and this is kept after fertilization. So even if there is active methylation, this doesn't happen in those genes. Most of these genes, uh, it seems that for recent data that we are having right now are related to genes um, that are placed in, the, in these regions associated to histones. And then we have also retained uh, histones and also re altered mRNAs. And going to these mRNAs, we can see how a sperm also bear RNAs, particularly in the sperm nucleus, where we can find m m uh, um, mRNAs and also non-coding RNAs. Sorry about that. Uh, and also microRNAs and even peewee RNAs. So the function of all these RNAs is not clear, and whether these RNAs come from um, a defective spermatogenesis or even are remnants of a spermatogenesis is not clear either, but it looks like some of these sperm RNAs also play a role after fertilization. Actually, some, even some microRNAs, which are released not only, not only are present in the sperm, but they seem also to be released along epidemic maturation through extracellular vesicles that the sperm capture and incorporate, they seem to play a role in fertilization and beyond. For example, in a recent study, we found that in the case of uh, cattle, we can see how um, differ, uh, ex the expression of a specific uh, microRNA, a microRNA 134, is related to fertility potential, as we can see. And this is an interesting study because it was conducted with artificial insemination, not with IVF, which is also something that is more robust. So we can do say that uh, changes in the RNA cargo, which involve a microRNAs, mRNAs, 
and other kind of non-coding RNAs can have an impact. And then finally, uh, and this is uh, to finish, we also have some evidence about the sperm metabolome. In this case, we, f we recently found that uh, the presence of certain metabolites or the way that a sperm cell works can, can, can tell us something about their fertility potential. For example, we found that the levels of citrate and the levels of lactate, or let's say in another way, how much glycolysis, or how much oxidative phosphorylation the sperm does upon ejaculation can tell us the ability of the sperm to fertilize. And we found relationship between in vitro fertilization outcomes, so means embryo development and fertilization success regarding that. This doesn't mean that these metabolites play the role after fertilization, but means that the way that how a sperm works before that upon ejaculation can predict us the success of the cell. So going to the conclusions, we can say that these paternal factors are involved in, um, in uh, not only in fertilization, not only sperm motility, although we are um, looking into that basically, but embryo development, implantation, seminal plasma uh, supports conception and implantation. The different components of a sperm, uh, the sperm cell uh, are very important, as we have seen, seen the centriole, the DNA integrity, microRNAs, and so on. Proteins that play a relevant role at PLC zeta. And then very important, uh, the chromatin integrity, the DNA integrity, which can anticipate uh, the occurrence of, uh, of fertilization failure, even embryo uh, implantation failure. And finally, this new research or this more recent research on the epigenetic impact and how this may shape uh, fertilization and offspring health. And with that, I'm done. Thanks. Thank you very much. We really, really learned a lot. And this is very important, particularly due to the problems that we have nowadays with the fertility. So thank you again. It was wonderful. And now we are coming to the next program, which is a new uh, medal, which was uh, established by our class. And I am asking uh, Professor Guyas Balash to come here and present the Sidney Brenner Medal. So, ladies and gentlemen, the Academy of Sydney Brenner Medal was established in 2022 to commemorate Sidney Brenner, one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century and one of the founding members of our academy. Sidney Brenner was born in Germiston, South Africa in 1927 and died in Singapore in 2019 at the age of 92. As a child prodigy, he started his university studies at the University of the Witwatersrand at age 15. After completing his medical studies, he pursued his doctoral studies at the University of Oxford and his postdoctoral research at Berkeley. In the 1950s and 60s, Sidney Brenner became one of the founders of the new discipline of molecular biology. And he worked closely together with the other giants of the field, Francis Crick, Francois Jacob, Matthew Meselson, just to name a few. Among his many groundbreaking discoveries, allow me to name only a few. He discovered the triplet nature of the genetic code, namely that one Amino acid is coded by three nucle uh, nuclides. 
he discovered messenger RNA. We hear in these times a lot about messenger RNA, especially when the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine was given this year to RNA vaccines. And Sidney Brenner introduced the C. elegans model as the standard model of molecular biology. Among the many awards and accolades he received in his life, allow me to name only the Lasker Award, the Copley Medal, and the Nobel Prize. In his long career, Sidney trained generations of students and scientific collaborators, of whom until today, eight, eight received the Nobel Prize. And this year, two other, I would say, followers of Sidney received yet another Nobel Prize. In 2022, at the initiative of some of its members and supported by inaugural donations by some of Sydney's friends and pupils, the life sciences class of Academia Europea established the Academia Europea Sydney Brenner Medal, which is given to honor the best in scholarship and scientific achievements in the field of molecular biology and or related disciplines within a period of not more than 20 years after obtaining the PhD degree. The first call for nominations has attracted five uniquely excellent nominations. The evaluation committee exercised due diligence and based on his outstanding scientific achievements has selected Eugene W.U as the first inaugural recipient of the Academia Europea Sydney Brenner Medal. The medalist receives a bronze medal of Sydney Brenner and a diploma, and he is going to deliver soon the first inaugural Sydney Brenner Memorial Lecture. Eugene Yeo, Jean, is a professor of cellular and molecular medicine at the University of California, San Diego. He is the scientific director of the Sanford Consortium for Regenerative Medicine and the funding scientific director for the Sanford Laboratories for Innovative Medicine. He has a bachelor degree in chemical engineering and a bachelor in economics from the University of Illinois, a PhD in computational neuroscience from MIT, and an MBA from UCSD. In a relatively short amount of time, Jean has authored over 200 peer-reviewed publications in the general area of molecular biology, biochemistry, and genomics. Jean's research interest is in understanding and manipulating RNA processing in development and disease. His lab has made critical contributions to our understanding of the function of RNA binding proteins and by being an active contributor to RNA genomics technologies and therapeutics developments. I don't want to continue the long list. I think the laureate should speak for himself, but allow me to ask now Sydney Brenner's daughter, Mrs. Carla Brenner Roach, to present in the company of the chair of the life sciences section, or class more precisely, Professor Eva Kondoroshi, the first inaugural Academia Europea Sydney Brenner Medal to Eugene Yeo.
Valas, um, Eva, and most of all, Carla, thank you so much for this opportunity <laughs> and this honor. Um, I must say, when, when Balas uh, encouraged me to, to apply for this, I was uh, very excited, thank you. Uh, and when he told me that I had, I had been chosen, I was even more excited, but I was most excited because I heard that Carla was coming in person. And uh, I, I've known Sydney obviously for a long time, and it was really, uh, you know, we missed each other in the final days of Sydney, being in Singapore, and so seeing her here is, is a, Tremendously uh, powerful and emotional for me. So, so thank you for, for being here, Carla. It means a lot. Okay, so what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about what my lab is doing. Um, I'm going to frame it in the context of, of Sydney because uh, this is in honor of Sydney. Um, and so I'm going to first tell you about how he inspired me at essentially all stages of my journey. Uh, when, I was, uh, when I finished my undergrad degrees in engineering and economics, I spoke to many different people about the different kinds of careers you can have. And uh, my father insisted I speak to Sydney, and that was the end of it. It, it made it very clear that there was only one career that you could do, uh, and that was to be a scientist. And uh, when I uh, then decided to uh, go to uh, MIT, I asked Sydney, what should I focus on? And Sydney said, neuroscience. And uh, I wasn't smart enough to continue doing neuroscience, but uh, I was able to at least learn the machine learning uh, uh, bioinformatics components there. And when I, the day I defended my thesis in the morning, I called Sydney up. I'm done here. By the way, Sydney used to, used to tell me you have to be an average student, don't be an amazing student, otherwise your PhD advisor will never let you go. Um, and so I called him up and Sydney said, come to the SOC and join me and you can be my guinea pig as an inaugural fellow there at the Crick Jacob Center, and I did that. Um, and I have used to catch up with Sydney every time he's in San Diego, see him in Sing Singapore. So he was uh, really, truly insp inspirational to me and to a whole generation, as you heard from Balas, of trainees um, and scientists all over the world. Uh, one criticism that Sydney always told me is to never be a manager, and, and he must be very disappointed because over the years my lab has grown and grown, and he's like, you know, he always said, keep your lab small, don't be a manager, but unfortunately, I have too many interesting problems I'm trying to solve, so, so that's, that's where we are in San Diego. So what are we passionate about? I mean, you've already, I don't have to tell you the importance of mRNA, right? The, the Nobel Prizes have been given to, uh, will be awarded to uh, uh, Katie and, and Drew, uh, but I can tell you what we're being interested in doing, right? So when you look at, when you think about RNA, there's 20% of the cell weight, dry weight is made of RNA, um, and RNA is, is never linear. So here I show you squiggles of the cartoon of uh, the structure of RNA, but it's also never naked, right? This is the cap and tail RNA. It's never naked except when the RNA is stressed, and I'll tell you a little bit about stressed RNAs in a little bit. Uh, but RNA is always coated with proteins. Every single nucleotide of the RNA uh, is bound by some protein or another. It's never, never naked. And even when you get all transfected with mRNA vaccines, as soon as it gets into the cytoplasm, it's coated with RBPs, RNA binding proteins, and ribosomes. So the fate of a given RNA can be dictated by the set of RNA binding proteins it interacts with. And so when you lose a single RNA binding protein, the set of RNAs that it normally regulates, in this case the green one, disappear or change or alter in translation or stability, right? So it's critically important that we understand RNA regulation from a perspective of how proteins control it. Every given RBP can bind to hundreds of thousands of RNA targets. And so we've been striving to build technologies to understand RNA by trying to understand these binding sites. So in the lab, we combine genomics, technologies, data analysis, disease modeling. We do a lot of stem cell research and to derive new forms of therapeutic paradigms. Um, and just to remind you, this is a complicated path, right? So there are many steps from the birth of an RNA to the death or the translation of the RNA. And every step we have been interested in, Sydney got me interested in RNA splicing very early on, introduced me to Phil Sharp who discovered splicing at MIT. And, uh, and I got interested in many other forms. And think about the RNA modifications, two RNA modifications, get your mRNA vaccines in your cell, but there's 170 other RNA modifications, modifications. who knows what they're doing or what they can do. And so we are very interested in how proteins control RNA fate uh, they all bind RNA through cis or uh, sequences or um, structure. But we don't really know what the function of many of the RNA binding proteins do. 
When I first started my lab, maybe a dozen or so RNA binding proteins were well characterized. And when my chair said, what, which RBPs are you going to study? I said, all of them. Um, and, and that's because mutations in RBPs really are important in many diseases. We study a fair number of these in my group. Mutations in their binding sites also cause disease. So why is this protein RNA mapping or interactions important? Well, these days, not only are they important for basic biology, they're also important in trying to build next generation drugs. So imagine if you can fit an RNA, a compound into an RNA binding protein RNA pocket, you can then control the fit of the RNA. Why bother with the protein? Those drugs are harder to make. If you have RBP binding sites, you can fit an antisense oligo nucleotide or siRNA in there to block the binding or to alter its regulation. Those are sequence-specific drugs that you can go from N of one patient to N of millions. And so we've been developing technologies to enable this. A good story, not from my lab, it's from Adrian Craner's lab, is the therapeutics on, for spinal muscular atrophy. So SMA is uh, depicted by the loss of SMN1, uh, also an RNA binding protein. But if you lose SMN1, luckily for us in humans, you have a backup copy SMN2. Unfortunately, it's alternately spliced, so that's the exon separated by introns, and the exon is not included in the final isoform, therefore not giving you the full-length protein. So there's one single RNA binding protein there on, called HRMPA1 binding to the intronic site. Now, if you block it with an ASO, which is what Adrian Craner and Ionis did, you can fix the splicing of this single gene and create a first drug for neurodegeneration uh, that can deliver it sequence specifically, right? This is a good case study because now there are multiple drugs, one expressing the RNA binding protein to replace the missing RBP SMN1, one small molecule that can intersect the splicing factor to then control splicing. Uh, my lab works on all of the different approaches here, uh, and we are fundamentally you know, leveraging the strength of protein RNA interactions. I have to have a quote from Sydney. Sydney used to tell me progress in science depends on technologies, discoveries and new ideas, probably in that order. And so we've devoted a lot of our efforts in trying to create new technologies, right? And you can see in this amazing progress with CRISPR, that's a new, that was a technology. mRNA vaccines, that was a technology. Quantum dots, technology, right? So, so very excited about the, the power of technology to, to uncover new biology. Um, and so one of the key methods to try to un uncover protein RNA interactions is to use antibodies to isolate protein RNA interactions, right? Simply, you pull down the protein after UV cross-linking, digest the RNAs away, and then ligate adapters to sequence it. The question is very simple. Among this mess of RNA and RBPs, which one binds the specific R the green RNA binding protein? Now, however, since the 90s to early 2000s, there have been many technologies available, but maybe between 2001 to 2008, there were maybe two or three papers published on a single RBP and their maps, and their binding maps to RNA substrates. So we spent a lot of effort in optimizing and developing new technologies, and, then, and one of them is called Enhanced Clip. I'm gonna show you an example of one thousand, you know, 100 bases of one gene, but we get the data the same for across the entire genome. On um, this is the, let me see if I can get the laser pointer working here. This is the, um, the three prime UTR of this gene involved in Alzheimer's disease. This is our RNA binding protein binding site here with control and uh, IP and controls. And so this enhanced clip method has a thousand times improved efficiency over all available technologies. And we've continued to use this to study RNA biology across C. elegans to flies to stem cell biology and cancer. And so we've published over 200 papers in this area. And we continue to innovate and build new technologies. The other one is STAMP, which gives you single cell nucleotide level resolution, isoform sensitivity, Every single line here is a single cell, one RNA bound by one RBP that we can uncover. So next generation of technologies. We've generated a lot of these technologies and contributed to the field. We've generated maps for not a dozen, but 150 RBPs in the span of 18 months. And now the, this is one of the most highly used data sets in both academia, but also in industry. I used to get calls every couple of days from collaborators in the world to please help them use our different array of technologies to understand RNA biology. At some point, we gave up. So we spoke to NIH, who funded us a small grant to build a company called Eclipse Bio. So we licensed a lot of our technologies, including the ones I mentioned, into Eclipse Bio. Now they work for and work with most of the major pharma companies out there, 100 over biotech companies and academic labs, uh, including the Modernas, the, the Pfizer, BioNTech, and so on. 
Because anytime you have a technology that addresses RNA therapeutics, uh, you need the, the slew of technologies that Eclipse Bio provides. It's a disclaimer, I'm a co-founder. And we've continued to make innovations in this area. Now we can go from one protein to uh, 10 to, to dozens at the same time. Here, uh, together with one of my, my postdocs who left my lab and joined one of our companies, you can see that instead of mapping 10 RBPs one at a time with 20 different input samples, you can mix them all in one because he figured out ways to have oligonucleotides conjugated to the antibody to then be able to sequence and deconvolute the identity all in one go. So you can go just massively scaled experiments. Sydney used to tell me, you know, sometimes high throughput is not the same as high output, sometimes it's low output. And so we're always also careful to go back in and say, here are some examples of, of uh, important uh, discoveries we've made. I want to switch gears a little bit though to tell you about, so we've told you about how proteins can bind RNA to control RNA processing, and I, like Sydney also says, we'll leave the details to, to, uh, to another time. But I want to share with you how RNAs can also impact RNA binding proteins, how RNAs can be a scaffold for RBPs in the context of disease. And so we work on many different areas, but um, one of the key areas I want to talk about is neurodegeneration. So uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is a severe um, neurodegenerative disease of upper and lower motor neurons, right? So you get paralysis usually within a, a few years upon disease onset, and, uh, and, and that's, it's a fatal, fatal uh, uh, disease. Now I'm gonna tell you and share with you why we think RNA binding proteins are really interesting for ALS, and actually it's actually quite clear. If you look at 95% uh, of ALS patients, they have cytoplasmic inclusions and aggregation in, in, of, of this one RNA binding protein, TDB43. So normally, TDB43, this protein is in your nucleus, in all your cells, and you're healthy, and you're fine. But when TDB43 leaves the nucleus into the cytoplasm, that's gonna be a problem if it doesn't return. And in patients with uh, ALS, uh, the protein leaves the nucleus, stays in the cytoplasm, and then form aggregates. And so why is, you know, this is a, so we thought for a while that this is a protein autophagy issue, but it turns out it's an RNA problem, an RNA binding protein problem. And the clue, basically came because many mutations were found in ALS on other RNA binding proteins, not just TDB43, here are a list of them. And the other clue was that the mutations don't occur in the RNA binding domain or the, or the rest of the protein, but only in, mainly in the intrinsically disordered region. So what is this intrinsically disordered region? So these are regions which are floppy. You know, they stick, they're like putty, um, and, and they play a role in accelerating or changing the formation of granules. So what are granules? So this is a video from Roy Parker's lab that, sh that have a tag, uh, GFP tag, GGBP1, another RNA binding protein, and he just stresses the cells. You can do this with any cell, in any, any system, and you will see the protein from a uniform distribution coalesce into a, into a granule. It condenses, it, con it condenses. So there is no membranes. It just forms a liquid, liquid-like droplet separated from its neighbors. So again, cytoplasms are not uniform mixes of RNA, RBPs, they, are, they can coalesce. This forms in stress, and when stress is gone, the mRNA dissipate. This is very important because if you cannot do this, your cells are dead, right? If you can do this too well, you are resistant to chemotherapeutics. If you do this too badly, you get neurodegeneration, right? And so we've been very interested in how, in the process of forming, forming this. This is all RNA mediated. So if you deplete RNA, you don't have this, right? You do not form, because RNA here is a scaffold. Remember I told you RNA is never naked, right? Except when it's stressed. And then the RNA is, and then the RNA is naked for a short time and then recruits RBPs to it and then coalesces into these little, little droplets, right? And so for a while, we've been very interested in what, like, what is going on with these aggregates, right? So um, what are in these aggregates? Um, and so this is a simple model that Roy Parker and others in the community, including ourselves, have now postulated that might exist. So in the cell, when cells are stressed, ribosomes run off the mRNA in the cytoplasm, and then the core proteins like GGBP1 are already bound and may recruit other proteins uh, and because RNA in the, the, the little black lines are the scaffold, 
you have other RBPs that bind the RNA because now they're spaced, so ribosomes are no longer bound. And these other RBPs contain intrinsically disordered regions. Now, if you have a mutation in these intrinsically disordered regions, that accelerates the formation or changes the rate or resolution of these granules. And then you build differences in the shell and differences in, in dissolving when stress is gone. And so we've been very interested in what are in, in stress granules. We've built stem cell systems to study these, you know, uh, patient-derived neurons to study these. We've built organoids to study these. Um, and so one of the, the key technologies that we needed was to unbiasedly ask what are in these condensates. So we leveraged this technology called ascorbic peroxidase uh, enzyme, uh, uh, Apex2. This was first developed by Alice Ting at Stanford. And this enzyme uh, was used initially to label proteins in the mitochondria, but we figured we can use this to label RNA granules, which have no membrane, like the mitochondria. Turns out that we were correct. So this, what you do is you take an RBP of interest, GGBP1, you fuse it with the enzyme, and then you add hydrogen peroxide and the presence of hydrogen peroxide and biotin phenol, all the proteins in the vicinity of this protein gets biotinylated, okay? So, so within a 10 nanometer radius. And just to show you an example here, this is a cell with GGBP1 labeled with GFP, then you stress the cell, right? And so you stress it, you see that the GFP coalesce, forms a liquid-like droplet, Right? And, then, and then if you use streptavidin conjugated to a floor, which recognizes the biotin on the proteins in the vicinity, you see the beautiful overlap. So for the first time, you can in vivo label all the proteins in proximity of a granule. There's no post-lysis reassociation. You just do streptavidin pull down and mass spec. Now I won't go over the details of the proteins we identified. We identified 300 proteins, half are RNA binding proteins. Uh, many of them are actually stress specific, but also cell type specific, but the core remains the same. We identified new proteins that if you depleted affected stress granule formation, and that laid, laid sort of the foundation for other people to follow up on the work. But a surprise turned out that, and through collaborations, that if you take animal models, right? So at this time we were working with two different groups, one in Biogen and one in uh, UMass Medical who had just Drosophila models for neurodegeneration where the overexpress RBPs in the flies had, had dysfunctional photoreceptors or the wings fell off, right? But if you knock down the, the stress granule proteins or RBPs in that context, sometimes you made it worse, but oftentimes you can make it better, right? So this was the first articulation that stress granule components could be systematic, systemat systematically identified and then leveraged as novel drug targets. Um, the, while we were doing this, also another lesson from Sydney is many ways to skin a cat, right? Uh, we wanted to look at genetically what factors can control RNA granule formation and resolution. And so CRISPR, you heard, um, we can use that as a pooled screen. So instead of one gene at a time, we can do hundreds or thousands of gene knockouts at the same time, where individual guides can knock out a gene in one cell and you can sequence that, that, that guide RNA in that cell to know which gene was depleted. So we made pool CRISPR libraries for RNA binding proteins. We wanted to, in principle, add them to cells so that each cell had one guide knocking out one gene, right? And then you want to ask in that cell, after the gene is gone, do you see the cell react to stress or not? Very simple assay, okay? Then ideally, you then pick out that cell and you say, I'm gonna sequence that guide RNA. Turns out, that's not easy to do because all pool CRISPR screens up to that point use survival, so if the gene knockout created the cells to survive more, you select it for the cells that were alive, or fact sorting, right? But how do you have a subcellular phenotype, pick that cell, sequence it? That, that, that's not, that was not so easy. So we worked with Nancy Albritton at UNC then, and she had these interesting micro raft ar arrays um, that was used for many other things, but never for put CRISPR screens. And she had 40,000 little rafts, little rafts on the micro raft array. So what we could do is we could transduce cells with guides, an antivirus with pure mycin selection, selected the cells that survive so that all the cells with no guides go away. And then you plate the cells onto these little um, uh, micro raft arrays. You do it with, uh, by Poisson distribution, so one third of the cells have one cell and the rest are empty. And so each, each little, sorry, of the raft so each raft had one clone, and the clone would grow up. 
then you have enough clones in just that little ref of that one guide RNA, right? And then what you can do is you can use imaging. And we develop our own deep learning algorithms. Now I guess you call them AI, right? But deep learning algorithms to do image analysis with neural networks to identify which is true positive, which is not positive, right? So then with imaging, you can see with subcellular imaging whether or not granules form or couldn't form when you knock out the gene. Okay, now it becomes a trick. How do you, how do you pick up that, that single colony? It turns out that you can, these rafts have paramagnetic material. You can pop, pop up the raft, it floats away in the media, and you have a magnetic wand, literally, that goes in there and lifts the little raft out, drop it in the tube, and by subcellular imaging, phenotype, phenotyping, you can pick out something and then sequence it, right? So you can do this for many, many rafts. And so this is the first poop CRISPR screen that you can do subcellular imaging. Now there are much more elegant methods, but this is now commercially available, right? So you can do this in your own labs without fancy microscopes. Uh, we've picked out a lot of genes and RBPs that affected many steps of RNA processing that affected stress granule formation. Here's an interesting tidbit of a surprise we got. Here we validated that we can knock out SNRP200, and for those who are splicing aficionados, right? SNRP200 is BIR2. It's a critical component of the splicing process to remove introns and the ligate exons, right? So why the heck would removing it, you know, in, in the genome affect something in the cytoplasm? So we thought it was a false positive, but we validated it. And then fortunately, a year later, a, a friend of ours, Christine Van der Waal, actually showed that in patient um, slices for, uh, with ALS, there were SNP200 inclusions in the cytoplasm. So this is the first role for a, a weird, you know, a core splicing component that was actually important for RNA granule formation in the cytoplasm. So something we're continuing to follow up as well, yeah. Um, hoping I'm, hoping I'm, I'm sort of sharing with you the technologies leading to new biology and then going back and forth. And the final thing that we want to do, which we thought was kind of crazy, one grad student did this entire project, was are there just ways to just dissolve these granules, right? And so this was done very early, 2015, 2016. Uh, we had an assay, you know, GGBP1 condensing or not. We can screen, screen small molecule compounds. And we found interesting compounds. They're very weird. So you can have these compounds. So this is, so in green are biochemically extracted granules. So physically you stress the cells, they have these granules. You can like basically freeze them and take away this biochemical, uh, biochemically formed aggregates, put them in the dish. If you add inhibitors or translation, obviously they don't affect the granules because they've already been formed and those are upstream inhibitors. But if you add some of our compounds, you can see here, the granules just <laughs> dissolve, right? And when you add some of these compounds in cells from mice with, with mutations that give you ALS, um, neurons actually survive better. So here on this curve is a cumulative death rate and so these are um, the, the dying rate of just neurons with TDP43 mutations. And then if you overexpress, uh, you know, GFP uh, in a wild type line, this is the death, normal, normal death curve. But if you have these TDP43 mutations and then you add our compounds, they shift the death curve down. So, so this was actually the first small molecule screen to articulate the concept that condensates were druggable you can do this systematically, and then leading to potentially new drug efforts, right? So again, completely new area, you know, people think about drugging proteins, RNA, what the, why, why are you drugging condensates? But this is something that could be quite, quite interesting. So that's, uh, that's sort of the quick summary of where, where we are at. Uh, it, you know, we think that we are making some inroads into trying to discover RBPs as new targets in new generation. We've taken some of these strategies to go to oncology and other areas as well. I just want to finally end with a big thank you again to Carla for actually sharing Sydney <laughs> to the world. I know from personal experience, it's, it's uh, you know, family is it's, it's critical, right? Um, but it, it was amazing that, that Sydney was, thank you for sharing him. It's amazing that he was there as a godfather to, to many of us. And so I'm sure he'll be disappointed, you know, looking up from his sabbatical, I guess, because my lab's continuing to grow. Uh, we have a lot of trainees, and they're doing a lot of different things and starting a lot of new companies. So I'll stop and take questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you 
so much yep. for this fantastic work and your presentation. Thank you. Yep. Congratulations again Thanks to so your much. prize. I've got my water. You can take your prize. And now I have a proposition, if you don't mind. Maybe we can skip the break and continue with the talks. And then we have enough time, really, before the new member presentation. Is it acceptable? Hmm? Hmm? Because I, I did not hear the question or the comment. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, okay. So my proposition was that maybe we can skip the break. Just continue with the next two talks, if it's acceptable for you. And then we can have a little break before the new member presentations. Is it acceptable? Because then we are surely in time. Yeah. So in this case, we can continue the program, and I will ask Craig Dixon to present uh, the first scientific uh, medal of Class C, and also who is awarded with this uh, recognition. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, now announce the prize for the Academia Award for Advanced Research in, in recognition of Adam Kondrossi's many outstanding scientific contributions and his life lifelong dedication to science. In fact, um, the Academy recognizes two awards in the name of Adam Kondrossi. And one of these is an Early Career Investigator Award, which is uh, actually presented at the European Nitrogen Fixation Conference. And then we have the award for advanced research, which recognizes landmark research in symbiosis and related fields that has changed our understanding, has made a significant scientific impact in the field of plant science. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Michael Odvardi today as the awardee of the Award for Advanced Research in the name to recognize Adam Kondoroshi's outstanding uh, research output and achievements. Professor Udvardi has made an enormous contribution to plant science, and in particular to our understanding of symbiotic nitrogen fixation and the physiology of the legume nodule symbiosis. Michael received his PhD at the Australian National University in Canberra in 1989, and after a pre brief postdoctoral period at Washington State University, he returned to ANU to continue his research on symbiotic membrane transport in legume nodules. During this time, he published a number of seminal papers that characterized mechanisms of nutrient transport across the symbiosome membrane, including the identif identification of a specific ammonium transporter responsible for transporting ammonium, the product of nitrogen fixation, from the bacteroids into the plant cytosol. 
Subsequently, Michael obtained a position at the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Plant Physiology in Gulm, where he focused on developing Lotus Japonicus as a model legume for functional genomics and metabolome analysis. This enabled him to establish a large number of state-of-the-art resources for the scientific community, including a transcriptome analysis and mass, spectro sorry, and mass spectrometry methods for, for metabolite analysis. He then moved to the USA to work at the Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation in Oklahoma, where he eventually became the director and subsequently the chief scientific officer of the renamed Noble Research Institute. During this time, he pioneered the development of another legume, Medicargo trun truncatula, as a model for symbiotic nitrogen fixation, and undoubtedly established himself as a world leader in legume functional genomics. He also initiated research on more translational aspects of plant science, including the development of switchgrass as a sustainable native feedstock for biofuel production. Professor Udvardi is currently Professor of Legume Genomics at the University of Queensland in Australia, where his research group focuses on nutrient efficiency in symbiotic nitrogen fixation and climate resilience in legumes. Michael is undoubtedly a polymath as his research has covered so many aspects of plant and microbial biology, spanning, for example, biochemistry, genomics, and agronomy. But from my personal perspective, he is a plant physiologist par excellence. And I'm not aware of any other researcher who has such deep insights into legume nutrient transport and metabolism. So now I would like to present Now for you to deliver your lecture, please, which is called Genetics and Genomics of Symbiotic Nitrogen Fixation, Past, Present, and Future. Thank you, Ray, and thanks for that kind introduction. It's a great honor to get the Adam Condorosi Award, especially as Adam was a, a pioneer in the, the field of research that I work in um, and was one of the leaders when I began my career nearly 40 years ago. Thank you very much. So, well, thank you for staying. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, I want to um, talk about legumes, the importance of legumes in, st in sustainable agriculture, um, review about 20 years of genetics and genomics in, in, um, in legumes related to nitrogen fixation, and then talk about the potential to improve nitrogen fixation for sustainable agriculture at the end of my talk. So legumes are a large family of plants with over 18,000 species. Um, importantly, they can use atmospheric nitrogen as a source of nitrogen in, in addition to soil nitrogen. Um, and that means that their seeds are often amongst the highest protein content seeds of any plants. Legumes are used uh, not only for food, but also as feedstock for fuel, um, oil and biofuel as ornamentals. Um, and in pastures, so they have a variety of uses um, for humans. Um, you'll know a few of the um, legumes. Soybean is the major legume in the world with over uh, nearly 350 million tons, but um, many of the others you'll know as, as well as foods that you eat. 
Um, many countries have legumes as a, a key source of protein. Um, and in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa and South Africa, oh, sorry, South America, um, they represent a, a, an important part of the protein diet um, and much more so than, than in places like Europe, for instance. Legumes have a very low carbon footprint, a greenhouse gas emissions footprint compared to other sources of protein. So compared to, to beef, for instance, they're about 50 fold less in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. It's in part because they are able to fix nitrogen within their own cells uh, and, and save um, nitrogen losses to the environment, including, as we heard from Dirk, the nitrous oxide emissions. In today's talk, I wanna um, review the importance of nitrogen in agriculture and the role that legumes play in, in, in a sustainable future for, for nitrogen in agriculture. Talk a bit about the genetics and genomics work that have been, has been done in legumes and then um, finally end with uh, some considerations about how we might improve symbiotic nitrogen fixation in legumes. So first of all, um, nitrogen supply in agriculture, um, it's, it's known from a variety of ecological studies as well as agricultural studies that most soils are nitrogen limiting for plant growth, um, not only soils but also aqueous environments. So nitrogen tends to be limiting in the environment for productivity. So if you add nitrogen into um, natural systems or into agricultural systems, you tend to see a boost in primary productivity. In fact, that's one of the bases of the green revolution. So as Dirk mentioned, um, plant, novel plant genetics in the mid 20th century together with um, uh, mechanization and the massive use of fertilizers led to the green revolution, which led to massive increases in productivity on agricultural lands. Um, but that's come at somewhat of a cost to the environment. With respect to nitrogen, the nitrogen that we're now adding through agriculture is virtually doubling the nitrogen flux through the biosphere. So natural uh, nitrogen fixation and denitrification processes both on land and ocean are what drive the global nitrogen cycle and the use of um, industrial uh, nitrogen fixation for fertilizer production, nitrogen fixation in crop legumes, as well as fossil fuel burning has increased the, the entry of nitrogen into the, the global cycle. Um, ironically, even though there's a, an excess of nitrogen in many agricultural production zones around the world, there are still parts of the world that have too little nitrogen, especially sub-Saharan Africa. So we've got an overuse of nitrogen in many um, continents and, and too little elsewhere. Our in influence on the global nitrogen cycle um, is on par with the loss of bio natural biodiversity and climate change as, as one of the um, earth processes is, that's um, considered to be unsustainable. So our use of nitrogen is considered unsustainable. Agriculture is a major source of reactive nitrogen on our planet now. Um, it's the main source of ammonia, uh, nitrous oxide emissions, and um, nitrogen species run off and, 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 and leachate into, into rivers and oceans. So we, we require um, nitrogen fertilizers at this stage in agriculture in order to sustain the, the productivity we need to, to feed a, a growing um, population. But on the other hand, much of that nitrogen is lost and is undermining uh, other processes on the planet. So it's not sustainable. Uh, what is su sustainable, more or less, is biological nitrogen fixation in legumes, the process that I'm most interested in. And, this um, image on the right-hand side shows the, um, the organ in which nitrogen fixation occurs in legumes. It's a specialized organ that develops on roots and it houses nitrogen-fixing bacteria called rhizobia. Uh, you can see the, the biochemistry there. Um, this process injects about 50 million tons of nitrogen into agriculture each year. What I didn't say earlier was that industrial nitrogen fertilizers contribute about 120 million tons a year. So, um, 100 years ago, biological nitrogen fixation was the primary source of nitrogen in agricultural systems. That's been more or less sidelined by um, fertilizer nitrogen um, since the mid 20th century. You can see the impact of nitrogen fixation on the right-hand panel in, in soybean where the wild type WT is growing well on low nitrogen in the soil because it's able to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. 
Either side of that, especially on the left-hand side, you see nod minus mutants that are unable to fix nitrogen, and you can see the difference in, in performance of those plants as a result of um, the presence or absence of nitrogen fixation. So legume nitrogen fixation improves nitrogen use in agriculture, primarily because the nitrogen is fixed within plant cells and used immediately. In contrast, when we use nitrogen fertilizers on cereals, for instance, a large portion of that nitrogen is, is not used by the plant, not captured in the harvested product, and is therefore vulnerable to loss either to the atmosphere or to, to uh, surrounding water bodies. This table simply shows for the major crops the nitrogen use efficiency, which is the ratio of nitrogen captured in the harvested product divided by the nitrogen inputs into those systems. The primary input, as I've said, is usually fertilizer nitrogen, but it could include symbiotic nitrogen fixation in legumes, for instance. For the major cereals, the nitrogen use efficiency is about 40%. That means about 60% of the nitrogen coming into those systems isn't used by the crop and is vulnerable to loss. In the case of soybean, in contrast, the nitrogen use efficiency is 80%. So there's very little nitrogen that's um, left in the soil and, 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 um, and, and, and um, um, vulnerable to losses. So legumes traditionally over the centuries were important for sustainable uh, agricultural systems and I would argue we need to go back to them in many cases in order to, to reduce the nitrogen losses from agriculture. We can do that by planting more legumes but we can also do that by trying to inc increase the, the, the rate of nitrogen fixation in legumes uh, that already fix nitrogen and, and I'll talk about a little bit about that at, at the end. So in terms of genetics and genomics of nitrogen fixation, it's relatively young, despite the fact that Mendel just, uh, invented the, the, the field of genetics 120 or so years ago, um, and, and legumes have been important in genetics ever since. Um, genetics and genomic discoveries in legumes with respect to nitrogen fixation is relatively young, only 20 years. Um, and about 20 years ago, I, I was involved with other groups in, in pioneering the use of model legume systems uh, to try to understand the genetics and genomics of this process um, better. We targeted um, legumes that were diploid, that were self-fertile, um, so largely homozygous, small genomes that could be relatively easily sequenced, and, and two of those models are Medicago truncatula and Lotus japonicus, and I'll talk a little bit about work on both of those. But the notion was that by using genetics and genomics, we'd gain knowledge about this complex process of symbiotic nitrogen fixation, which may ultimately lead to crop improvement. Um, I've introduced Metacogator truncatula already. It's, a, it's actually a, a crop, it's a forage crop, um, but it has a small genome, and we developed a number of resources to use this as a model system, including um, uh, gene expression atlases that, that describe the expression of all the genes in all the organs of the, of the plant. Uh, and, and mutant populations that were really helpful in accelerating the rate of discovery of, of new genes involved in nitrogen fixation. Um, one of the um, resources that we developed in Medicago truncatula was the use of a transposon insertion mutant population where we brought a transposon from tobacco into the genome and then moved that transposon around through tissue culture um, to, to, to generate essentially a million um, mutations in, in a population of about 20,000 um, individuals. So we have a, a population of 20,000 mutants and we're able to screen that population for interesting phenotypes. Um, so, so Mendel started with interesting phenotypes and ultimately 100 years later, um, several groups discovered the genes that were defective in those uh, um, archetypal mutants such as wrinkled seed, uh, which turned out to be a mutation in, in a gene in carbon metabolism. So. So that, that process of starting from an, an interesting phenotype and, and, and going to the gene is called forward genetics. Um, and reverse genetics is when you start with a gene of interest, you create a mutant, and you look for the phenotype. And we've been doing both of these things in Medicago truncatula, using these insertion mutations as a type of flag to rapidly find the mutations that cause a phenotype, or in the case of forward genetics, to find the, the mutation responsible for the phenotype of interest. So I'm, these are some of the types of mutants that we get. Um, on the top left-hand side, panel A, you see a typical Medicago nodule. It's sort of a 
multi-lobed um, organ. Um, it's, it's red because of the protein hemoglobin. It's primary, the main major uh, plant protein in the cell. It's involved in oxygen homeostasis, and I'll show you some work on that in a moment. But there's a variety of mutants that um, do either nodulate but don't fix nitrogen, or that don't nodulate at all, or that create too many nodules. So there are all types of mutations that one can isolate from this mutant population. And because those mutants are tagged, we're able to find the causative genes quite easily. This slide simply shows that the process of nodule development is complex. It involves many steps. It starts with signal exchanges between plant cells and the bacteria in the soil. Actually, Adam Condorosi was key to understanding some of the um, bacterial genetics behind, develop the, uh, behind the, the so-called nodulation factor that the bacteria produce that then triggers cell divisions in the root, uh, as well as um, processes that lead to invasion of plant cells by the bacteria. So these two processes are fundamental to nodule development. Plant cell division that forms the organ and infection processes that deliver um, the rhizobia into um, the plant cells. So I'm going to talk and give you a couple of examples of how we have used mutant resources to discover genes involved initially in, in infection and, and, and accommodation of the bacteria. One of those genes we called Vaporin, um, and it's required not only for establishing a nitrogen-fixing symbiosis, but actually was found in other groups to be required for mycorrhizal fungal uh, interactions with plants. So another endosymbiosis where the microorganism lives within the plant cell. And, and those two symbioses, although separated by hundreds of millions, millions of years of evolutionary time, actually share some common genes in some of the early signaling and um, accommodation mechanisms. Vaporin is one of these. So on the, on the left of, the, uh, of this panel, you see a wild-type nodule. On the right, the Vaporin nodule, so the nodule doesn't develop properly. If we look at the um, infection thread, so this is how the bacteria enter the plant cells. They, they enter through the a root hair cell, um, these protrusions from the epidermis of the plant root, and that provides a tunnel for the bacteria to get into underlying cells. That, that tunnel um, is largely, or is, um, plant cell membrane, and it's called an infection thread. In the wild type, that infection thread um, moves from the tip of the root hair through to the base of the root hair and into the underlying cortical cells, and it's a quite well-defined tubular structure. In this particular Vaporin mutant, that, that um, infection thread is, is disorganized. Bacteria are often released from the thread, and they don't make it down into underlying cells. And so these mutants um, are bought, or, or these nodules don't develop properly. Um, and we found that, that um, mycorrhizal symbiosis is likewise affected. So the arbuscules that typically form in the wild-type plant are unable to form in the Vaporin mutants. And if you bring a wild-type or a normal copy of that Vaporin gene back in, you can um, recover um, the arbuscules, which actually you can see in the far right panel here. These are uh, the fungal structures within plant cells that, that are typical of the wild type, and that can be um, reintroduced into the mutant by expressing the Vaporin gene into, into those plants. Another gene that we discovered, this time in reverse, so this is a reverse genetics experiment where we um, using the gene expression data that we had, the global gene expression data that we generated for Medicago, we were able to select genes that are expressed specifically in nodules with the hypothesis that they're probably important for biological function in nodules. And we were particularly interested in transcriptional regulators. Um, there are thousands of these in plants and they regulate just about every process there is in plants. And so we were selecting transcription factors that are specifically expressed in nodules, and then we would um, find mutations in those and, and, and query their function through um, the analysis of the mutants. RSD, regulator of symbiosome development, was um, uh, we, we found to be a, a C2H2 transcription factor based on its sequence and, and predicted um, protein um, structure. Um, it's homologous to similar proteins in other legumes, as you see on the right panel. It has a couple of conserved domains. First of all, the C2H2 DNA binding domain is conserved, so it's presumably a DNA binding domain and possibly a regulator of gene expression. It also has a, an EAR domain, which is a known repressor domain, so typically transcription factors that have this domain 
tend to turn off genes rather than turn on genes. So we, we hypothesized that this was a, a transcription, transcriptional repressor that would possibly re repress certain genes during nodule development. Anyway, we found mutations in this gene um, and they were non-functional. So on, in panel B, you can see a wild type um, plant growing quite well and, and the two plants next to that are insertion uh, mutations in the RSD gene. Uh, panel C shows nitrogen fixation activity in the wild type on the left and then in the two mutants. So nitrogen fixation activity is, is strongly um, um, repressed or, or down or decreased in these mutants. And um, if, we, if we take a wild type copy of that gene, we're able to rescue the phenotype confirming that that mutation was the cause of the phenotype. This is just a cross section through nodules of the wild type in the top row. Uh, showing uh, nodules at different stages of development. Panel C shows mature nitrogen fixing nodules with the bacteria um, marked in green. Um, so there's a, 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 a gene that sort of uh, represents a marker um, or protein activity marker that, that shows the bacteria in green. What you see in the RSD mutant is that although the nodule develops normally early on, eight days post inoculation with rhizobia, by three weeks after inoculation, those those nodules become senescent. So there's a defect in this mutant that, that leads to a type of defense response, if you like, or an early senescence of nodules. Um, we found that the bacteroids, which typically undergo endoreduplication, endo meaning DNA division without cell division, they tend to elongate. So in the wild type, you see nicely elongated um, rhizobium bacteroids. In the RSD mutant, that process is, uh, is, is interfered with. So the, Bacteroids don't um, develop normally. Um, I'm not going into detail here, except to say that we had hypothesized that this was a repressor of gene expression. So we, in the mutant, we were looking for genes that might be targets of this repressor by looking at genes in the mutant that were more highly expressed than in the wild type. And using that as a sort of a criterion and, and other methods, we were able to find a number of genes that were targeted by RSD, one of which is a vesicle associated membrane protein that in other plants is involved in plant defense. And we were able to show that the RSD protein binds to the promoter of this VAMP gene um, and as a consequence suppresses this gene during nodule development. Now, if this gene is involved in defense, this could be a mechanism by which RSD suppresses plant defense to enable the rhizobium um, to take up residence within the plant cells. And this is kind of an interesting area of how do, how do plants or any organisms allow a potential pathogen into the cell? Um, and, and this could be one mechanism by which that happens. Um, the final example of, of the use of genetics to understand the function of a gene, I'll, I'll use le leg hemoglobin as an example. If you've um, bought into any of the fake, fake um, meat products, um, plant-based products, you'll, you'll know that they're red, and that red is actually from plant hemoglobin. So it's analogous to human hemoglobin. It's an oxygen-binding protein. It was speculated for many years to be crucial for symbiosis function. Um, what, what I haven't said yet is that the nitrogenase protein, or the nitrogen-fixing complex in, in bacteria, is oxygen-sensitive. So in order for it to function, it has to be under low oxygen conditions, and it had been surmised over, through biochemical studies that hemoglobins help to maintain oxygen levels at very low levels in, in, the, in the nodule and, and, and thereby enable nitrogen fixation in the bacteria. So we tested that idea uh, using RNA interference. It's a way of interfering with the RNA production or R RNA stability in a cell. Um, and we, we targeted three genes in Metacargo truncatula that were nodule-specific leg hemoglobin genes. Um, Metacargo also has two non-symbiotic -hem hemoglobins, so they total of five genes in the genome. RNAi is quite precise, and we were able to downregulate the, the three symbiotic hemoglobin genes, essentially make nodules that were white, so no longer pink, essentially remove all of the hemoglobin from these nodules. What we found, and you can see this in the central panel, is that compared to the wild-type plant, which is um, the large plant on the, on the right-hand side of the panel, these RNAi lines that, that are devoid of hemoglobin are unable to fix nitrogen. Now, those plants will grow normally when provided with mineral nitrogen, so this defect is specific 
to symbiotic nitrogen fixation. And we used oxygen electrodes to show that actually in the RNAi hemoglobin lines that oxygen levels in the nodule increase. And we, we believe that hemoglobin facilitates the rapid movement of oxygen in the nodule to, to sites of respiration that help to drag down the concentrations of oxygen within nodules. So this was the first genetic evidence that hemoglobins are essential for nodule function through oxygen homeostasis, essentially. Um, over the years, my group has been involved in de um, describing the function of 12 genes involved in nodulation and nitrogen fixation. But as a community, these types of resources that I've described have led to the discovery of over 200 genes now that are required for nodule development or nodule function. Um, there's been more or less a linear increase in the number of genes discovered over the years. And many of those genes have conserved functions in different um, legume species. So where, where, where it's been looked at, uh, there's often conservation of function across species. So um, we've recently reviewed this area and then the next few slides simply show some of the genes in context. So many genes are involved, are now known to be involved in the early signaling processes that I talked about. Um, receptor signaling, calcium signaling, uh, transcriptional regulation, others in, involved in uh, rhizobial infection, including the Vaparin that I described. And since we published our work on Vaparin, it's been shown to be part of a complex that forms at the tip of the infection thread and presumably is involved in the biogenesis of that infection structure. Um, genes are now known, or, or transcriptional regulators, uh, many are now known to, to regulate nodule development. There's a process of autoregulation that switches nitrogen fixation off when nitrogen levels in the soil are high and many of the genes involved in that feedback regulation are now known. Um, and there are many genes in, uh, involved in plant hormone uh, production or perception that have been implicated in various aspects of nodule development. Um, finally, there are genes involved in, in transport and metabolism, so in the functioning nodule that are important to get nutrients to the bacteria or nutrients from the bacteria. Um, so we have a, a, a large repertoire of genes that are known to be essential but can we use that information to improve nitrogen fixation? So Dirk mentioned that some traits in plants are simple and controlled by one or two genes, and they're great targets for um, domestication uh, or for improvement of certain things, maybe even plant defense. But for complex traits, as Dirk also mentioned, such as uh, climate resilience or nitrogen fixation, there are hundreds if not thousands of genes involved, and so it's difficult to imagine how one would, might tackle and improving a process like that using a single gene approach. Um, so I think um, I don't really need to go into, here, uh, into this detail too much, but th that once again remind you that this is a complex trait um, and we probably need a more um, uh, unbiased or, or holistic approach to improving nitrogen fixation than a single gene approach. Um, actually, nature gives us some tools to address um, com complex problems like this. It's called natural variation. Again, Dirk talked about um, mutations being a natural part of life, and we all have different sequences in part through mutation, or essentially through mutation over time. Uh, Medicargo is a species that evolved in the Mediterranean region, and um, a, a population or a representation of the diversity of that species was collected in the form of 300 individuals from around the Mediterranean basin. They were all sequenced, and from that information, over a million um, nucleotide differences between individuals were discovered. So those, that DNA variation can be then used to survey, uh, or in, in conjunction with um, variation in traits, such as nitrogen fixation, to try to establish links between genes and, 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 and traits. And We've started to do that with Medicargo, so we used 200 uh, in diverse individuals of this population, and we asked the question, how well do these plants grow on mineral nitrogen as a, as a sort of a, um, a basis or a, or a yardstick, and if you grow the same genotype um, without mineral nitrogen in the soil but with nitrogen fixation from the air, how well do they grow? So that ratio, that relative growth rate, if you like, uh, on atmospheric nitrogen versus soil nitrogen, we used as a, as a yardstick to compare these different genotypes. And that's kind of what you're seeing in the first panel here. 
biomass under nitrogen fixing conditions versus biomass under, under soil nitrogen. And what we found was that some genotypes actually did just as well on atmospheric nitrogen as soil nitrogen, which is somewhat counterintuitive, um, especially from a physiological point of view, because there's got to be a cost of fixing nitrogen. It's a highly energetically costly process. It requires carbon from the plant. There should be a cost. And in general, that, the answer is yes, that, that most of these genotypes do grow less well on atmospheric nitrogen. But in, interestingly, there are a few cases where that's not the case. So the actual cost of doing business in terms of carbon or photosynthesis isn't really um, necessarily very high, or it doesn't have to be. In fact, there's probably a virtuous cycle that as, the, as carbon is invested in nodules, the nitrogen that's fixed uh, goes back into making protein and more photosynthetic apparatus. And so for some individuals, you can get re relatively high rates of nitrogen fixation. Um, in, in any case, what you can see in the second panel is that there is natural variation for nitrogen fixation effectiveness. And you're able, we're able to then associate that variation with variation at the genomic level through a process called genome-wide association. And doing that, you can identify regions of the chromosomes that are associated with better performance in nitrogen fixation. And this is a so-called Manhattan plot. It looks like the skyline of Manhattan. And um, the peaks represent um, single nucleotide um, uh, differences in, in individuals in the population that correlate with um, greater or lesser activity of nitrogen fixation. And from those peaks, we're able to discover new genes that haven't been described before. But more importantly, we've been able to, to um, identify genes that perhaps when brought together could improve the process of nitrogen fixation. Um, interestingly, breeders, plant breeders, haven't targeted this trade, even though it's fundamental to, to, to plant nutrition. Um, breeders typically are looking for simpler things to measure, such as biomass or seed production. And, um, and I think many breeders believe that by selecting for biomass production or yield, that they would bring nitrogen fixation along for the ride, so to speak, even though they weren't selecting for that directly. But that doesn't seem to be the case. A recent study out of Canada looked at 100 years of soybean varieties developed in Canada and was asking the question, what, what's happened with nitrogen fixation effectiveness? Um, and there are mass, mass spectrometry-based met methods to, to measure um, the nitrogen derived from atmosphere versus nitrogen derived from the soil, so differences in 15N signatures. And, and what they found was that, um, that, that there really hasn't been much improvement in so-called nitrogen derived from air over 100 years of breeding. But what's apparent from these sorts of figures is that there's still a lot of standing variation in that trait. So even though it hasn't been selected for, if we did now select based on that trait, there's an opportunity to try to improve nitrogen fixation effectiveness. I should say that under normal conditions in the field, legumes typically get about 40 to 60% of their nitrogen from the air as opposed to the soil. Um, when there's a lot of nitrogen in the soil, that number goes down. Um, and then under optimal conditions, it can be a little higher. But, but that there's definitely space to try to improve nitrogen fixation from, say, 50% to 60 or 70%. And if you multiply that by 50 million tonnes a year, that's a lot of free nitrogen that we could get by improving this process. Um, yeah, so, so looking forward, um, you know, I'm now having, having been a re reductionist all my life, I'm trying to, to, to grow a bigger brain or at least be become more holistic in my approach. And I'm really taking a page out of the breeder's handbook, which where breeders are, have been using natural variation for, for 100 years or more and capturing that in their breeding programs without necessarily having great insight into the nature of the genes that they're bringing together. Now we have an opportunity to, to understand not only the trait, but also the genomics and the genetic variation behind that trait, and to think of ways to bring that information together using AI uh, in, a, in a way that might stack the best versions of each gene or the best alleles or haplotypes of each gene in a, in a manner that um, improves overall nitrogen fixation. So that's kind of where we're at. We're trying to use natural diversity and genomics and predictive breeding to stack the deck, so to speak, in terms of um, beneficial um, genes and, and gene versions, if you like, in, in, a, in an optimized um, um, legume. 
So that, that brings me to my last slide. I hope I'm still on time. Um, in summary, um, le legume reference genomes and functional genomics have enabled rapid advances in our understanding of legume biology, especially uh, nitrogen fixation and model species. Translation of that knowledge to crop improvement has been slow. I mentioned that it's a, a complex process and a single gene approach is probably not um, um, powerful in this case. Pan genomics, um, which is sequencing many individuals of a species, is opening a door to capturing natural variation within a species um, that, that I think can be used for crop improvement. Um, Yes, and I think I've made that last point about predictive breeding. I think there are real opportunities to, to use natural variation in conjunction possibly with some uh, uh, targeted uh, genome editing perhaps to take the brakes off um, uh, the nitrogen feedback loop uh, through a targeted approach. So, you know, I'm an advocate of both uh, normal breeding as well as, uh, as the sort of thing that, that Dirk talked about earlier. So um, with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the members of my group at Noble that did much, much of the work I talked about, um, current colleagues at the University of Queensland and collaborators over the years and then funding from the National Science Foundation, the Noble Research Institute um, and the University of Queensland. Thank you. Complex, but let's hope the best. Okay. For the future, oh, I'm, I'm very bullish on um, on our ability to improve this. Yeah, yeah, and the other possibilities are still exist. Okay, so thank you very, very much, and uh, we are continuing the program with the last topic, and this is trans translational medicine, and I would like to introduce you, Peter Hedy, who is chair of the clinical. No. Uh, Clinical and Veterinary Science. And actually it was Peter, he recognized that in our class, translational medicine was not covered. And uh, he started in Hungary to establish a center, which is for Central and Eastern Europe a Translational Medicine Center. And uh, he increased also the participation of uh, uh, Academia, Ember, Academia Europea members in this class, and now we have really a large collection of experts in this field. But this was not only that one, but Peter started about two years ago a workshop uh, with these experts to develop better translational medicine. But he's going to tell it how, what he did during these last two years. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you very much, Eva, for this uh, very kind uh, introduction. And actually, I would like to speak about the global burden of translational medicine, because I think all of us know that how many discoveries are not going back for uh, our patients or our, our society's benefits. But let's think a little bit why we are doing our healthcare or why we are doing actually scientific activities it's very easy because if there is a healthcare challenge coming to the society, we would like to find solution for our community benefits. I think we don't need a better example than the COVID-19 disease so far, but if we look at the cancer disease or uh, the different problems in, in healthcare, this is the general thing, how we need to think about the role of science. However, what we need to do our activities in the highest efficient way, of course, we need young people, we, we need talented youths uh, with creative ideas, and of course, it's not enough to reach a result in science, but we need to translate the scientific results for community benefits. So 
we are in the 21st century and we can ask whether is it appropriate or effective or current science education system, how we do it, or the education curriculum, what we teach and how we teach for the students, and whether the implementation of the current scientific results for the challenges of the 21st century. And this is a very clear data at secondary school levels, which clearly show a huge decrease on young individuals in all over the world who are joining actually for scientific activities. And if we look further, we also can see very clearly that the problem is not only that the number of young people decreasing to join science, but if we look at the most difficult part of science, the basic discoveries, the basic sciences is still decreasing. So we can see, if we look at the last 20, 30 years back, that there is a clear decline on young, talented people joining to science. However, the second phase is whether is it enough to publish our data. And there is, I think, a very strong data from the uh, Eurostat, which actually clearly show that uh, the implementation of this kind of scientific knowledge is really very pure. Uh, poor. If we look at about the avoidable deaths under 75, 1.2 million deaths could have been avoided with a more efficient healthcare or with implementing the new scientific data backwards. And there are countries, including my country in Hungary, where four of five deaths could have been avoided if we translate all the knowledge what we achieved in the past for our community benefits. So there are two ways where we are really weak in this situation. So I mean, it's very easy. If we keep continuing what we have been doing so far, we will not be better at all. So we need new system. Uh, actually, in 2013, we developed a program for high school student about how to bring them to scientific activities. And knowing the Hungarian experience, we have over 1,000 high school students also inside this program. But as I mentioned, it's not enough, this scientific activity. We need to translate, transfer scientific knowledge from the scientific part for society benefits. We open up a new program for healthcare professionals, which help them to translate this knowledge back. So what is this system about? We need to increase the respect for uh, science and scientific literacy. We discussed yesterday, led by Ole Peters and the brainstorming, how to avoid uh, the different kind of misleading, mis disinformation as well. We need to motivate young people and teach the value of an evidence-based decision making. And we have to start it as early as we can. So we need to sensitize young people for science, we need to take them through the university, and after we need to bring this scientific knowledge back to society. So uh, actually, let me show, I think, the best way, if you watch the video, how is this program about. <laughs> Science is a, uh, an enterprise that uh, relies upon young people and their ideas. You know? And science will stop if we can't motivate young people to move into science. So this program is about excellence. A few excellent young scientists can already greatly boost the quality of Hungarian scientific life. The main aims of the National Academy of Scientists Education are to sensitize talented young people to science, help them to develop in their undergraduate years, and teach them how to turn scientific knowledge to society's benefit. The scientific program of the National Academy of Scientist Education in Hungary, launched in 2013, is based on two main elements. Secondary School Education Program and a University Education Program. More than 1,200 pupils and their teachers of the 150 partner schools participate in the Secondary School Program. 
The high, the high level, level theoretical, theoretical and practical, practical education, education is performed in seven national base schools and 20 regional base schools under the direction of 25 seniority senior teachers, whose goal is to support talented pupils from an early age who want to choose a research career in the future. Pupils can regularly attend laboratory practices, multi-day project-based trainings and theoretical education at the regional base school closest to their home. It is extremely important these days that we approach children and young students in middle school and get them informed and hopefully interested in natural sciences. Due to the results of recent years, the university training program of the academy expanded into a national program in 2021 involving all cities in Hungary with higher education in life sciences. I think the development is fantastic. When I came first time, it was a program centered in Szeged, you know, with students coming from different parts of, uh, of Hungary. But meanwhile, uh, the program has developed into two branches, you know, and actually one of these branches aims at revolutionizing science education in all of Hungary. The most important element of the program is that the Sendjorgi students carry out research work under the supervision of the Sendjorgi mentors, who are recognized domestic scientists selected on the basis of professional criteria and whose main task is to support the professional career of their students. If they choose to develop a career in science, they will have the view of the entire distance between the patient bed and the route to try and cure and help and develop drugs. Like we do. Thanks to the expansion of the program, the number of students and mentors has increased significantly in recent years. For years, a number of international mentors have also been involved in the professional education of students who are outstanding members of the world's leading research institutes. Currently, the Academy has 36 international mentors from 12 countries. I see, I see there's a very, very uh, really pioneering, pioneering program, program which, which does, does not exist in most countries, countries. And, and I, I think, think it's, it's a real service to the community and also to, to, to science. science. Besides the several professional and community programs, students of secondary schools and universities may attend the meetings of Nobel laureates and talented students organized by the Academy twice a year. At the, At the conferences, conferences of approximately 500, 500 guests, guests, pupils, students, mentors, mentors and, and university, university guests, guests can listen to high-quality professional, professional presentations, presentations participate, participate in educational programs, programs and, and meet or talk, talk with Nobel Prize-winning Prize scientists and internationally renowned researchers. Well, I was you know, pleasantly uh, surprised by the enthusiasm of the students and uh, extremely uh, high interest in chemistry and physics. Since the first meeting in 2012, the Academy has held 20 successful conferences and the prestigious participation of 12 Nobel laureates arriving from the different parts of the world. Everybody was uh, very engaged, I would say. I mean, I think the, the future for young Hungarian scientists is looking quite bright, actually. I mean, as we know, there are plenty of talent here. Um, let's, let's keep, keep our, our fingers, fingers crossed. crossed. Wish them luck. Uh, there, there seems, seems to be a real energy. energy. And you have you such, have such a, a heritage of scientific, scientific discovery in Hungary, Hungary that, that I, think I think it would, it would be a shame if you don't, don't capitalize upon it, build upon it. I see I you're see doing that. We strongly believe that science moves the world forward. By supporting talents, we invest in the future. We are absolutely sure that the results of biomedical research will save lives and create value for the society. Peter Hege convinced me that it's a good idea to uh, train young people of the area of, uh, of SIGIT and knowing Peter, Peter Hege, I know that he is a very hard worker, very enthusiastic, and I just got infected by his uh, enthusiasm. I, all I can say is I'm very impressed and I hope it uh, continues like this. So I think this was a very good summary about how to bring 
science to secondary school level, and you could see thousands of students with the learning by doing technique to sensitize them for science. And of course, we can't measure currently actually the, the value of this program. But if we look at for the future, that should be a benefit. However, as I mentioned, is it enough to discover something, publish it in top journals, and leave it on the shelves? Not. The second part of the program is very importantly to take them from the shelves and use it in the theory life. So very important that all discoveries need to be delivered back for patients' benefit. And what are the real challenges now? If you look at the number of publications from 1950, it's just continuously growing. And in 2023, we will approximate, uh, uh, approximately 2,000 articles. And if you look at the benefits which come back, is definitely there are millions of data are generated without benefits, and we need to further take over these discoveries. I had the really privilege to join Academia Europea in 2017, and 2018 we launched a program which was uh, sponsored by Academia Europea, where we uh, delivered a new method which can actually speed up the translation from scientific knowledge for patients' benefits. And the most important part is to involve those people at healthcare at the level where all the knowledge become for uh, uh, community benefits to be involved in scientific programs. So, and we changed the current practice because the second problem is that not only most of the medical doctors do not do science or they don't understand the scientific methodologies, but the second problem is that the whole process is slow. So we changed a little bit the PhD systems because if you look at like in a tire change, you can easily tell who is the supervisor and who is the student on this uh, picture, but this is very slow process. So what we have done, actually we looked at and changed the system and these kind of scientific teams now surrounded by people with the newest technology. So if we, you change the two persons way for a teamwork and you use the latest technology, I don't know who is aware of that currently the world record of changing tires is below two seconds, it's 1.92. It was earlier impossible with the earlier model. So in this system, when the healthcare professionals join as a student and they got a clinical supervisor, they are surrounded by biostatisticians, IT persons, patients coordinator, data management, and helping them. And we have a very uh, structured education system, how to take it, these results for patients' benefits. And we not only teaching hard skills, but also soft skills, which can help these kind of healthcare professionals, either they are dietitians, medical doctors, psychologists, or uh, physiotherapists, how to bring this knowledge back. We are so happy that within two years, when we launched this program, students from 21 countries, including Asia, joined to this program. And here is the two years urge where we currently teach over 500 people, including medical students as well. And also it come out not only by the students, but also if we look at the publications, they are very good. But the biggest beneficials are really, really the patients. For example, here is an international effort where we collected uh, data from 23 countries about the usage of antibiotics in pancreatitis. And within a short period of time, we could decrease the antibiotics from 80% to 40%. It's a 50% change. And like an early intervention, which was just recently published uh, uh, in PubMed, we could bring early energy feeding uh, for the patients, which also decreased by two-thirds about the mortality rate. But we looked at it in a hospital, whether it can be done in hospital or not. One resident doctor joined the program, and within a year, they could exactly do the same. They could tremendously reduce the length of hospitalization of antibiotic use. In pediatricians, when they looked at the guidelines, when to screen, CF patients, cystic fibrosis patients for diabetes. What they have done, they started earlier based on the new, newer scientific data, 
and they could reach 31% of kids without having symptoms that they have uh, glucose tolerance intolerance, which had them an early prevention of the disease symptom. Or recently from one of the hospitals, one otorhinopharyngologist jo joined it. And for example, the cholesteatoma disease, which can recurrent, the student joined it within a year learned the techniques. And not only they would, were able to publish it in laryngoscope, but when they applied it, and this is the importance, the applied knowledge, when they applied it, actually 13% was the decrease immediately in the hospital, this kind of uh, cholesterol recurrence. Not surprisingly, we were uh, uh, happy to see that Nature Medicine also published the early data what came out, and we were so happy that one of the top gastroenterology journal in September put the newest result coming out from this program and the gastroenterology cover page, which showed about a huge danger of people after pancreatitis and all uh, death cause in mortality level, and plenty of articles were published in this program. So how to bring it actually for academia of European level as well? We sometimes feel that about the knowledge, what is at Academia of Europa is equal with science. However, this statement is alone false, because what makes actually successful either of the academies or any kind of universities is the knowledge times activity. Therefore, what we have done last year, just a year ago in Barcelona, we established the Translational Medicine Working Group, where actually a high quality uh, experts, high quality data analysis, and also like a university which were happy to choose the core facility for Academia of European members. If we look at about the quality, because you need quality people for science, I think if I look at the life sciences class, there are a tremendous number of brilliant scientists. If we look at Eurostat, Eurostat has the largest amount of database concerning healthcare in Europe. We could negotiate it with them for one and a half year. No, we can use not only the macro data, which is available on the website, but also the micro data. And uh, the Semmelweis University, which Rector also visited yesterday, Academia of Europea program, put all a highly dedicated team, as I mentioned to you, the Ferrari team, with all the biostatisticians and IT people. So last year in Barcelona, the clinical and veterinary sciences section established this translation and medicine working group, and the kickoff time was January uh, 2023, when we had the very first meeting uh, in this uh, 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 program. And we have a meeting, activity meeting every two weeks, and we started several programs. Now we are currently at the Munich. And just to show you how many programs we started, within this very short amount of time, we started uh, uh, several projects. Five of them were really, really concerning healthy aging and, uh, and studies on reproductive uh, uh, medicine as well, highly important studies in the field. And we were really surprised and we were so happy that not only the, the uh, ordinary members of the academia, but also the foreign members joined it, especially from Asia, there were plenty of people. And if you look at the questions currently we are facing, including cancer disease, aging, uh, and all the others, all of them are global questions. So Europe alone, not enough to handle this question. So therefore, we believe that Academia of Europea also should open up uh, with activities for uh, Asian uh, uh, countries as well. And in the clinical and veterinary sciences group, we started thinking about to have two activities. One of them is actually uh, the, the translational European Asian hub, uh, and the other, which is also Singapore, was very uh, interested in joining. So we are so gifted that uh, among the best university, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Queen Ling, who became to be a member of Academia of Europea last year, or, and uh, uh, the rector of Semmelweis University agreed on the budget 
and secure the budget for Asian and European activities to build this up in the forthcoming five years. And there are two academies we would like to put it on a base. One of them is, of course, Academy of Europia. And the second is, you could show the video about the secondary school program. This is the National Academy of Scientist Education in Hungary. So I would like to close my speak with uh, two sentences that knowing is not enough, we must apply this knowledge and willing is not enough, we must do. So we believe that these kind of two programs, like in a sandwich where the medicine and science is there, if we put this kind of education from science to society, this definitely will help to, to face to the challenges in the 21st century. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you so much, Peter. I think uh, it was very, very impressive what you do, and we know that you are the most energetic person whom we know. <laughs> and certainly, you will be very successful. And we hope that other working group can work like this one. So I don't know, is there any questions from your part concerning this program? Yes, Ola. Thank you very much for, as always, a brilliant lecture. I mean, it looks from what we have seen here that Hungary in this particular respect is in a quite lucky position. So the immediate question is, of course, how to expand that into the whole European domain, which is probably not a very easy task. But on the other hand, you have a fantastic example you have all the Nobel laureates behind you. So one feels somehow intuitively that it should be possible to expand it into a full European programs. And knowing you, I'm sure you already thought about this. So I wonder whether you <laughs> might comment on how to do that. Thank you very much, uh, Ola. This is really, really highly important. Actually, we just uh, had this 10-year uh, program, actually. and. Uh, uh, we now see that how the students like this program. We already discussed it several times, how to bring it to different universities. So from next year, we would like to open up the secondary program also for international students. So our aim first to find European universities, actually to have partners in it. We were so happy that currently four or five universities, including Leuven, uh, in the PhD program, they already joined. As I mentioned, also there are there are uh, universities from Asia as well. So, for example, last year we wrote approximately 500 letters to universities, medical universities in Europe. Currently, the response rate is very low. They don't understand what's going on, what's coming. Always, you know, if there is an innovation, always, you know, how different is the innovation from the traditions the acceptance rate by the traditional universities is not so high currently, but we started moving towards that. But the way is not easy because they feel that why to change the system, what they are doing. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much. I uh, totally agree with you and uh, my activity is 100% uh, translational. But I think that there is a question that has to be evoked anyway. It is uh, gender uh, equity, because uh, science has to attract women. The, particular, the particularity of women is that the reproductive life is intimately linked to professional life. And the studies, the postdoctoral proposition, the recruitments and so on are not adapted to women. So it is urgent to have a reflection to attract young girls and young women to science. And that is a major problem. Brilliant comment. Thank you so much for that. Uh, if I knew it in advance, I would have one more slide, but I will show you during the coffee break. And a, a woman also with a, with a small kid 
in this program and making the presentations. Whenever they ask whether they can join with babies and uh, with in, in, a, in a pregnant state, we always said yes. And currently I can announce that 65% of the people from healthcare and from the students are women in the program and we are supporting them tremendously. So you are completely right. And we reached a state where currently more women inside this program. Thank you so much for that. And you have also a special program for the ladies who are returning for, from the maternity leave, not to leave science and keep them updated. So if there are no more questions, I think it's time to have our break. And we are coming back sharply by 5.40, I think. Yeah, for the new member presentation. So enjoy the coffee break, finally. You all should be doing this for the first time and the last time. So I will give you a few words of how we're going to do this. There are theoretically about 155 of you. I have no idea how many will actually come up on the stage, but we have a list of all of the 155 that we expect, all people who are registered for the meeting and who are new members from 22 or 23. And so what we will ask you to do is to come up on the stage from this side, excuse me, <laughs> the, the other right, to come up on the stage from this side, there's a small staircase, after your name has been called. So I will call your names in blocks of 10 names slowly, give you enough time to come up on stage. As you come up on stage from the left, I'll shake your hand and I'll guide you to the president <laughs> who will shake your hand and have, you'll have your photo taken with her individually. And then we will ask you to stand back here in front of this row of tables where we will take a picture of all 10, theoretically all 10 of you together, or seven or eight or nine, whatever the magic number is, okay? And as you leave the stage, you'll receive one of these small gifts in blue boxes from the Academy, Big Secret, and it'll be handed to you by uh, Frau Brandhaus. Frau Brandhaus will do it, Frederica Brandhaus. And uh, she will be over there on that part of the stage. So as you go down the stairs, she will give you the pen before you go down the stairs. Okay, so everybody gets one, nobody forgets it. Nobody takes two. All right, so the whole action is from left to right. We'll begin with a presentation by our president and then we'll begin the cycle of bringing people up on the stage. The, photograph is, the photographer is standing here, so don't be afraid, he's a big guy. But he will be taking your individual picture and then a collective picture of 10 of your colleagues, okay? And if we make a mistake, so what? We just repeat it, all right? So again, the flow will be from the left, from my left, across the stage in this direction. Maria.
So, if you're a new member, please try to be sitting towards the front of the room where spaces have been reserved for you. Thank you, that'll save us valuable time. So welcome, there are about 155 of you as new members. I will call out your names and you will come to the stage from the left-hand side, from my left, come onto the stage, I'll greet you, the president will shake your hand, You'll have a photo taken individually, and then you'll be asked to stand here in a row of 10 people, like a firing squad, uh, and you'll be photographed again in the group. And then as you leave the stage, we'll give you a small gift that you see there in these blue boxes. Before we begin by bringing the new members onto the stage, our president would like to greet you all personally and to present a small presentation on the state of the academy. Madam President. Good afternoon. I would like to give you, dear new members of Academia Europea, the academy in a nutshell. This podium is not made for me. I'm too short for it. You hardly see me, I guess. So I try to stand a little bit uh, beside it. Uh, just give me a sign if the mic doesn't catch my voice. Okay, let's start. So the Academia Europea, the European Academy, was founded in 88, 1988. It's a young academy. And the initiator of this idea was the Royal Society. And here you see the founding members of Academia Europea in Cambridge. Now it's very important to understand that uh, Academia Europea covers the 44 European countries, according to the definition of European countries by the UN. So we extend much, much beyond the European Union. And it's also very important to know and appreciate that Academia Europea covers all 
scientific, scholarly, and technological disciplines. So, very shortly, the mission of Academia Europea is to defend academic freedom and advance research excellence in all scholarly, scientific, and technological domains, to encourage interdisciplinary and international research, to identify topics of trans-European importance, and to make recommendations to decision makers uh, on issues concerning now research, uh, scholarship, and academic life. The priority is now, today, till uh, the end of our current strategy 24, uh, diversifying the membership. And what do I mean with diversification? Career age, geographical, disciplinary, and gender diversity, national diversity. Uh, interdisciplinary approaches, we need to push boundaries of fundamental research to mitigate uh, the challenges and catalyze innovation. And uh, close to my heart is translation of research findings to benefits for society. We have many, many members who also are innovators, who, ha who have really translated their research findings into innovations that benefit a society. And this, of course, covers all disciplines, the scientific ones and the scholarly ones. Uh, but this uh, is not very much highlighted in Academia Europea. I would like to make this visible. So, our current activities, science advice to uh, the European Commission via the SAPEA consortium, uh, extremely important activity where the expertise in these different domains where the Commission needs scientific advice for policy making, for decision making, uh, much of those uh, uh, experts are drawn from the membership of Academia Europea, also uh, from national academies, of course. So uh, we advise, uh, we, the board gets advice uh, on issues concerning higher education institutions and higher education uh, from the Hercules group. This is a group of ours, and Hercules stands for, for uh, uh, higher education, research, and culture in European uh, societies. So we have discipline-specific activities uh, run by the classes, and as you know, we have four classes, and their sections, and all in all, we have 18 sections under these four classes. Uh, we collaborate with the Young Academy of Europe and we have even a formal agreement with them. It's very, very important to be connected to the next generation of star researchers and that's what the membership of Academia of the European Academy, the Young Academy, represents. Uh, so cross-disciplinary activities at the moment we are running. Uh, so we are supporting young researchers' careers, uh, supporting widening countries' participation in the European research area. And we have currently two task forces, uh, which are uh, multidisciplinary. Uh, one is on environmental sustainability, and the other one, which is kicking off, is on artificial intelligence. And we, of course, support excellence, as you have seen today, through prizes, the Erasmus Prize, the Adam Kondoroshi Prize, the Hypatia Prize, which is uh, um, funded and, and uh, governed by the Barcelona City Council and the new Sydney Brenner Prize that was for the very first time awarded today. Uh, then uh, the speciality, I would say, of Academia Europea is that it is not us, only us members, but the Academy uh, has uh, physical units which operates in different countries. And we call them regional knowledge hubs. Regional does not mean within national borders. It means the opposite, extending beyond borders. And uh, we have uh, seven of them. They are hosted by local, uh, local university or a research funding organization or an academy. And they have their own uh, research agendas as we yesterday, well, we had the, the uh, annual business meeting where you new members probably did not participate, uh, but we had a fantastic display on Monday of the activities of these uh, hubs. Uh, the head office is in London, and we have an information center in Graz. I have a small office in uh, Helsinki, and as was just announced yesterday, uh, the board of Academia Europea has uh, 
just established a new legal entity which will lo be located here in Munich. Then a few words about our membership. So the membership is a true intellectual powerhouse. Uh, now the current uh, number of, uh, of members, including you new members, is uh, 5,362, and this was a 4% increase vis-a-vis uh, -vis last year's numbers. Uh, if you look at the cake, we have there the number of members in each of these four classes. So the blue one is, is uh, humanities, the red one is social sciences, the yellow one is, is uh, exact sciences, and the green one is life sciences. Now, uh, we really can say that the members of Academia Europea represent European scholars elite. And just one example of this is uh, the very, very high level prizes that many of our members have, have gotten. So since 2022, we have not three Nobel uh, laureates, but five, including now the new ones. And uh, we have three field medalists, and we have not two Balsam prizes, but now just two of our members got the Balsam prize, so four all in all since 2022. Uh, the L'Oreal UNESCO for uh, Women in Science Prize, the European Prize, got one of our members, and one Wolf Prize we can count as well, and many other prizes. And all in all, we have today 85 Nobel laureate members. Now, the diversity is something that we need to, you know, uh, monitor and also do something about that. The, the uh, percentage of women members in that founding assembly meeting in Cambridge in 1988 was 18%. And what is it today? 18.8. Uh, also, the widening countries we should pay attention to because uh, as many as 25 of those 44 European countries can be counted to uh, be a widening country, but nevertheless, the percentage of members uh, working in those countries is today only 10.9%. And then uh, I would very much like to see uh, um, uh, issues about the career age. It is very normal <laughs> for an academy that it is mature, seasoned researchers who are members, and half of ours have reached the, the uh, retirement age, but we can count 15 members under 40, but I would very much like to see mid-career excellent researchers joining us. Now, uh, we have updated the criteria for membership just now, and there was an announcement yesterday, I think, to all members about this, and the idea is, uh, is uh, uh, to align with the COARA uh, criteria. So you may know that in Europe, the COARA, the Coalition of Renewal of, of uh, Research Assessment, uh, we have signed that agreement. We are part of those more than 500 uh, academies and universities and research funding organizations which have signed it, and we are aligning with the ERC as well in, in paying attention to moving towards quant qualitative criteria from using only quantitative ones, and that will be very important now for our new round of call for nominations, which, by the way, opened today, I guess. So, all in all, I wish all the new members most warmly welcome to our community. Thank you. So, we will begin. I'll read out about 10 names, and I will try to do it as clearly as possible. And of course, I apologize uh, in advance for any pronunciation errors that I may make. Uh, Charles Agiemang. Giancarlo Alfano. Dragos Paul Aligica. Ethan Alpaidin, Ricardo Baeza Yates, Maria, Maria Bag Ramian, Stephen Mark Barnett, Stefano Bartolini, 
and Alexandra N. Dixon. Derek Bennett, Jacek Blasiewicz, Michelle Bokopza Kahan, Laszlo Ereso Burhi, Gabriele Bottini, Herve Burhi, Chris Bruin, Tim Browning, Neil Brugger, Andre Yerzy Burash. Susanna Burkhardt, Anne Marie Kamenad, Ratzvan Caracas, Bernardo Cesare, Long King Chen, Yia Chen, Christopher Clark, Sandro Conticelli, Regino Criado, Vincenzo Gruppi. Daniel Dai Anu, Turgai Dalkara, Anne Daly, Daniel Ovidiu David, or David, Alberto De Francesco, De Franceschi, Ronald De Witt, Maria Daly, Zolt Demetrovic, Hamida Demirdache, and Rachid Derish. I apologize for the pronunciations. <laughs>
this way. Maria Dorobantu, Dan Gabriel Duda, Anna Echevarria Arswaga, Thomas Effert, Yonina Eldar, Miriam Ernestus, Thomas Ernst, Victoria Escandel Vidal, Margaret Asiri, and Gabriel Farkas. Peter Ferdinandi, Ferdinandi Ferra, Ferrando Ferroni, Gerion Fink, Christoph Flamm, Xavier Franch, Soren Frank, Harald Gall, Simon Goldhill, Johannes Grave, and Hans Peter Graver. This way, please. Tilman Grüne, Carolyn Gutjahr, Charles Gutman, Mark Heberlein, Jelena Harlastis, Kenneth Harris, Meyer Hemmo, Torsten Hothorn, Johanna Ivaska, Mihailo Jakoljevic. Janos Yani, Hongbo Jiang, Kyle Jiang, Tong Jiang, Georgi Miklos Kesaru, Olga Kasova, R. Frank Kui, Alex Körner, Karin Kukonen.
Martin Joachim Kümmel, Wolfgang Kunz, Ljubov Kajanowska, Saidi, äh, Saadi Laulu, Jack Singh Lau, Yusuf Leble Bici, Ludwika Leiset, Te, Ching Chi Liang, Samuel Liu, Jian Li, Lin, Jian Lin. Hans-Peter Lipp, Christian List, Giuseppe Longobardi, Annick Lewis, or the Louis, Valerio Lucarini, Kai Hong Luo, Ronan Lyons, Hubert Mansfelder, Christo, Christos Domis Mansabinos, Arcadius Marciniak. Philippe Marcus, Pirio Marcola, Peter Markovic, Seamus Martin, Ranko Matasovic, Liviu Matai, Louis, Louise McNally, Franz Stefan Meisel, Annette, Annette Menzel, Michaele Mirui. Mirio, Mirio. Michelin Misrahi, Sanjit Mitra, Francisco Moreno Fernandez, Maria Concetta Moroni, Javier Moscoso, 
Albe ni Chasaide, Louis Oesterbeck, Stephen Parmonti or Stefan Parmentier, Daniel Petit, Joe Pearson. John Plain, Armando Pombiero, Jean Ponce, Victor Prasana, Ling Chi, uh, Chin, Katrin, Katri Raikkonen, Tin, Til, Tina Ranma Liv, Anu Realo, Nelson Rubiero, Elisa or Eliza Riedo. <coughs> Michael Rösner, Claudia Romano, Ander Rotukaine, Kalne, James K. Russell, Kevin Ryan, Katerina Salmela Aro, Marek Sanak, Matthias Schwab, Danuta Schanzer, Jianfu Chao. Niels Erik Skakebeck, Maria Grazia Spilantini, Miriam Sprangers, Karl Theodor Sturm, Peter Zalei, Leandros Tassiolas, Aristides Tatsakis, Laura Valentini, Dongsheng Wen, Jonathan White. Ludger Wassmann, Ji Wu, Jin Chao, 
Shu. Qingbo, Shu. Yang Shong, Yao. Chun, Yu. Shao Kai, Yu. Eva Sasimalova, Yang Chang, Guo Ying Zhao, Yuntian Zhu. Should there be further new members whose names that I have not spoken, but who were elected in 22 or 23, come forward now and we'll treat you equally to everyone else. But you will have to say your name to me when you come up. Hello, Mats Olson, Karolinska Institute. Mats Olson. Good evening, Olli Silvernoinen, Helsinki, Finland. Elisabetta Raganin van Mel. Congratulations to you all, all new members. We, as president has well stated, we place great hopes and expectations in new members. Uh, please respond to all correspondence on a timely basis. You will find out that the uh, Academia Europea is one of the more dynamic associations uh, in your life. We are now finished with our ceremony. If my mathematics is right, we're up around 160 uh, new members, Madam President, who were here today. And I want to thank you all for attending. We will meet outside now, uh, and we will have a short time there at 8 o'clock this evening. For those of you who have tickets for the President's dinner, we will sit at the President's dinner. There are two basic ways to, or two options I present to you. One is to walk, which is about a 15 20 minute walk, and the other is to take a subway. There's a station literally touching inside the building in the corner of the building here called University, and you just need to go south on any train for two stations and get off at Marienplatz. And once you get to Marienplatz, ask anybody standing there, Ratzkeller, and they will point you to the basement of the city hall where our president's dinner is to occur. It's a very massive establishment, but you will find your way to the room which is reserved for us. So I look forward to seeing as many of you there as possible. As I say, if you're one of the lucky few 200 who received their ticket on time, then I uh, welcome your presence there. Otherwise, I hope to see you in the next day somewhere and be able to celebrate with you anyway. Thank you very much. <laughs>